Good evening. This is the Fairfax or calling to order the Fairfax Council meeting. This is a, uh, a special part of the meeting earlier in which we will interview two applicants for a single vacancy on the Planning Commission. So um, I'm not seeing, oh, am I seeing all of the council members? Yes. All right. Um, so the meeting is called to order and Michelle, would you please do a roll call? Yes, Mayor, I'd be happy to. Council Member Cutrano. Present. Council Member Goddard. I'm here. Council Member Kohler. Here. Vice Mayor Hellman. Here. And Mayor Ackerman. Present. Thank you, and I'm the town clerk, I'm present. Okay, so we have two interviewees, and uh, if we can promote them to panelists, we, we uh, what we usually do with interviews when it's not on Zoom is that one interview at a time is in the room and the other interviewees for position are, are asked to leave the room, but that's pretty impossible to do with Zoom. And so what we'll do is have both of our interviewees on at the same time. And as we ask some questions, we'll alternate between the two as to who answers any given question first. So we'll do our best with this. And thank you for uh, applying. And shall we bring them on? I have promoted both. And I see Robert Jansen. Hello. This is Michelle, the town clerk. We've communicated. And, uh, and there's Brett and Michelle, Kelly. I, uh, excuse me, Michelle, but I think you're what I'm seeing on my screen is the uh, as the town seal. Maybe you're sharing your screen, but that's um, I'm not on it. Maybe. Oh, OK. Gallery view. OK, sorry. All right. There I, I can see you. All right. Hello. Good evening, Robert and Brett. Thank you there. very much for applying. We really very much appreciate this. As you know, you're applying for a, <laughs> a substantial job. So um, we don't have too much time. So I will jump right in and just ask the first question of you, which is uh, usually the question we first ask any applicant, which is to just take two or three minutes uh, to tell us your interest in being a planning commissioner and share any relevant background and experiences that would help you be successful. And uh, um, Robert, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah. Um, thank you for uh, having us on the interview, uh, both Brett and me. Are, it's interesting that we, we are both on at the same time. That's fascinating, but that's good. Um, um, so where shall I start? I'm an architect, um, have been uh, an architect my whole life, uh, licensed, of course. Um, been in California for 23 years, uh, roughly 10 years in San Rafael, then uh, last 10 years in Fairfax in between briefly in San Mateo, um, worked typically in the city, in the office, of course, unless like last year. Um, I'm a principal with uh, the DLR group. Um, we're architects, we're nationwide, so it seems like a very good firm. Um, what's interesting about it is that um, we have local offices and they are semi-independent. We are, I, a lot of times I consider it a federation. So we have both the benefit of being big and the benefit of being small and small, you know, small offices have their own uh, culture. And so it gives you a lot of freedom to do things. Um, but so that aside, um, when this opportunity came up, I jumped on it um, last year, of course, has been an unusual year. Um, and, and hopefully that one of the silver linings is, is that we will be able to, what we've learned basically is that we can run our society differently. Mm -hmm. And so I, think there's going to be changes that will be long term and uh, that's relevant because I think Fairfax has been on the uh, forefront sometimes of looking into new developments, of course, most importantly, the environment's always been high in there. Um, and um, that is going to be more important in the future, because we understand that we are using too many resources um, and, and what's fascinating there is that the T ecos, the you know, ecological and economy do not fight with each other. We know in California, they can benefit each other. As a matter of fact, large industries that, that profit from that. Um, part of that as well, maybe what's coming up is the housing plan. Um, also a fascinating aspect has more to do with 
social equity. So I think there's going to be a, a fascinating year coming up. And um, I have the time, I have the capability. So that's why I jumped on this opportunity. Um, and to keep it brief, um, right, there are three things. I know the subject matter. I dealt with planning commissions, of course, my whole life. Um, technically, I understand them. I understand the public outreach component of that, which, which I'm typically also involved in. Um, I think what's important as well is um, I'm known to be even handed. I can be objective. I don't put my own opinion in front of that of others necessarily. And I think that's an important thing um, working in a commission like this. Um, it's very much about um, the bigger the bigger picture. Um, not last but least, of course, I love Fairfax. I'm here for a reason. Um, by choice, um, I think we all do. <laughs> There's, that's not unique by itself. But I've gone through great efforts to make it here um, and establish myself here. And so I'm really looking forward um, to have an opportunity to make contribution to uh, my all the people around me here. Um, so that, in a nutshell, um, is me. I think you are on mute, Bruce. Bruce, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Robert. Sorry for that. And Sorry. Brett, would you like to um, introduce yourself in the in with the same question? Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm Brett Kelly. I'm uh, the fortunate husband to my brilliant wife Betsy, who some of you might know or. Uh, recognized from around town, uh, my very proud father of my two creative little kids, uh, Fergus and Rose. Uh, I'm a bicycle advocate. I'm a avid uh, hiker and outdoorsman. I'm a very proud member of our little community here in Fairfax. Uh, I am an architect also. Uh, I, I do really big buildings. I do healthcare buildings. Uh, I also work for an international company. This is very interesting here. Um, I started my career uh, in San Francisco, actually. At, at, I went to the California College of the Arts, uh, then California College of Arts and Crafts. I wish we didn't lose that little moniker, but we, we did. Uh, so California College of Arts, I, I worked, I did a, a lot of multifamily housing and mixed use work to start my career and then sort of transitioned into what I would term uh, unaffordable housing, which uh, really big expensive houses, which I didn't really find that uh, interesting or valuable to me. And I transitioned my career into institutional work. I've been doing um, academic research and classroom buildings around the country for a number of years. And then about 15 years ago, uh, transitioned into solely into healthcare. So my typical clients are uh, right now the VA, uh, campus down in Palo Alto and UC Davis up at, uh, in Sacramento, for instance. And the healthcare is, it's, you know, I can always hang my hat on the fact that at the end of the day, uh, these buildings are gonna help people, you know? There's a lot of blood and sweat and tears going to these really big buildings. Um, but I know that in, at the end, it's, it's worth, you know, um, my, I have a good friend and colleague that she she says that my uh, my outlook towards our architecture, it's not so much my profession as my occupation. Um, and what she means by that is uh, it occupies my thoughts. Uh, I, I'm constantly thinking about the built environment, um, the spaces and places we occupy, um, how they could be better, worse, how they affect us and our the way we sort of live our lives. I think that thinking can uh, really impact the way I can help make decisions for our community. Um, I also have presented and do present to a number of planning commissions, particularly around the Bay Area, and have worked with most recently Santa Cruz and South San Francisco, their planning departments to make some buildings for them, um, for public buildings for them. Uh, so I, I think I know the mechanisms of the planning commission very well. I, I know uh, the value of that body and how it can affect our community very well. Um, and so I think that all of that thinking will help me make good decisions, and I hope you do too. Thank you very much. 
So now what we do is go around among council members and see who else has questions. And we, uh, so I'll just ask who would like to go first and, and uh, ask a question of these two applicants. And in this case, uh, Brett would answer first. <clears throat> I'll go. Barbara, thank you. Nobody's jumping up. So, um, Brett, you're first. So as a planning commissioner, you'll consider applications from homeowners and concerns expressed by neighbors sometimes regarding their project. What's your approach to resolving these conflicts and seeking compromises if possible without unduly sort of costing the applicant extra money? How, how would you sort of you know, thread that needle. It's it's a hard one. Um, you know, you hope that the applicant comes in thinking about the neighbors and hope they have talked to them and and uh, considers their uh, their values as well. And so um, you have to assess that. Really, I, I think if we're all a community, right? They're going to end up living next to each other someday. Hopefully, there's not going to be an animosity created in that that moment. Um, Hope and um, I, ha I have a little um, a point of view with regard to the uh, planning uh, process that I hope that we can typically fall back on things that are written, right? The actual guidelines and um, require the applicant to conform to those. And hopefully they're written in such a way that they are better for the greater good. Um, and um, if not, it, it's an unfortunate judgment call, right? Um, it, but it is about respect and making sure that uh, particularly new people coming into the community or adding two new things to the community, even if it's a new addition, um, are, are being respectful. Thank you. And Robert, did you wanna answer that question? Do you want me to repeat it? Or no, I think I, yeah, no, I, I, I got it. Um, sure, same question. Um, yeah, no, Brett, you're right that those are tricky things. Um, I think what I would do, what's most important is um, um, to find, you know, in order to find consensus, to see where two parties actually do agree um, as a starting point. Um, you know, typically um, when the situation is there that it comes to the planning commission and hasn't been decided yet, um, there probably is an awareness, but Obviously, the communication is not fully open. Otherwise, it wouldn't have come to that point. Um, and and the worst thing for two neighbors, indeed, what can happen is that they start fighting with each other. So typically, there are points somewhere in that where they do agree on, right? and from there, trying to build out um, consensus using exactly the things that are written and explaining them why they are the way. A lot of times, there is you know people may feel entitled to things that but not fully aware that there are boundaries to what they can do. And so it's the combination of those things being transparent, find those first points where they can connect and hopefully they'll get out of it. Of course, sometimes it might not be sufficient and then there will be a hard decision, um, but best to avoid that. And yeah, it's, nothing's worse than having a bad neighbor next to you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Brett. Sure. Um, Vice Mayor Hellman. You, you're muted. Yeah. Um, are there any zoning requirements and or land use policies that you would like the town to consider revising? Um, Robert. I'm, I'm first. Yes, please. Right out of hand. Um, well, I know there still is a silly right away to run a freeway through downtown. Or <laughs> so I think there is an odd loose end um, that's, but I'm not sure that is relevant to do something about that. Um, Caltrans is not the most easiest agency to work with. Um, out of hand, I would say no, because there's no big obvious one that's wrong. Um, but undoubtedly, um, to implement a housing plan, that might be a necessity to revise something. Um, um, but other than that, no, not for starters. I would not say so. 
That doesn't mean that changes are not necessary, but there's not one big topic that I think is so dire that. Thank you. Yeah, Vice Mayor, I'm, I'm gonna have to um, plead ignorant on it. I, I don't know the local code well enough yet. Uh, I'd be a quick study. Uh, I can tell myself as maybe an expert on guidelines, but ours, I have not had to look into it very well. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to go ask a question next, yes. Mayor. Um, Member Catrano, and thank you. Uh, Brett would answer first. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if uh, each of you would be able to share one to three potential policy challenges that you see or may see the town facing in the next one to two years based on your, your past experiences dealing with planning commissions and, and development issues uh, in your careers. Um, so I'll jump in. Um, I, I'll, I'll have to say uh, that I, I, I understand that the housing element is going to be front and center. Um, and I think that it's going to be a volatile issue that uh, has um, a lot of implications and it's going to be very complex. Um, I, I hope that we can come to a resolution that will have, um, it will be made with uh, sort of smart uh, with regard to fire and water and things like that, but also also empathic um, and understanding that, you know, we really need people to uh, be able to live here that work here. Um, so I don't know how that rolls into policy uh, council member, but I know it's, it's a big item that our community is gonna have to wrestle with. Um, and whether that uh, rolls into um, some of our um, planning and uh, building codes to um, sort of allow types of housing that we want. You know, if our, uh, again, I, I, I don't call myself an expert on our, our local planning issues yet, uh, but you know, if we required every housing uh, unit that was built by a developer to have the proportions of an artist studio and have north windows, uh, maybe we would end up with an art community. <laughs> you know, there, there's things that uh, we can do with policy to create what we want here. Um, I'll leave it a little vague with that. Okay, I'll follow up then. Um, there's a few that come to mind. Um, density being the first one, and that has, I think, comes from two sides. Uh, one of them is, of course, the um, the size of projects. I think there, there's pressure to have larger homes instead of smaller, so where smaller ones are better from an environmental standpoint. But it also probably relates to uh, second units. A um, lot, you know, how, how large a house can be on a certain lot size. So I think there will be challenges there. I would expect that they would be there. Um, related to that, I would suspect there's going to be challenges on parking, um, be it either, I mean, most likely probably for residential, because that ties into a little bit to um, what can be built on properties in particular when it relates to second units. Um, uh, and more so on the hillsides probably. Um, so those come to mind. Um, beyond that, uh, there is not something that I would see as an eminent change other than, of course, the housing program itself. There obviously is a, a necessity to uh, you know, possibly rezone some areas, but that's not rezone. Thank you. And Council Member Goddard? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. And uh, Brett, uh, my daughter used to babysit for your children. <laughs> and Betsy did a lot of work on the zero waste initiatives with sustainable Fairfax. So um, thank her for that um, and you for having your children. Um, so the question I have is that um, so you both are coming from a creative architecture background, so artists, if you will. Um, and my question is, it's, you know, it's no secret that we um, have been allocated um, uh, 
really high uh, number of um, housing units that need to be created in the next eight years. So we're supposed to plan for the creation of 491 units over this next housing cycle. So I'm just wondering from the creative perspective, what are some ways that you might dream of us um, making that happen? So we know there are you know, things that we have to look at policy wise, but do you have any out of the box kind of ways of thinking about how we're going to generate that housing um, that may not be already in the, in the code book? Um, you think that's, I got to start there, right? Um, yeah, there's a number of things. Um, of course, one of the low hanging fruit, I think, are the second units. They already exist. Um, I'm quite sure there exists more than we are aware of. Um, they, they fit scale of, of our city. So that's, I think, it, it was not easy to implement, but, but it's an easy one from a uh, urban standpoint to see if you can up the total number of housing affordable housing units available i think next to that is and and you know maybe to some degree um, as a result of what happened last year i think there are areas uh, in the downtown area that have a semi-commercial function that is underutilized i could see that rezoning that would uh, create some opportunities to do housing um, and or it could be in combination with commercial or exclusively housing. Um, but so there are a few areas that I know exist around town. So that's an opportunity. Um, the only part furthermore is I think is um, trying to avoid um, having something that is of a large scale. I know the uh, senior housing that was built a little bit further up the, uh, up the road, uh, at Sir Francis Drake. Um, would work a relatively a large scale project for Fairfax. Um, I think it's done very well. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's nicely hidden within the context. And there are other apartment uh, uh, buildings there. Um, but I think that's something to be very careful with because people will freak out if they see developments like that. And, you know, 490 sounds like a big number. And it is big considering that we are a small city, but it's not really that big. Um, so I think if you if you start hitting it and start um, tripping away from it with all those opportunities you see, you probably get halfway. Thank you. I'll have to uh, echo a couple of things that Robert said with regard to, you know, our um, accessory units is gotta be or the number one. That That's not very far out of the box. Um, I think that we have a huge opportunity to um, to make what we want, right? We have an incredible um, creative community um, that has a lot of opinions. Um, so how to channel that creativity is the struggle, right? Um, but I, I actually think of a story when Mission Bay was developed, uh, uh, planned to be developed in the late 90s. It was a big flat open site. And so it, it doesn't relate to our wonderful little town, right? In one, because the geography is totally different. But the process uh, was quite interesting the way they invited people in to um, create something tabula rasa from the start. No, nothing was there. One of the schemes that I will always remember was by an architect from uh, New York whose name was Michael Sorkin. And his, uh, his take on this wonderful possibility right? It, it, it was a need. San Francisco was, you know, they thought it was a need. So he thought, well, what should be there? And how can we write our guidelines or codes? And he's thinking for the city of San Francisco. So it would be similar to us. That would require anybody that wants to build something here to make really what's good for us. Um, and that's why I, I kind of very flippantly said, well, we could make everything you know, a 20 by 20 by 30 foot tall box with north facing windows. Every developer has to build that only if we just wanted an art, artist community, right? Um, the trouble is, you know, we love the scale and nature of our town. So how do you make what we want at the scale that we want? And it is finding the in-between places that Robert was talking about that are semi-commercial areas that could have a number of small units on them. 
Um, and maybe there's something that the town could uh, create a way for those to be built uh, by mandate, whether it's someone that wants to build the uh, uh, housing, uh, the senior housing would also have to do worker housing. They can't just do the senior housing. That developer would be required to do housing for the people that work there. Um, if there are other um, lucrative um, businesses that would like to work in Fairfax, well, maybe they would have to build housing also so that their people could work, live here also, whether it's above, adjacent, across town in a, in a you know, garden setting rather than being on the downtown corridor. Um, there's ways to think about how we can write into our, you know, we can will it to happen to make what we think is good for our community. Thank you. Thank you both. And are there any further questions from council members? And if not, I'll ask both applicants to just do a very brief summary. Uh, if, if there's anything else you'd like to say to tie things together and then we should discuss. Nothing else? Oh, no, sure. Okay. I was waiting, maybe Brett wanted to go first. Yes. Oh, well, go the ahead. first so, thing. I've... Very briefly, yes. Yeah. You're gonna have a very difficult choice here. You're gonna have two men who are both architects and no hair. And so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> you knew you were good. That, that was I interesting when we, when we both <laughs> popped up. It's like, hey, hey, Brett. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, um, no, so I'm, I'm honored that uh, I, you know, you're interested in, in considering me. I would look forward to uh, join you and, you know, bring the best that I can. Um, after thinking longer, there are more ideas that pop up, but I don't think this is the right moment to, to go deeper into that. So I thank you and um, I'm looking forward to if you select me. Thank you. Right? Yeah. And I'll, I'll just echo what Robert said. Um, I think you do have a difficult decision. In my, my opinion, that Robert sounds very qualified. <laughs> um, thank you. So I, just, I, really, I, I really thank you for the opportunity. I'd be really excited to be able to help the town any way I can. So um, thank you for tonight. Thank you. OK. Um, do we click leave? Um, you can, yes. Uh, Michelle, what would you recommend? Um, if you would like to be to put you back into the attendee or you can turn off your camera, the, the next step is that the public gets to make comments if they want and then the council deliberates. Right. So it's up to you if you want to turn your camera off. Okay. So we can go to public comment at this point? Oh, sure. Okay, I just see one raised hand. And if anyone else on the call wants to comment, just raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, and this is Betsy, Betsy Fletcher Kelly. So I have unmuted you. If you want to unmute yourself now. Yeah. Good evening. Hi, I'm so sorry. I apparently raised my hand accidentally. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But I would like to say that I think my husband is very qualified. <laughs> Thank you. For that. Right. All right. Thank Thank you. Guys. All right. Um, does anyone else have a comment who's on the call? I do not see any. Mr. Mayor, if you um, want to close it. Okay. Um, we'll close public comment and I see Ben's hand raised. I don't know whether that's accidental or not. Ben, were you? Uh, it is not. I'm trying to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I think the town is very fortunate to have two obviously qualified candidates. I wanted to uh, remind those gentlemen that uh, this will be a very intensive period for the Planning Commission um, with a likelihood, a strong likelihood of uh, two meetings a month. Um, and if you've been watching the Planning Commission meetings, and I know uh, at least one of you has, you know that these meetings uh, start at seven and go into the wee hours. Um, so I just would like to caution you that this is a very serious commitment. Um, uh, I can tell that there's going to be a lot of reading between now and when you feel fully uh, up to speed with our regulations. But I just want to make sure that we don't get halfway through the process and realize, oh, my God, I have to have a life. 
and a wife and my job, et cetera. So just, just a cautionary tale there. And again, um, thank you very much for your interest in the community. And I'm delighted with the quality of the candidates we have. Thanks, Ben, I appreciate that. Barbara? Yeah, well, I think we have an embarrassment of riches as everybody's pretty much said. I think back to my time on the planning commission and what was really helpful um, being on there. We do have one architect on the planning commission at this time who's unlicensed, but really adds a lot of value for some of the things that uh, some of us more generalists don't have. And what I, I do feel that Robert has more experience to be able to hit the ground running with his uh, working on housing already. And I think Brett uh, being more focused on, or actually he said solely focused on building healthcare, which is really valuable, is not something we're gonna see in Fairfax. So I think back to Laura Kerline, who was on the planning commission with me and just more recently got off and, just some of the things that she would bring as an architect really helped frame the discussion. And I, uh, from what I hear from Robert's uh, thumbnail sketch and responses, I think he would be able to hit the ground running sooner. And I also want to say I appreciate um, our planning director cautioning people that this is going to be hot and heavy times. And so for whoever gets in, it's really gonna be a bigger commitment than maybe it has been in the past. So hopefully everybody's ready for that. But I would um, strongly advocate for Robert as being um, our candidate. And I would encourage Brad, if he is not selected to consider, uh, keep watching because there's folks that probably are getting tired of being on the planning commission as well. So whoever is chosen, I don't think we can make a mistake here. Thank you, Barbara. Renee. Um, yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, I may I may throw in a different uh, a different color here. Um, I I'm actually quite um, overtaken by the um, by the two uh, balding gentlemen that. Uh, stood before us. Um, that was supposed to be a joke, you guys. Um, and uh, I, I feel as though uh, each um, very qualified, uh, the, of a variety of different work experience. And, um, uh, and, and so I don't see that one would be particularly more ready to hit the ground running um, than another. Um, I do appreciate very much um, the sort of um, Fairfax, we can create what works for our community um, kind of spirit that I heard in Brett. Um, and I think right now we're going to, um, we, we have some really solid thinkers and experienced professionals on the planning commission and they know their stuff. So what I'm thinking is a new, a little bit of an infusion of, um, of creativity from that. And that's why I asked my question earlier from a little more of an, an artistic um, perspective might just lend itself to helping us make our way through these next uh, two years really of what everyone has said and explained as very intensive work. Um, so I, I would be absolutely thrilled with either candidate and thank them uh, for stepping forward. But um, I, would put my, I would put my vote in for Brett for, me, for the reasons that, I, that I've already expressed. Thank you, Renee. Stephanie? Um, thank you both council member Goddard and Kohler for your thoughts. I'm, really on the fence and we are blessed with such high quality candidates and like the rest of folks here tonight have said, thank you so much for stepping forward to share your um, 
professional experience and give to the back to the community this way. Um, so I'm just ever so slightly leaning toward um, Robert. I note that you are a member of the um, U.S. Green Building Council, and that is very much a direction that this council in this town is moving in. Um, so I would, uh, I think you're both equally qualified, honestly, and um, I appreciate what Barbara shared and um, that would be my vote, Robert. Thank you. Council Member Catrano, chance. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, so I, yeah, like everyone said, Y'all are both fantastic. I would love to have a, a coffee with either or both of you. And I hope you take me up on that offer because I'd love to wax planning and policy with, with either of you. Um, <clears throat> I uh, appreciate the comments that everyone has, has made before me. I think um, I, I also was in tune with that US Green Building Council bit from Robert. I think also the fact that Brett is you know, a member or a uh, has an association with SPUR is interesting too. They do a lot of interesting research that I uh, encountered while I was in graduate school. Um, and I appreciate their offerings um, in, in being imaginative and, and thinking uh, in realizing new realities in communities. Uh, I think the the two things that, that kind of put it over for me, um, one is this bit that Robert mentions about, um, you know, client relations, programming, planning, design, project management, construction administration, office management, like running the gamut of all these different pieces, which are important considerations as we're thinking through all the different perspectives and the different prisms that stakeholders are bringing to planning commission meetings uh, and as we're planning the future of Fairfax. And uh, the other bit is definitely to, to Council Member Kohler's point uh, about the, the, the types of projects and the scope of work that's that's currently being done. And I, I think um, I'm sure you're both absolutely capable of, of accomplishing all that we have to, to tackle here in Fairfax, but um, just on, on paper and, and with some of these answers, uh, I think Robert would, would probably be my, my choice and uh, look forward to Brett continuing to be involved as well. Thank you. Well, thanks for not making me be the tiebreaker. Um, and I, uh, I too very much thank the candidates both for your interest in this job and echo what, uh, what Ben Berto, our planning director said, this is going to be quite a year. So um, you're on um, and we're with you. So I, uh, I, lean toward Robert, myself, uh, for um, among the reasons being, as, as was stated, just the variety of experience and uh, the, kind of, the kind of things that, uh, that we see here in Fairfax. Uh, the Planning Commission has two roles. One is to do hearings for applications and sometimes as, as one of the questions addressed that gets into some neighbor to neighbor stuff and some things that aren't entirely clear in the code and really just have to be resolved. And then the other thing is policy and zoning and some very serious research. And the Planning Commission has been doing more and more of that recently. And it's a lot of work. So um, either one of you would be uh, quite capable and quite challenged but um, I'll put my vote toward Robert. So thank you both. So it seems that we have an appointment. Would you like an emotion? Yes. So I'd like, and first of all, thank both the candidates and encourage Brett to stay involved. I'd like to make a motion to appoint Robert Jansen to the Planning Commission. We have a second. Second. Okay, motion caller, second Catrano. And Michelle, would you do the roll call, please? Yes, and I just wanted to clarify it's to an unexpired term on the Planning Commission. 
Oh, yes. Uh, okay. To January 30th, 2024. Okay, I will accept that friendly amendment. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Council Member Catrano. Yes. Council Member Goddard. Yes. Council Member Kohler. Yes. Vice Mayor Hellman. Yes. And Mayor Ackerman. Yes. All ayes, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, so for the public, in five minutes, we will return and on this same Zoom channel and begin a regular council meeting. Thank you. Welcome back, council members and the public. So we will now call to order the regular, regular council meeting for um, May 5th, 2021. And uh, I suppose we should begin with a roll call because this is a different meeting than the one before which we were interviewing candidates for the Planning Commission and appointed one. So could you do the roll call please, um, Michelle? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, Council Member Cutrano? Present. Council Member Kohler? Here. Council Member Goddard? I'm here. Vice Mayor Hellman? Here. And Mayor Ackerman. Still here. All present. Thank you. Okay. And oh, I should get organized here on, on the agenda. So um, we have a lot on the agenda tonight, um, beginning with the approval of agenda and affidavit of posting. Do we have any um, comments or changes on that? Uh, Council Member Catrano. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I um, actually would like to uh, amend the agenda and move um, our regular agenda uh, ahead of the public hearing and to reorder the regular agenda where item 15 comes before item 14. So it would go 15, 14, and then the public hearing where we would hear item 12. And uh, if there's no discussion and you've, uh, and that's a motion, I would second that motion. Okay, so just to be clear, your proposal would be to begin with the, the announcements and the open time and the presentations. Is that correct? And then and skip then, over the consent calendar and go straight to 15, 14, and 12. I would take I would take consent and then after consent do 15, 14, and then 12. Okay, so the only change would be at the point where we go into 12, we would instead do 15, 14, and 12. Okay. Any I was going to suggest the same thing. All right. Very good. So, um, I think we need a motion for that. Okay, so I'll move that we um, amend the agenda to uh, have items 15 and 14 heard uh, after item 11, uh, followed by item 12, the public hearing. Okay. And so, I'll, take it. I'll second that. Okay, and uh, I'll take a quick roll call. Council Member Kohler. Aye. Council Member Goddard? Uh, yes. Council Member Catrano? Yes. Vice Mayor Hellman? Yes. And yes for me as well. Okay, so the land acknowledgement, I will read. Uh, the Fairfax Town Council acknowledges that we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors, past, past, present, and emerging. The meeting protocol, the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and are ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. We'll review the agenda at about 10 p.m. to ascertain which items might be continued and we will, uh, any matter not started by 11.30, we'll consider continuing it to another meeting. 
I have a few announcements that are on the agenda and we'll see whether council members have any to add to that. The uh, next council meeting will be the Thursday, May 27th annual budget workshop that begins at 10 a.m. There won't be a mid-May special council meeting as we've been having recently. <clears throat> um, vacancies on boards and commissions and their applications available on the website or you can contract uh, contact clerk Michelle Gardner. Uh, the Climate Action Committee has up to four vacancies. Parks and Recreation Commission has one vacancy. Volunteer Board has one vacancy. The Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee has three vacancies and two youth vacancies. That would be under 18. And the Marin Commission on Aging, the current term for the Fairfax representative ends June 30th. The Fairfax Food Pantry operates on Saturdays from 8.30 to 10.30 at the Fairfax Community Church, which is 2398 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. No one has turned away. Um, you're welcome to join in and help with that, as well as coming to the food pantry for any needs that you have. And to receive town newsletter agendas, newsletters, and updates by email, you just have to one time go to the townoffairfax.org website and you'll see a way to subscribe and then you'll get these in your email. Um, it's very helpful to keep up with what's happening. Are there any other announcements from council members? Uh, Vice Mayor Hellman. Yeah, um, I just wanted to share with the community, we have uh, plans we wanna communicate soon about the cascade restriping um and we're just getting estimates for that right now on who's going to do the work so it's not planned but we do get emails uh pretty frequently uh following up on that topic because we voted on it three months ago and so i just wanted to share that that is being worked on and we hope to schedule the work soon and the plan does include um uh, 12 Sharrows every 200 feet, six on each side. So I feel really good personally about that enhancement from a safety and uh, share the road, you know, communication standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, with that, we will move to open time for public expression. This is a time to address the council on matters that are not on tonight's agenda. If it is on tonight's agenda, there'll be a time for uh, public comment at when, as that item comes up. Um, individuals are limited to three minutes, and if you're representing a group, that would be five minutes. Um, council is not permitted to take action, and state law strictly prohibits the right to for council to really discuss unagendized items, but we will hear your comments. So with that, um, clerk, Michelle Gardner, would you please open up the public expression? Yes, I'd be happy to, Mayor. Um, we have the first three people who will speak are Rick, followed by Jody Timms, followed by Deborah Benson. Rick, I have unmuted you. Um, hello, uh, this is Rick Hamer from Fairfax. Um, uh, just real quickly, um, I want to mention that the skateboard park seems to be a great success. It's wonderful. I see a lot of uh, people taking advantage of it, but there's one comment um, actually in two parts I need to make, and that is that there is no seating for parents or other uh, spectators there. And because of that, um, some of the neighboring properties, such as where I live, are getting some overflow uh, skateboarders because we have seating and the skateboard park does not. And um, in addition to that, the um, there seems to be one extra Jersey barricade there that doesn't seem to be necessary, which is affecting the emergency access to the Fairfax Pavilion. Uh, when you come down that hill there, um, if that Jersey barricade were removed and perhaps replaced with some benches, um, that were movable, perhaps it would be safer up in the pavilion. And we would also have less overflow from uh, all the 
people having fun at the skateboard park. So if uh, you folks can look into that, we would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. The next speaker is Jody Timms, followed by Deborah Benson, followed by Linda Novi. And Jody, you're unmuted now. Good evening, council members. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jody Timms, the Commission on Aging representative for the town. I don't know if you've checked in your mailboxes, but if you have, you have found um, the final printed copy of the Age-Friendly Fairfax 2020 report. They came in today and I left one in each of your boxes. So um, again, thank you for all the support through the years. It's really nice to have this hard copy in my hand. And we had a hundred of them printed, so we'll be distributing them. If people, anyone in town would like one, you could let um, probably Susan Waters know or Maria Bard and we can get a copy to you. Um, so thank you for that. And I just wanted to mention a few upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, actually, Ross Valley Seniors, they're not having their luncheon, of course, but they are having a Zoom meeting to honor mothers in celebration of either being a mom or having a mom. <laughs> so that information, all the events that I'm mentioning are on the website for the town under Age Friendly Fairfax. But that's tomorrow at 1230. And then breakfast with friends, um, we are going back to Barefoot. So for our first time in over a year, uh, May 19th, we'll be gathering at, at 930 at Barefoot. So if you're vaccinated and you would like to come have breakfast with us, um, please do join us at 930. Then the last week in May, we actually have three events happening back to back. <laughs> May 26th, um, the Age Friendly Marin Forum. Uh, May is Mental Health Month, so there'll be a special speaker that day talking about isolation and loneliness in older adults and how to address that, those needs. Um, that's at 1030 in the morning. The next day, the uh, Commission on Aging once a year has an annual health forum. And on the 27th, that from 10 to 1230, the subject is, is there a doctor in the house? And it's about telehealth and digital medicine. So these are very important skills and information to have um, for all of us, but certainly older adults so that we can continue to get the healthcare services that we need as many of them go electronic or digitally. Uh, and then last, um, the Age-Friendly Fairfax uh, Task Force will meet on the 28th, again by Zoom at 9.15. So lots of things coming up um, to keep in mind, lots of events. And again, thank you very much for all the support um, through the years for Age-Friendly Fairfax and, and to me as your commissioner uh, on, on aging. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. Um, before I call on the next speaker, Mr. Mayor, may I just respond to a question from the public that I received by email about their ability to comment on the Elliott Preserve? That would be for later in the agenda when the presentation is made, after the presentation. Yes, we will have public comment after each of the presentations. Thank mm -hmm. you for clarifying that. So not at open time because it's on the agenda. Right. So the next speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by Linda Novi. And Deborah, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Hello, council members. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I am uh, wondering yet again, what is holding up the restriping of Cascade Drive? The, the, uh, the project that did the most recent striking happened literally overnight. And over a month ago at another council meeting, another member of the public a resident asked, about this um, fix and we were told by uh, staff that the measurements have been done and it had to go out to bid. So I'm wondering why it is not being tended to and why this slow pace to get this back in, into a safe configuration. Um, I've emailed all of you about that, that question I have not heard from any of you. Um, the other question I have is um, in, in one of the most recent town newsletters, there was uh, congratulations to the people who did the, the playground in the park. And there was a, a, a mention of a spider, a piece of equipment called the spider that was going to be located in another part of the park. 
And um, I think our park space is at a premium. It's a lovely little playground. And I think if that spider doesn't fit, it should come before the public and not just be decided to take another piece of our park. It's, it's really not that large. Um, I emailed you all about that as well and have not had a response. So thank you for hearing me. Thank you. The next speaker is Linda Novi, and not followed by anyone. Linda, you are unmuted now. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say thanks to the town for weed whipping around the fire hydrant on Cascade Drive and putting up signs that say no parking around it. As you know, Cascade Drive and Canyon Road have intense parking pressure due to the visitors to Elliott Nature Preserve. Uh, and so people were frequently parking in front of the fire hydrant. And then I also understand that the um, patrol, a uh, parking patrol may be starting up soon. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify and uh, ask if that is going to be happening because again, we have a lot of um, parking on our street from visitation and then people that have rental units or visitors and it, it turns our uh, cascade drive into a one lane road. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the next speaker is Mark Bell. Thanks, Michelle. Going back to this land acknowledgement, which you seem to be reading at every opportunity, um, obviously the points that were raised at the last meeting when there was open time and this could be discussed were dismissed, uh, I guess, as ravings, while most of the town probably thinks that what you're saying is basically a raving. When you're talking about unceded land, you're talking about land that goes back well before the Miwoks. And actually, there are even archaeological digs that show that there were Homo erectus uh, tribes living in North America probably uh, uh, up to 130,000 years ago. There was also cross uh, inhabitation between Neanderthals and Native American tribes in the United States. So considering that Marin's a pretty nice place to live, and if you were a tribe looking for a place that had food sources, it's highly likely that there was at least a tribe of Homo erectus people living in Marin. And uh, did they cede the land to the Miwok people? I find that highly unlikely. You can look at other Native American tribes such as the Lakota who came and drove the Kiowa out of the Great Plains because they wanted that land, those lands for themselves. They don't, and the Kiowas probably drove out someone before them. Most of the people who were living in Fairfax at this time probably had ancestors who came to the United States in the 1880s onward. Mine came after the, in the early 1900s, after being the punching bag for the Russian czar whenever they needed to go murder some people. So I think you're doing an incredible disservice to people who have followed what has been the civilization existing at the time. And that when you keep coming up with this land acknowledgement, you're basically telling people that they're here illegally. And that's not the case. And as far as the cascade striping, I'm still trying to get an answer as to exactly how much money has the town spent on this project considering in the words of your own traffic engineer Parisi, who said that the entire project was illegal because no studies were ever done to do the initial restriping. Therefore, why is the town having to pay to fix something that was totally illegal when the responsibility lies with the town manager and one president and one former town council member? That's all I have. Thanks, Mark. 
Thank you. The <clears throat> next speaker is Devin Fordyce Wilson. You are unmuted now. You might need to unmute yourself, Devin. Thank you, I didn't see that. Thank you everybody for the time for um, letting me speak. My name is Devin, I live on Cascade and I just wanna say that my issue is with the parkettes up or the parkette, little parkettes. They're up and down the streets on between Bellinas so and Broadway. We, we will be discussing uh, issues about the parkette, uh, the, not really the parkades, but we'll be we'll be talking about that issue uh, in item 15, which will now actually follow item 11. So um, if your comment is about that, that the time to speak to it would be when that agenda item comes up. So, All right. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Just let me know. I'll put my hand back I'm, down. I'm sorry for that. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Thank you. OK. We'll see you later. Okay. I see no further speakers, Mr. Mayor. Okay, with that, we will close the public comment on items not on the agenda, referred to as open time here in Fairfax. And we will move to presentations, which we have three of queued up for tonight. So um, the first will be one which I've been asked to read, which is a presentation of a proclamation in memory of Eugene Ardito. So I will read this, this proclamation. Uh, Town of Fairfax proclamation in memory of Eugene Silvio Ardito, Jean Ardito. Whereas Jean was born on April 25th, 1925 in Fairfax to Silvio and Luisa Ardito, and whereas as a young boy, Jean attended Fairfax Grammar School, then as a young man, he commuted to Tamalpai High by the school special train and was active in football and track and field. He graduated TAM in 1943. And whereas after graduation, he entered the US Navy and was stationed in Alaska during World War II, returning home to Fairfax after the war. And whereas Eugene married his wife, Lois on May 10th, 1952. They spent nearly 60 years of marriage in their Fairfax home. Lois sadly passed away in 2012. They had a son and a daughter, Michael and Nancy. Michael remains in Fairfax in the home he shared with his dad and Nancy is in Oahu, Hawaii with her family. And whereas Eugene was the proud and loving grandfather of Nicole Ardito Ng, and uncle to many nieces and nephews. And whereas Jean worked for the Marin, Marin Municipal Water District for 36 years, retiring in 1985. And whereas he was a charter member of the Fairfax Parlor of the Native Sons of the Golden West since its start in 1949, serving as financial secretary for over 60 years. He was also a member of the Fairfax Historical Society. And whereas he loved sports, serving as umpire for the Fairfax Little League Baseball for about 10 years, and was also a member of a bowling team and Fairfax Native Sons bocce team. I might be mispronouncing that. And whereas Gene's lifelong favorite sport was golf, which he played until his late 80s. His last game was played at the San Geronimo Golf Course, and he also played many games over the years in several states, achieving four holes in one in his lifetime. <clears throat> and whereas in past days, Gene could always be found Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. at the Barefoot Cafe, prior days at the Coffee Clutch, enjoying breakfast with his buddies, including Lou Vaccaro, Joe Bruce, Bob Burroughs, Peter Aragoni, all Fairfaxians and a few others for other, other Marin locales. Lou affectionately called them all the men of the wrinkled faces. <clears throat> Excuse me, thou therefore be it hereby proclaimed that in honor of the memory of Eugene Ardito, May 5th, 2021 is Eugene Ardito Day in the town of Fairfax. Mayor, may I add something? Yes, please do. Thank you. Well, um, I just want to give a brief statement. I started a few years ago trying to memorialize some of our esteemed members of Fairfax, going back to Lou Vaccaro, 
William Sagar, Pete Aragoni, and others. And part of what I did is prepare a plaque that would be for most folks put in the um, pavilion. And so I hope Michael Ardito, his son, is on the line right now. I see his hand raised. But I would like our town clerk to hold up the plaque. And um, usually what I've done is most times I have gifted this to the town. But this is part of our age-friendly Fairfax. And just there are so many folks that have given so many years to this town. I'll read what's on the plaque now. In memory of Eugene Jean Silvio Ardito, born and raised in Fairfax, Eugene was a lifelong Fairfax resident. He was a proud member of the Fairfax Parlor of the Native Sons of the Golden West. Our sincere thanks for Eugene's many contributions to our town. Fairfax Town Council, May 5th, 2021, Eugene Ardito Day. And I think we're honored to have Michael Ardito on the line with his hand raised, Mayor, if you don't mind calling on him. I would be happy to. And uh, Michelle, if you could bring Michael in. Yeah, Michael, you're yeah, unmuted. Michael. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. This is uh, Mike Ardito. Um, the Ardito family wants to express their uh, gratitude for such an honor and recognize my dad for his whole life, almost 96 years in Fairfax. Um, so thank you, Mayor uh, Bruce Ackman for reading the proclamation. And yes, you did pronounce Bocce correctly. And uh, thank you, um, uh, Barbara Kohler, um, Councilwoman who composed the proclamation. We are so grateful for that and to the town for the plaque that will be hung um, in his honor. I uh, just want to mention one other thing. Um, the honors keep rolling in, which is just, we're just so pleased and uh, have so much gratitude that um, last week we learned that um, a, a student, um, Aiden Aguilar, graduating from Sir Francis Drake High School, um, 1327, um, he was planning to attend the United States Naval Academy, was, uh, was awarded the first annual Eugene Ardito scholarship from the Native Sons of the Golden West uh, in Fairfax. And it's quite fitting because my dad served in the uh, US Navy during World War II. So it was a perfect fit. And so we give congratulations also to Aiden Aguilar for receiving that $1,000 scholarship in my dad's um, memory and honor. Okay, thank you all uh, so much and to the town for this wonderful recognition of my dad. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I will just ask our town manager if we can have our public works folks hang that plaque near Lou Vaccaro and William Sagar's plaques in the pavilion soon. So hopefully when we open up, folks can see it. Thank you. Um, do we have any further public comment, Michelle? Yes, yes. Oops, no, the hand went away. Thank you. No. Okay. So we'll bring it back to council. Thank you all for that. Um, we next have a presentation on proposed uses of local funds for the Marin Wildfire, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority and presented by our uh, County Fire Chief, Jason Weber. Good evening, Chief Weber. Mr. Mayor, thank you, council members. Good evening. Uh, I'll ask uh, Garrett to share the PowerPoint, which I will make quick, but I thought it would be important to have some information up there. So if I sped through it, we'd have a visual aid. And uh, just kicking off, I think that, you know, the, the emblems up here are a symbol of the importance of this and also the collaborative nature of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. And, you know, everything we do, we do in step. Uh, Ross Valley Fire Department, the town of Fairfax, Fairfax Police Department and the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. And as your council is well aware, uh, represented, well represented uh, by council member Kohler uh, on the MWPA board. So uh, one of the items uh, we've been working on in the operations level, which is where Garrett and I, your town manager, um, represent the organizations, uh, is the um, 
overall work plan. And so we wanted to come back in front of your council, talk about where we're at right now and, and where we're going. But I thought it would also be important to remind both the community as well as, as the council how the funding works uh, for MWPA. So as, as you're well aware, uh, it's a 17 member uh, organization that was created to create efficiency and collaboration and strategy around wildfire prevention across the county. And I think in the short 10 months that we have been stood up, it's pretty amazing the amount of work that's been done. Um, but just as a reminder, uh, it's, it's a 10 cent per square foot charge uh, on, on properties, uh, built, built properties. And uh, roughly in the town of Fairfax, there's about $490,000 generated from that. Um, and it goes into, for no better terms, three separate buckets. And the one bucket is the core. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The other bucket is defensible space. And the third being local. And really the defensible space and the local are pass-throughs through the JPA, uh, MWPA, to the, to the city or town for, for control. Uh, and the core is held at a larger level, in this case, the Greater Ross Valley um, and some countywide efforts. Next slide, Garrett. So just as, as a reminder, again, the county's broken up into five geographical zones uh, that are roughly proportionate in, in the, the communities they serve from a population perspective uh, and roughly uh, the same in, in the amount of revenue that's generated. Um, so those five zones uh, were the central zone, which is kind of that darker purple area uh, between the green and the red. And that roughly extends from Corte Madera up uh, to Whites Hill, just past Fairfax. Um, so out of the core funds, which we talked about, 10% uh, go to support the MWPA's just general operation, right? To keep the doors open, the lights on, uh, and, and the background working behind us. Um, the other is broken up into the five zones. And then within those five zones, we're part of the greater Ross Valley, as I mentioned. Uh, so with a house out approach this year and a focus on protecting lives and getting people out of harm's way, uh, the, the core, which consists of these the fire agencies, cities and towns within the Ross Valley, stayed focused, as did really the rest of the JPA, on evacuation routes and that work around that. Um, and, and that's what our intention is to fund. So we're evaluating the roadways now to work on. And as your council recalls, we did some work already on evacuation routes this last year. It's really to expand upon that. There's also been some work done by recently by uh, a grant that Fire Safe Marin got. So our focus this year, uh, the entire JPA and, and what we're recommending for your council is a house out approach. And we'll cover that with the core and defensible space, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but our focus this year, again, on evacuation routes in the core, and then recognizing that once we start to move away from the evacuation routes, looking at a shaded type fuel modification, if you will, in partnership with our public land management agencies. Uh, so going a little further away from the house, um, still within a couple hundred feet of property lines, et cetera. And that is really creating a, a buffer zone, if you will, across the entire greater Ross Valley. Well, in order to do that, be successful, reach out to our partners to, to look at what that prescription looks like, how can there can be mutual benefit about, uh, you know, ecology and, and native fuels, but also uh, creating a, a little safer space. We need to do some planning work around that. So we're recommending that uh, to the, the operations committee and ultimately to the MWPA board that they fund our ability to start the environmental work and the other process, planning process associated with that. Then that third piece in there, is for defensible space inspection software, which I'm going to cover in a minute. Um, but we at the Ross Valley are recommending using this, and I think you'll you'll see why here shortly. Other funds out of that core that may come off the top before they come down to us are the work Fire Safe Marin's doing, and that includes chipper days, uh, public education, uh, and and grants. Uh, the grant program I think will live under MWPA, but but it's I've listed it there under Fire Safe Marin, and that's really targeted at, at the large level at senior low income. And, and it will be a little bit hyper-focused on that. Um, and then the, the next piece and an important piece for all of us is the work around evacuation routes and the product, the software product Zone Haven, 
um, which is a, a traffic management software, evacuation software that's going to help us um, not only redistribute our, our, our uh, MTZ maps that we've historically used, but use a lot of data behind that. And then I think you've heard me all speak about the work that, that we're doing right now in a larger study across the county um, that will help inform our work plans for future years, and that's assessing evacuation routes. And from the perspective of using all the data that we have in the, the community wildfire protection plan, traffic data and everything else to really start to put a, a risk assessment to each road um, with an opportunity to turn the dial. And what I mean by that is, and I heard you I hear you mentioned Cascade Canyon, which is always an area of concern for me, and you'll hear me reference it a lot, is, you know, if it's a one way in, one way out road, um, what, what items are also contributing to, to the increased risk associated with evacuation? Is it vegetation management that needs to be done? Is it parking uh, work? Is it, um, uh, you know, very few people are registered in the alert and warning system? What are all the contributing factors that we're going to compile in the study? Then we can make very uh, decisive and strategic um, plans associated with mitigating some of those. So if a road ends up nine out of 10, and I don't know what the rating system is going to be, but what factors can we do? Can we manipulate to, to lower the risk? And, and that's really what that study is going to help us determine. And then ultimately will help all of us and you as policymakers decide where we're going to spend the funds. Next slide. So this is a little bit about the Defensible Space Program, which as we mentioned is about $96,000 for the town of Fairfax. Uh, we're still in the education and encouragement uh, portion of this, um, but you're going to start to see follow-up inspections this year, where last year we really were one touch and moved on um, because we wanted to hit the most people. This year we're going to be a little bit more focused and we're going to return to those residents after 30 days and, and determine whether the, the recommendations that, that we made have been, have been uh, accomplished and if they haven't, what is, is, is precluding them from doing that? Is it their senior that physically can't do it? Is, is there a financial issue that's precluding them? Um, so we can, we can try to really make a difference. Right now we're seeing on average about a 40% compliance rate uh, with the inspections. And, and we really know that we need to be above 80%. Uh, I'd love to say 100, but, but that's my dream goal. Maybe in year nine or 10, we'll get there. So, uh, some of the benefits of what we're doing with Defensible Space is we've pulled all our resources with the greater Ross Valley in the county and created a Defensible Space Inspection or, or Evaluation Program that we're sharing the costs associated with that, including the leadership. Um, and that's not leaders with a ship, but leadership. Uh, I, I've got to do a little editing there. Um, and uh, and what, that, what that means is we have one leader and about 20 seasonal staff that work under that individual. Um, and, and we're able to pull our resources and, and do a lot more inspections. We completed nearly 10,000 inspections last year with this program. And we may see fewer inspections or fewer number of households touched this year, but again, it'll have re-inspections and I think we'll maintain about the same number of inspections. The other is the software that I was referring to. We have historically been leaving a paper form that isn't very intuitive for individuals and the task seems overwhelming. Uh, the software we're, we're working to develop right now with a developer um, will be an iPad based software that we can take pictures of exactly what the issue is and provide them recommendations. So if it's if it's dead leaves on, on a roof, we've got a picture of it. You know, it can be mitigated by removing that, blowing it off. It could be a bush that has a lot of dead material in it. It's a native bush, but needs some work on pruning, uh, limbing up, etc. So if a resident is home, um, we can immediately send the form to them uh, with pictures. It's very intuitive. Uh, if the resident is not home, this is an example of, of the door hanger that could be left with a QR code and a specific code for their house that will allow them to access the form uh, you know, immediately and in the future and print their own form out, uh, but use it as a reference point. It'll also have links to uh, you know, information, webinars that Fire Safe Marin has done 
et cetera. So it's a really powerful tool and I'm pretty excited about it because I think it's been a missing link and residents are often asking, I don't know what you mean. And, and clear cutting is not the answer as we know. Generally mature trees, native trees do not need to be removed. They can be limbed um, and, and maintained. And we want people to do the right stuff. Fairfax has a lot of hillside homes. We don't need the ground denuded to mineral earth and have slight issues in the winter. Um, so this really is an opportunity to educate and support the residents. Uh, I'm excited about it. The other is uh, recommending your council. And again, we'll be back and I'll talk about next steps is that we'll probably have headroom with the revenue generated in, in this area of the D space and recommending that we have a local grant program uh, that can be maybe a little bit targeted uh, and, and even come off of, of the seniors and low income, but we'll come back to your council for discussion about specifics related to the grant program. And then I think one of the other benefits also is the work we're doing. We're looking at greening our fleet that these inspectors are driving. So having an all electric or at minimum a hybrid fleet um, that we're putting everybody out in. So we're working on lease options associated with that now. Next slide. So this is the local piece. And uh, again, it's about $96,000, same as the defensible space uh, program. Uh, off the top uh, and at the request uh, through the fire board membership and, and you know, your, your manager, the importance of emergency preparedness. And again, in kind of a shared and collaborative mode, uh, we're looking at and have received some excellent applicants, uh, I understand, and, and we'll be um, setting up interviews here in the near future, which I'll be reaching out to Garrett about participation, um, is the, the cost sharing with the emergency uh, preparedness coordinator position here in the, the Ross Valley Fire Service area, which includes the three towns in the district. Um, then the balance of it will be used for local projects, including but not limited to fuel reduction, goats, uh, specific projects or programs from the, the town council. Uh, and really the, the local funding is designed to tackle high priority projects and programs that are either not covered in the core or D space, or maybe eligible for those two categories, but we, we your, or your council wants to accelerate them and do them, you know, something that might've been planned in year four, we can bring up to year one or two. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we're here to share this information preliminarily. Uh, the operations committee is tasked with recommending a work plan and a budget to the, the board, which you're represented on uh, by council member Kohler. And then we'll be back during your budget planning process is the conversation I had with Garrett to talk about specifics with local projects, details of the grant program, and then also just uh, a, a, re, a year in review with any of the accomplishments that have occurred over the last 12 months, because I think it's really important that community recognizes the, the money that they're making an investment in to protect is, is being well used. So that's it. And I am certainly open for questions and I'm going to stick around for your Elliott Preserve discussion uh, at a call with Max uh, earlier. Thank you, Chief Weber. And I appreciate your sticking around for the next discussion as well. Council member comments? Uh, Renee, you're muted. Okay. Um, thank you, Chief. Um, much appreciated. Um, lots going on over there. Um, questions. I was wondering uh, first about the inspections. Um, you said 10,000 were conducted last year, and that was a one time visit, right? And a drop off. And I just wondered is that countywide? Yeah, that, that is just our consortium, our D-Space consortium, which consists of Central Marin Fire, uh, Kenfield Fire, Ross Valley Fires area, includes Fairfax, and then the county area, which is West Marin, really. So Novato, Southern Marin, and Santa Fe are all separate from that. Um, so the, the numbers are pretty impressive. Um, and then you said it might be a similar number this year, but I know in the past you've targeted certain neighborhoods within Fairfax. Is that still the case? And then um, how will that square off with um, doing it twice, like having them come out and then come back to inspect for compliance? So, yeah, I think our number of inspections will, will be relatively the same. It's just they may be revisits. Uh, and, and so we'll, we're working right now, uh, Kathleen uh, Cutter, who you're probably all familiar with from Fire Safe Marin, who does a fabulous job. 
we've stolen her from fire safe Marin and she is now our defensible space coordinator. And so she just came on two weeks ago and she is going to be working with the fire prevention officers from each one of the agencies uh, to discuss exactly what you're speaking of is, is where are our priorities in this year? Um, and you know, it, it, it we're going to use as much data as we have available now on where we need to do that. So probably by the time I come back to you at your June budget hearings, we should have narrowed that recommendation down and we can share it with you and, and, and at that time. Okay, excellent. I had one other question and that is um, the two buckets that are the 20% buckets, one are local funding and then the other D space. Um, what's the difference in terms of our local discretion in use of those funds? Um, because Garrett, we, we actually, um, Vice Mayor Hellman and I spoke with Garrett today um, and we're trying to understand the difference in how much control we have toward, you know, in our own allocating of those funds based on any kind of restrictions um, of those funds money. So the funds really are restricted to the ballot language in that use. So they would need to be in alignment with the voter initiative. And then there is a great deal of discretion uh, amongst your council. Now, what, what I'll be working with our operational folks on are the bucket list, right? What we feel are some of the key issues in Fairfax and, and potential for mitigation. And that doesn't mean they have to be done in year one. I mean, there's, there's much more work than, than we have probably in the nine years we have left to go. But um, we, we will provide some of those recommendations. And then uh, obviously your council is intimately familiar with the challenges and, and issues in Fairfax. And we'll be looking for your direction there as well. So you do have you do have considerable discretion as long as it's in alignment with the voter initiative. And, and that goes for both funds, correct? Well, defensible space is, is really has to be used for defensible space. And, um, you know, the recommendation is that the, the program itself will, will probably eat up the vast majority of those funds. But the recommendation at this time, and, and again, you have some discretion here, is that we could use the balance of that uh, for home hardening grants and defensible space grant work around people's homes, because it really should stay focused on the defensible space around the house. And that's one way to achieve that. Um, but you could also look at a priority project that was adjacent to a bunch of homes that could provide defensible space. And, and I think that would uh, would be acceptable to the, the MWPA board and ultimately pass the, the front page of the IJ test, if you will. So grateful to have you as our chief and we'll keep this all straight. Uh, Vice Mayor Hellman. Oh. Hi, Chief. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I just have two questions. One is with regard to the D Space program where you take the snapshot. It's so slick. I love it. Um, I think you said we send it to. The resident, but we also leave this leave behind thing with the QR code. Is that right? And if you send it, do you send it by email? I was trying to really understand the experience there for the homeowner. Yeah, and I think we're working on that as we speak. So the okay. software is being developed. We're we're building the plane as we fly it here this year. Got it. And, um, so I, I think part of it will be feedback early in the process this summer on what works best. Um, you know, we don't want it to get lost in junk email and or people just to forget about it. Right. So we want to be effective and whether we have portable printers in the field, that may be a bit logistically challenging. Um, but we may also find that, you know, the demographics and older residents, um, the technology may be a bit challenging. Right. Uh, I, I struggle with QR codes, I'll be honest with you. Um, and, and so I think we, we need to get that feedback and understand what works best and how most effective and and I think we're going to have a lot of opportunity with this, um, including printing potentially on site uh, if we need to. So, you know, we'll look for you. You guys have your ear to the ground in your community. So if, if it's not working well, we want to hear about that. And um, I, I think this at least gives us a lot of flexibility in how we do it. I, I, I think it's awesome. Thank you. And then um, secondly, re regarding the grant program, is that, um, I understand it's countywide, but is it first come first serve or how do, how do you anticipate managing uh, the demand? So 
the the proposal that the operations group came up with was a half a million dollars across the county and it was a senior low income so you needed yeah. to meet both those thresholds the mm -hmm. the income threshold was was uh relatively high i mean i think uh, uh, it could well, a lot of candidates could qualify um but i don't know if they've it, they've decided exactly whether it's first come first serve or how to approach that uh, that we're taking some of the lessons learned from the early grant programs that Novato had last year. Uh, there wasn't a lot of usage. Um, and so I think part of that is the education and outreach piece and, and being able to target that. Uh, I think, you know, again, you guys are so connected to the community that when these things become available, I hope, I hope we get to use them. And I, I would recommend that if we, if we do have a local grant program separate from that, uh, that, you know, we make it as easy as possible to use. So it may be a before and after picture with a signed affidavit, uh, and then you receive your funds. Um, because I think, one, it's such a staff draw and would eat up so much money trying to manage the program if it was cumbersome. But two, you know, I inherently, as do you, trust our residents. And we want to make this easy, simple, and have the dollars go to good use. And, and you know, they may be using an unlicensed contractor or some help. Uh, and, and paying cash. And, and those are all acceptable means of creating defensible space. And I would not want to preclude people um, from doing something. So we'll, we'll have to brainstorm that one together and, and see what works best. I would also ideally like to line up uh, the grant program with the other towns if, if we're going to be managing it. So it's the same um, because having three different systems would be tough. So we'll bring those concepts back for consideration of your council probably at that June budget meeting. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, Council Member Kohler. So Mayor, I think Council Member Catrano, had, you're not looking at the virtual hands. Oh, I think his I'm hand sorry, was up before mine. I'm not. I'm not. Go ahead, Council Member Kohler. I'll, I'll go okay. after you. Um, well, one of the things I want to remind people is uh, Chief Weber is also Ross Valley Fire Chief, so we get the best of both worlds here. But I would also, a couple of things, I have two questions. Well, I have one comment. So I'm part of H Friendly Fairfax, and I think one of the things that we tend to do is think everybody's on email and everybody has a smartphone. If my parents were alive, they wouldn't have either, or they wouldn't know how to use their phone. And I know folks in our town that don't do that. Um, I think we ought to think about ways to have printers in the cars. Uh, when I worked at the Air District in enforcement, our inspectors never came into the office and they were in their cars, Priuses, and they had portable printers. They're pretty cheap. So I think if we can leave I think the QR code thing is really slick and that'll work for a lot of folks. But I think if we can also leave a hard copy, that will help us. Um, and so that's just a suggestion on that. But I also, you know, I guess I'm on the board and I should know this, but I've been pushing for that grant program since last year. And I'm a little disappointed that we're only allocating a half a million over the entire county. And I think we also ought to consider people with access and functional needs who may not be seniors. And I believe most of the fire departments have lists of many of those folks. So I think we should consider that. But I think we should consider upping that. And I, I had assumed because I'd asked Mark Brown, are we gonna have this thing on the street July 1? And he assured me, yes, I had assumed it was going to be one program countywide so that we're not doing things differently. And I would also say to the extent, and maybe FireSafe Marin can help us here, is line up contractors so people don't have to find people. Yeah. You know, and also if they get folks who aren't that savvy in what they're taking out, we may have a bit of a mess and I inherently do. I mean, we all trust our folks, but I know I'm a biologist and I might take the wrong thing out. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can have FireSafe Marin who has a lot of contractors available for various things like chipper days, I'd like to see us 
really make that available so that people can just say, I'm just going to call these guys and have them out there. So just food for thought. And I know I have more access to you than others on some things, but thank you for your presentation. And we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And you reminded me when I spoke to Garrett earlier, we talked about one of the proposals with the local funds would be similar to that or the grant funds that there, you know, the town has contractors and, you know, the scope of work is that defensible space. And maybe that can just be done and in a single day. They could do two or three households. So there's efficiency there. So those are all things we can, we can take into consideration. And then I think most agencies are looking at some kind of grant program to on top of that, that 500,000. So we may be at a million collectively. Um, but I think your point is, is well taken and I'll bring that back to the operations group um, for discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Chance. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Chief, thank you so much. I know yesterday was International Firefighters Day, so thank you and your team for your service as well. Um, I had a couple questions. Uh, one was about um, these inspections. I didn't catch the timeline, like when should people be expecting people taking photos of their homes and of their vegetation and things like that is the first question. So uh, we will be starting, uh, I think that they're training, these are all, some of them are returning defensible space inspectors, some are new, their training is about two weeks. And I believe it starts on the 14th of this month, um, but I'm going off memory. So I would expect to see them hitting the ground the first week of June. And then remember, because it's a shared pool of, of resources, that they'll be working in different areas at different times. Uh, so specifically, I would expect that by your budget hearings, I will be able to tell you exactly when and where to expect. The, uh, and, and I don't want to use the word inspectors. We're calling them evaluators because we really do want this to be a, a positive experience for our residents. And, you know, it's we're in the education. And, and although we have the enforcement arm ability, um, you know, we, we, we do recognize most people want to do the right thing. Um, so to answer your question, I don't have a specific uh, a specific time, but I'll get it to you. Great, thank you. Yeah, that was, that was uh, close enough to know June they might be out, out and about. Um, the other question is related to um, compliance rate. I think you mentioned 40% compliance rate and we're hoping to be closer to 80%. I'm sure there's some people on this meeting looking outside their window right now. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if people wanna be proactive before they get on some, some naughty list for their uh, vegetation, What's the best way for them to reach out and to be proactive? And I'm writing this down because this is an important point. I want to make sure I, I work with Kathleen on. Because I think there's plenty of communication platforms to, to warn people in advance we're coming. Uh, so the, we've collectively used Fire Safe Marin's website as our landing place for our residents uh, to learn what they can do about defensible space. There's some fabulous webinars on there. Um, to Barbara's point about being a biologist and not being sure of what plants, I am nowhere near a biologist um, and, and, you know, would reference these wonderful folks from Master Gardeners and UC Extension that have spent a lot of time and energy uh, educating our, our, our public and our, you know, one of our key points here is our relationship with our environmental community, specifically uh, ecologically sound practices group. So Fire Safe Marin has done a great job putting webinars on. People can go and watch those. Uh, there's plant lists, preferred plant lists. Um, you know, even if something isn't a native like rosemary, um, but you want it because you cook with it, uh, it's placement and maintenance that make a big difference. And and those are those are kind of points you can find on there. So if you go to Fire Safe Marin and you go to Defensible Space, lots of great information there. And I would encourage our residents to watch the webinars. Uh, they're they're super informative. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And the, the final thing is related to Zone Haven, which sounds really exciting as a tool to, to figure out the, the actual criteria, because we do receive at every council meeting and in our inboxes plenty of uh, concerns about fire risk and evacuation and things like that. I was curious, that rating system for neighborhoods and communities, um, when do you think that that criteria and, and those sorts of things are going to be um, coming up. I know there's, you're building the plane as we're getting off the ground here, but just curious about that as well. So our goal, I think, is um, 
and I'm not sure Barbara may know better than I if the RFP has gone out or not yet, but the goal would be by the fall that we would at least certainly have uh, some preliminary report or, or the ability to, and I think, you know, before next fire season, we are using this for our work plan to develop the work plan for MWPA. Uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty powerful tool. I would also suggest if residents are looking specifically, there's parcel level data now in the community wildfire protection plan, which they can find on fire safe Marin's website also. Uh, it might be somewhat fearful. I, again, I don't want to scare people. I want them to be informed uh, and then use the resources and, and that information to make decisions around defensible space, et cetera. You know, um, Chief, I'm not sure. We, we do have the contract with Zone Haven and I think fall sounds right, but I feel like it actually could be sooner for the first iteration. And, um, but we haven't had a presentation on Zone Haven since we first entered into the contract with them. So I'm not sure where they are today. Yeah, and two things here, I don't wanna confuse the two. Zone Haven is a software product that we hope to have up and running by fire season. And I say that with the fact that we weren't anticipating a drought and the, the county to be drying out May 1st. But, you know, really I, we're, we're, we're working hard, police and fire uh, to get all that information, public works as well on, on traffic. So Zone Haven should roll out relatively soon. And then followed is this evacuation study that, that really will, be, will help us determine our work plans in the future. That's a separate item that we probably won't see until the fall. And I would expect that an RFP would be in front of the board at MWPA relatively soon for that. But that is an immense amount of work. Zone Haven will be a partner in that process because they've done a lot of the work already. Um, but our, our CWPP has an enormous amount of data they'll be able to mine from. And uh, Marin Transportation Authority is has uh, generously uh, stepped up to the plate and giving us their traffic information and, and access to their databases. So that'll be a much bigger thing and exciting when it comes out. Great, thank you again so much for, for all this. Look forward to hearing more in June. Council Member Goddard. Yes, I'll be brief. Um, but going back to the evaluators um, or the inspectors, um, in past years, uh, in fact, the first year, I ended up having an inspector here and people started talking and there were people that said, well, when's it my turn and how's this going, you know, how's this gonna work, how it play out? And so I'm wondering, is there a way for us to let people know whether they are actually going to be in one of the areas that will be inspected um, or do we need to wait and see? You know, I think to, and why I was writing as Council Member Catrano mentioned the communication piece, I, I think if we can get out ahead um, and, and as soon as we know the information of where we anticipate being on what dates, it's, it's pretty well calculated. We should be able to share that. I mean, there's, there's no secrets. Um, and if we miss by a few days, that's the nature of, you know, estimating timeframes it's going to take. So I will ask Kathleen as they build this, if we can have, you know, an interactive map or something that public can see when they can anticipate having an inspection. I, I uh, guess, go sorry ahead. to interrupt. I guess what I'm actually wanting to know specifically is not everyone's going to be inspected. So does that mean that there'll be a, uh, you know, a, a different area will be served this year or because, because this, this is what's come up in the past. Someone felt like, well, I was missed. Yeah, and that's what we've done in the past is, is rotated it around Fairfax. And I think we had a three-year rotation that started two years ago. So um, I, I assume they're taking that into account. I'll check with Kathleen. But we also may look at reprioritizing uh, based on risk and wildland urban interface versus the flats, because I think we're down to in Fairfax more of the flats. And we, you know, from a strategic standpoint, should probably, with a 40% compliance rate, be in a higher risk still. So we'll take that into effect and, and come back and share that information and, and try to help people understand why they may not be getting inspection, which is a good thing. Um, and, and others may be getting a second time. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Chief, just one thing, you know, as you know, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority has layers now on uh, Marin maps. Not everybody will want to view that, but that may be a place for um, 
when you do have this mapped out where this is going to be. And I just want to mention one thing. I have a friend who lives in the Oakland Hills and their inspectors are inspectors and they do cite people for not clearing defensible space. Of course, they did have the firestorm. And I have a friend who lives there and everybody gets excited and starts clearing early and then they get the inspections and then they do get a follow-up. So I think in the future, we're probably gonna to have to look at something more on that model just because we've been lucky. We haven't had the firestorm here like they had. But I, I know most of the folks in the Oakland Hills are really happy to see those folks come out and it gets themselves in gear and then also reminds them what they miss. Absolutely. Yes, excellent discussion. Thank you again, Chief Weber. Um, the uh, software developer in me has to, I have to bring up one quick point and you don't need to respond, but uh, I, I appreciated what Council Member Kohler mentioned about uh, the, I, I would concur, my mother-in-law does not have a smartphone or a computer. And if she had one, she wouldn't be able to scan a QR code. So one thing you could do if you haven't thought about this already, again, you don't need to respond, but uh, if someone doesn't access their report within a certain period of time, then mail it to them. It might be a, a way to do it. And also, of course, there's a great opportunity for your uh, being able to collect statistics on what you're doing without any additional effort through this software platform. You'll know how many people have been inspected, where they are in the process, and and so forth. So thank you again. Um, anything further that we should discuss or just we'll uh, wait for your input on our, on our budget process? No, just continue to thank you for your commitment to public safety and disaster preparedness. And you guys have all been fabulous and we'll see you in June. Thank you. So I'll see you in a few minutes. I'll be available for the Elliott yes. Preserve. Yeah. We have a public comment, main. Oh, yes, um, that's right. Public comment. Um, so if you could open that up, Michelle, on this item. Yes, I'd be happy to, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have two hands raised, Richard Applebaum and Frank Egger. So Richard, I am unmuting you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, there were three... I saw that in the budget for the total Marin looked like it was around 19 million. And I have no idea if that's a lot of money or a little bit of money, but there was three things that have been on my mind that I didn't, I don't see as really talked about as any kind of programs. And there's obviously lots of wonderful programs there and things that the budget are going to. And one is I've never really heard this discussed about like sort of staffing up for like what I would call like say lookouts, you know, people that one, one of my beliefs is um, that one of the ways we might be able to avoid a really tragic uh, scenario, at least in Fairfax and some of the other towns that are similar to us, is by really early spotting of something and getting on top of it very quickly. And I just wondered if there would ever been a thought about during high fire season, just like hiring up people. I don't know how they'd be positioned or how it would be managed or whether they would be in a one fixed place to move around. But so a concept of lookouts, extra eyes, just keeping eyes. So that's one thing. Second thing I've never really seen is any kind of a sort of tied together, maybe a jobs program for people that are unemployed, underemployed, youth, summer work or whatever that actually was like clear, clearing fuel load um, in, in really high dense um, places that have a lot of underbrush. And the third thing, and maybe Frank will mention this when he speaks because he mentioned this to me some years ago, but I've never seen anything about like having like emergency uh, helicopters or planes with the fire retardant like very close by at high fire season that are like sort of at the ready. Um, so again, if something happens early and I'm just wondering whether those things are beyond this type of a budget or outside the scope, because I can just say for me, sample size of one, I have a wooden house with a wooden deck and a wooden fence as do all my neighbors that are all like far less than a hundred feet from my dwelling and I'm backed against a hillside with hundreds of trees on it. And so, and I have 12 redwoods next to my house that constantly dropped off and I'm cleaning the roof and down by the, all around the house on a constant basis year round. And so I can only get so far with defensible space. And I don't really believe that even if I do a champion job of that, that I'm going to really ever save my house. So I'm just curious whether there's a way to allocate some of these resources into some other things that might actually tackle uh, nip 
nip early fires in the bud. So that's just, just some thoughts I had. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Frank Egger. And whoops. Frank, you're unmuted now. You might have to unmute yourself. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, you know, Fairfax, you're off to, to a good start uh, with Chief Weber. Uh, uh, Frank Eager Metal Way, I should say where I live. Um, Fairfax has emergency sirens. When they go off, no one knows what it means. And uh, Fairfax needs voiceover commands for their emergency sirens. Many cities are now, are now adding voiceover commands to those emergency sirens. It would be helpful for our community. And then second uh, issue, um, you know, quite often, emergency fire evacuation occurs in the middle of the night. Um, a community down south has similar severe threats from wildland fire and narrow roads with limited parking. During red flag days, they have signs that pop up and light up. And those signs say no parking, uh, those signs say emergency fire evacuation route, no parking on pavement. And it's meant to allow folks to evacuate out of these narrow roads and hillside areas and not be blocked by parked cars. Currently, Fairfax requires 12 feet of clearance and that must be enforced regularly. Wildland fire season is upon us. You know, Sonoma, Sonoma County broke two fires yesterday, one in Guerneville and one West Springs, uh, West, Mark West Springs area. Solano County has already had red flag days uh, and, and uh, 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 Richard brought up an, an issue about, about fire camps and uh, Marin County could use an inmate fire camp run by Cal Fire at San Quentin State Prison. Uh, it, it would give excellent access to, uh, to Marin, Sonoma and the East Bay uh, for, for, a, for a fire crew, for fire crews. And um, it would just, it's just a good opportunity. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. The next speaker is Linda Novi. You are unmuted now. Thank you. Hi, hi Chief Weber. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, in your opinion, how important is it for uh, Elliott Nature Preserve and other open space preserves to be uh, closed, not have people in them on red flag days? What's your, what's your feeling about that? Um, Linda, I'm not sure the, the procedures here. I'll leave it to the mayor whether he would like me to respond during public comment or not. On oh, right. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, um, we we generally try not to just because it, it gets into it's we can't respond to everybody. But um, if you have a if you have already something that's very quick, you could respond or refer to a resource. But yeah. I would, I would just say, give me a call, Linda. You have my number. We can talk about it. Okay, there it, we go. It's more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it is complicated. That doesn't sound short. Thank you, Linda. If there's anything else? Okay. Uh, I guess, Linda, you're done? Yes, I am. Thank you. No okay. call you, Chief. Thank you, Linda. Um, Mayor, can I just add something from the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority that Chief Weber may not be aware of is we are looking at creating a program where we work with underserved youth um, to help us. And um, that's in the works, but it'll take some time. And we did just uh, receive an award of two fellows from AmeriCorps that are Grizzly Corps that will help us with our vegetation management, which I'm sure Chief Weber is aware of. But we are looking at trying to create a cadre of folks in underserved communities that can help us with some of this veg management work. Okay, thank you. I see no more public speakers, Mr. Mayor. Oh, okay. actually, a hand just popped up. And that is Janet Fitzgerald. You're unmuted now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Janet, we can. Yeah, thanks, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This is really helpful, really great. Uh, Chief Weber, appreciate it. And also, I think it was Barbara who suggested we have a vendor list. I think that's a great idea 
Um, I'm wondering if, you know, maybe you could put that together and have maybe it go out on the, even on the Fairfax town newsletter or chamber of commerce town newsletter, whatever, just, uh, that, that sometimes is a, you know, is impediment knowing who understands exactly what you need on vents and mesh and all that. So that'd be great. And gardeners too, you know, finding gardeners that are tuned in. So thanks Barbara for that. And thank you so much, Chief Weber. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, present that hasn't, that's sort of come up and it's on the, the siren system. And I wanna kind of put in an advanced warning that we do thorough research on the, uh, that we not be too quick to jump into what's called LRAD, LRAD. And I read an article that they're using it in Southern Marin. And I was horrified because, so LRAD stands for long range acoustic device. And it's damaging to the hearing of animals and people. And I'm, I, I found this out through my professional association as a speech language pathologist, ASHA, American Speech and Hearing. So, I mean, I'm happy to get that info for you if you need it, or you can look it up, whichever you like. <clears throat> Don't be tempted to go that route. It, it comes from the military, LRAD, you can Google it, but it does, it is damaging to the hearing of humans and, and, you know, and wildlife. So whatever changes you made on, or, or, or whatever changes you would like to make, steer clear of LRAD. All right, so long range acoustic device. That, it's becoming more popular, of course, you know, it's a money maker, but stay away from it. All right. <laughs> That's my recommendation. And you can, you can find the research on it. All right. Or you can ask me and I'm happy to get it for you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Sue. Uh, the next speaker is Jane Richardson Mack. And you are unmuted, Jane. Thank you. A um, couple of things. Hi. Ms. Jason Weber, thank you so much for this. It's so helpful on many levels. Um, the tree committee is will be reaching out to you to discuss some things further. And on, along that line, we're getting a lot of requests for people saying they need to take trees down because it's been recommended by the fire department. And we're having a difficult time um, equating that with some things that have been said to us, meaning you don't have to take trees down necessarily. They can be limbed or this or that or what have you, that there, there should be some leeway. We're having, we're having a problem with that. So we're, we're trying to, to uh, figure out how to solve it. The other one is I, I like what Frank said about uh, some kind of a warning system that would let people know they need to get their cars off the road. I have real problems with the striping on Cascade. I've had so many near miss accidents and the parking is just kind of helter skelter all over the place. It's, a, it's in my opinion, it's a complete disaster. And in a fire or it's any kind of a disaster, I see it increasing a hundred thousand fold of parked cars on the sidewalk, on the street, all over everywhere. So if people had an advance warning, some way to get their cars out of the way, that would take care of the cars. But now we are discussing parklets. So there's no way to remove those in if there's an emergency. And that is a main route out of town. Bolinas is, is hugely important to all of us who will die and get fried in the Cascades if we can't get out of town. So I think that's about it. And I thank you for my time. Thank you, Jane. I see no further hands, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I'd like thank to close. You. We'll bring it back. And uh, uh, Michelle, was, uh, was Ben's hand up? Do we, oh, have, yes. do we have one more hand that just went up right? Yeah. Yes. I will make this very brief, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. This is just a heads up uh, to Chief Weber and uh, also a notification to the town that per the discussion that we were having um, at the introduction to the housing element, uh, Chief Weber, we will be uh, reaching out to you to discuss evacuation routes and the whole context of additional housing and fire safety. As we know, that's one of the first and foremost concerns um, in our safety element will be updated. So we'll be reaching out to you uh, shortly. Thank you. Very important, very big part of that. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll, finish with the public comment here. And uh, if there's anything else from council members, 
Okay, well, with thanks to Chief Weber very much and uh, for your ongoing work and your amazing leadership, you definitely hit the ground running taking over our uh, Ross Valley Fire Chief position and so appreciative of your, of your work and your clear presentation. We'll see you again soon. Okay, so we have now a presentation another presentation and this is from Marin County Parks on the planned improvements to the Elliott Preserve. And yes and I am just promoting the Marin County Parks Department here to panelists so they can join you. And Derek, did you want to do this up? You, you had your hand up? Yeah so I'd like to just make some introductory comments before we turn it over to Marin County Park. So just as a little background, you may recall on April 21st, the council actually requested this item be placed on the agenda. And the thought pattern was this would provide an opportunity for the neighborhood to provide comments directly to Bryn County Park staff related to the project in Elliott Preserve. And so I wanted to thank the county staff for making themselves available in short notice, to be able to accept some of those comments. But I also wanted to point out make clear that there's no action to be taken by the council on this item. Really, this is an opportunity for the community to provide feedback directly from the county, learn about the project. Um, again, just wanted to point that out, that there's no action to be considered by the council this evening. And with that, I turn over to the county staff. I'm actually not sure who's going to start, if it's going to be Max interviewed seeing his staff. And I have the PowerPoint, so just let me know when I need to share screen. Thank you, Garrett. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll start and then I'll introduce uh, John and Michelle. So uh, my name is Max Corton. I'm the director for Marin County Parks and general manager for the Marin County Open Space District. And, um, you know, tonight we're going to focus on presenting this um, proposed project in Cascade Canyon and, and giving a little background. But just wanted to start by appreciating um, your council and the town and Garrett and his partnership as we've been working on planning this project. And and really in a lot of the uh, management actions that we undertake um, to help be stewards of the preserve. And um, just to build off of uh, Chief Weber's presentation, you know, uh, fuels reduction, vegetation management, and fire management is one of our central uh, areas of focus. And um, you have a really amazing community and a firewise community uh, adjacent to our preserve there that we've been working closely with. And, just want to appreciate the um, the partnership of the community. If you know, if, if community members are doing their part to reduce vegetation, and then we can do our part to reduce vegetation at the um, boundary of those properties into the preserves, that really creates uh, the best sort of defensible space. And also working with, you know, uh, the science and what we know of the ecosystems to be, you know, removing invasives and and trying to make the the ecosystem better in the preserve. Um, and then also just wanted to mention, you know, I had been brought up of workforce development and clearing fuels. A huge partner for us is Conservation Corps North Bay that does a lot of the fuels work on our lands and helps to give um, underserved youth a chance at um, job training and education as well. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to pass it on to John Campo, who's our um, principal natural resource planner, and then also Michelle Julien, who's our planner that works on managing our CEQA process and planning, um, regulatory planning. So with that, I'll turn it over to John to give uh, uh, some background of the proposed project. All right, Th uh, thanks, Max. And thank you, council members, for the opportunity to present. Um, it's, uh, you know, why don't we just jump right into the presentation. Garrett, can you um, share the screen? I think you have it. Okay, thank you. So. Um, we're, all, we're all here for, I think, the same reason, our, to share our love for Cascade Canyon Preserve and an opportunity for me to talk about um, a trail bridge proposal project. And there's two bridges that we're going to discuss and a decommission of a social trail. Next slide. And so just to orient folks at where we're talking about, um, you see at the bottom of the screen, the red circle. Um, so that's the area uh, within the H Elliott Nature Preserve where there's two bridges proposed and a uh, change in use on a section of trail and a decommission of another trail. Next slide. 
just to run through the project history um, briefly, um, you know, this project actually, be, the ideas began before 2016, but uh, just starting from 2016, we received a project proposal from Marin County Bicycle Coalition, also with the Friends of Corte Madera Creek. And then over the next three years, we engaged in a pretty in-depth stakeholder process to discuss the planning. In 2016, we also went to the town of Fairfax um, to uh, have an open session meeting to discuss the MOU uh, with MCLSD regarding um, the construction of the bridges within the Elliott, Elliott Nature Preserve. And then finally, over the last uh, 2019 and 20, we worked on uh, drafting the CEQA document uh, through design refinement. And recently we had a public meeting and held a public comment period. Next slide. And so what's the purpose of this project? It's to implement the RTMP and the RTMP uh, Road and Trail Management Plan is a 200 page plus document that um, really guides our work through uh, 16,000 acres of open space in Marin County. We have 100 miles of roads, 70 miles of trails, and, and this is the framework for how we proceed. Um, and I can distill that down into three basic um, goals. Uh, reduce the environmental impacts, the roads and trails on sensitive natural resources, improve the visitor experience and safety for all users, and establish and maintain a sustainable system of roads and trails. And through that, um, we would follow all applicable policies in BMPs. Next slide. And so the specific project objectives of this project is to reduce the environmental impacts of the trail system on San Anselmo Creek, which includes the high water trail, uh, which is the top photo. Uh, remove recreation from the creek. Uh, so San Anselmo Creek has uh, the actual designated trail um, for bikes and horses is to pass through the creek four times until you get to the interior of the preserve. And then to provide sustainable and equitable access to Cascade Canyon. So right now, uh, if you visit Cascade Canyon in the winter time, you have a couple options to get into the interior. You can follow the high water trail, which is the top photo, which is a, you know, a dangerous, unsustainable, erosive trail, um, or you can follow the, the bottom slide uh, and go through the creek uh, four times to get into the interior of the preserve. So we wanna provide an alternative, which would be two trail bridges uh, that would remove recreation from the creek and provide safe and sustainable access. Next slide. Um, we did um, extensive background documentation and studies to inform the, the project. Um, geologic, hydrologic, structural, biological, and cultural assessments were done. Uh, the biological resource assessments really stand out. Um, there, this site is known for um, a variety of um, unique um, wildlife critters. Uh, we have spotted owls, dusky-footed wood rats. Uh, we recently discovered yellow-legged frogs. Um, um, this, so it's a, it's a very special place uh, biologically. And so we really recognize that and took a deep dive into the biology assessments. Next, next slide. Um, and we had a robust stakeholder engagement process, um, including site visits um, with neighbors. We had pu several public meetings in different formats from open space commission meetings to Fairfax town council meetings to community meetings. Uh, we invited the regulatory agencies to come out to two site visits to offer guidance on the project design. We gave regulatory agency office presentations and we took this project through um, a group called the Environmental Roundtable. So that's a, that's a group of all the leading environmental organizations in Marin, which includes Marin Audubon, um, Marin Conservation League, California Native Plant Society, Friends of Corte Madera Creek, and Sierra Club. And so we brought this project to this group every other month over the period of three years to get additional feedback and design refinement. Next slide. And so through all this process of these assessments and stakeholder engagement, we developed um, shared goals. And so I can distill that down to these bullet points, removing recreation from the creek, uh, reducing erosion and sediment to the watershed, which we know um, downstream there's steelhead. In the Cascade Canyon Preserve, we know there's rainbow trout. Um, we know there's foothill yellow frogs. So it's a very sensitive aquatic habitat. Um, 
we also wanted to provide year-round safe access uh, and sustainable visitor access for all trail users. Um, enhance the habitat protection for the sensitive wildlife species. Again, currently um, we're asking park visitors to go through the creek on several occasions um, where we know foothill yellowhead frogs are breeding in the vicinity. Um, and also decommission the high water trail, which is uh, very uh, unstable, safe, or unsafe and erosive. Next slide. Um, so just to illustrate some of the project components, um, at the bottom right of the screen is uh, the end of the pavement at Cascade Drive, and that's where you would enter into the preserve. And you follow that black dashed line. And so from there, we would propose that you would get on bridge number one, the green bridge, um, instead of going through the Ford one. And then you get on the yellow Canyon Trail. And so that yellow highlighted segment illustrates a change in use that's currently designated as a hiker equestrian trail. So we would propose that that segment be redesignated as hiker equestrian and bicycle trail. And then from there going north into the preserve, you get back on the fire road, avoiding the three fords, and then get on bridge two. And so that's the final bridge crossing uh, would take you into the interior of the preserve. So installing those two bridges and that change in use on Canyon Trail allows us to decommission the red segments, which is the high water trail. And then there's a little spur trail um, that's unnamed. Next slide. Just to give you some photo representation, if you're not familiar with it, th this is the high water trail as it currently exists. Um, so again, it, it kind of hugs the edge of the creek. Uh, you can see the sediment, the fine sediment's actually depositing into the creek. Uh, it's not sustainable and it's also not designated for bikes or horses. Uh, next slide. And so this is the site of bridge one. You go to the next slide. And so this is the photo simulation of what of bridge one would look like. It's a 90 foot long, six foot wide um, Corten steel um, bridge. Um, and so this would again, allow visitors to get across the creek without going through the creek. We wanna remove recreation from the creek. Next slide. And then from that bridge, you get onto the Canyon Trail. And so, um, this would be the segment that we would propose a change in use to include bicycles. Next slide. And as per the MOU agreement uh, with the city of Fairfax, we would install speed control features such as these chicanes. They could be done with logs or boulders or whatnot, but the idea would be to slow traffic down on that trail. Next slide. And then following the Canyon Trail, you get back onto Cascade Fire Road to bridge site two. Next slide. And so this is the photo simulation of bridge two, which is a 60 foot long bridge, six feet wide. Um, again, once you cross this bridge, there's no other crossings um, that you would need to make and you would be able to go into the interior of the preserve, you know, relatively easy at that point. Next slide. Um, this is the entrance and I wanted to give a graphic representation of kind of how we would Think about it. So you can see uh, bridge one over there off to the side, and then there's a ramp. And so that ramp would guide visitors from the entrance onto bridge one. And additionally, there would be an installation of a split rail fence, which would further guide visitors over bridge one. Um, and you notice the, the railing across the fire road is, looks a little different. So that would be a removable segment. Um, so we certainly don't want to impede emergency services vehicle. So if in, in the event of a catastrophic fire or, or medical issue, um, uh, emergency services would be able to remove that rail fairly easily and then get further into the preserve. Um, but we do wanna kind of, um, part of this process, which we heard from the community in fact, was to think about this degraded grassland, which you know, frankly had been used as a parking lot for a long time and just kind of began to get compacted and a lot of invasive species. So as part of this process, we would look to restore this. And we would do that through the guidance again from the regulatory agencies, as well as the environmental community, which we regularly work with. Next slide. Um, also part of the MOU agreement would be the installation of a bicycle rack. 
Um, you know, this is not uh, exactly what it would look like or even the location, but just to give you an idea. Next slide. And for the implementation, uh, we got a recent cost estimate that it would be about $480,000. We don't have an established timeline for the implementation if this project were approved. Um, the construction access um, would for this project would, would use not only the public streets to access um, the preserve, but even in the preserve. So the construction footprint is actually very light because the Cascade Fire Road would allow the equipment and the bridge into put to be placed into location without further uh, impacts. Um, we would communicate with the neighborhood regarding the construction ac access to just uh, alert neighbors if big equipment was coming down the street um, that there might be delays or, or whatnot. Um, and then finally, this project would be fully compliant with our inclusive access plan. And so that was a, do a document that was adopted by our board in 2015 that compels us to really look at accessibility of our trails, all of our trails, and um, can, can they meet the requirements to provide greater mobility to people, say in a wheelchair or that need a walker or even a stroller. And so this project meets that level of compliance with really no additional modifications. It's fairly flat, the bridges are wide enough. So it, it met that quite easily. Next slide. And um, you know the timing of this meeting is fortuitous. Uh, MMWD just completed the uh, installation of Bullfrog Creek Bridge at Bon Tempe Lake. And so this is actually nearly identical to kind of what we're thinking. Uh, this is an 80 foot long bridge, six feet wide, same material, Corten steel. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, there you go. And so again, just to give you another angle of what that would look like with the ramp and the approach. Next slide. Um, and so how does this affect the visitor use? Um, well, you know, Cascade Canyon is, is really one of our crown jewels in our 16,000 acres in Marin. It's, it's loved by many, uh, certainly the neighborhood and the community. Um, and then adding on to that, we've all seen the COVID effect. Um, this is not a, a local phenomenon. This is national, likely global, that everybody went outside. I know my daughter's uh, soccer games and volleyball games were all canceled. So most weekends we went hiking and so did the rest of the world apparently. So um, Cascade Canyon has been very crowded lately due to the COVID effect, as all of our preserves have been. Um, this plan does not create a new trailhead. Uh, it doesn't add a new user group. Um, bikes, horses, and hikers are all already designated to this preserve. So there's no additional recreational group added. Um, this plan does not add new parking, which in the literature is um, cited as really the single most driver to increasing visitation. So this plan does not add new parking. Uh, really what this plan does is it provides safe and sustainable passage over a creek in an environmentally friendly way. Next slide. And so how does it change circulation? Uh, the, the ingress or egress, you know, wherever you're starting or wherever you're going to, this plan doesn't change that. Um, if you came in at Cascade Drive, you would still come in at Cascade Drive. If you came in somewhere else, you would still come in there. All it does is it takes folks out of the creek and puts them on two bridges in the Canyon Trail. So it's a minor deviation from the existing trail circulation. Next slide. And so we have 70 miles of trails in, on just our land. That's not including National Park and others. And we have about 60 trail bridges. Um, it's widely regarded as the most environmentally friendly way to cross a creek. Another way to do it would be a culvert um, or a, a rock ford crossing. Neither of those options would be suitable here, nor would the regulatory agencies want us to do that because that typically involves greater impacts to the creek and especially one as sensitive as this. So uh, trail bridges are a very common solution to this type of challenge. Next slide. Um, so this was a very brief presentation. And if you do want more information, I gave a March 4th presentation to the public. That presentation was 45 minutes with about a 45 minute Q&A. And so that's posted on our website. You can follow this link 
if you want to see uh, greater detail. Uh, in addition, there's also our projects and plans um, on that website as well, and kind of highlights a lot of the, the things I talked about in more detail. And I think with the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to talk about the CEQA process. Hi, I'm Michelle Julene. I'm the Regulatory Open Space Planner. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the CEQA process for this project. Uh, we prepared uh, an initial study uh, leading to a proposed mitigated negative declaration, which means that we did not identify any uh, potentially significant environmental effects that could not be mitigated to a less than significant level. Um, if we had identified uh, potentially significant environmental impacts that we did not feel we could mitigate to a less than significant level, then we would have prepared an environmental impact report just to uh, distinguish those two types of documents. So the public review period on the document was February 16th through March 19th of this year. Uh, we received approximately 100, uh, well, approximately 192 individuals commented. Um, some individuals commented more than one time. So uh, this just captures the number of individuals. And of those, approximately 141 supported the proposed project. Um, the remaining comments you know, uh, brought up a number of concerns that we are taking very seriously. Um, and this list just highlights the primary concerns, which include the need for the proposed project, uh, potential impacts to traffic, which includes parking, emergency access, and evacuation access, uh, potential uh, increase in wildfire risk, increased cyclist use, and impacts to biological resources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so currently we are evaluating the comments. Um, like I said, we are taking them very seriously. Um, even though, uh, you know, it looks like a relatively small percentage of the individuals who commented uh, did not support the project or provided comments that we need to respond to. Um, those comment letters uh, included a lot of really good information and, you know, raised issues that we are now evaluating and uh, doing some additional research. So after that is done, um, then we would actually prepare and publish the responses to comments. Uh, that document will be made available to the public on our website. Um, everybody who uh, provided a comment will be sent notification when that's available. And um, even though it is not a, a CEQA requirement, it is a Marin County uh, policy to provide a 10-day review period on the responses to comments once they are published. Um, both the document and the project will go to, um, to the board of directors for uh, approval. And after, after that happens, assuming the project is approved and the CEQA document is accepted, then we would apply for regulatory permits. So there is still quite a bit of process before we can get to the point where we would know uh, when would the project be implemented. Um, at this point it is not yet approved. Um, the CEQA process is not yet completed. Um, and after those two things are done, then you know, we still have to uh, pursue our regulatory permits. And next slide. And, and that's it. So now we are ready to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you all. So um, we'll be taking public comment on this. And uh, before that, if council can uh, make any comments or questions that especially might help to inform the public comment and uh, get any questions answered for that. So Barbara. Yeah, I think this question is for Michelle. First of all, I want to thank you all for the presentation. Um, Michelle, I know you said you'll be working on prepare or you all will be working on preparing responses to comments. Do you have a rough timeline for when that document would be published? Just rough 
I'm not going to hold you to it, but I think it would help a lot of folks who are interested in this project to have a feel for, are they looking at two months, three months? I know with a lot of comments, it takes a long time. Yeah, it, it does take a while because, you know, we don't want to neglect any of the comments that we received. Um, so I'm going to say roughly three to six months, um, just so long as you don't hold me to it. Okay, so three to six months from now. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Um, any other step? Any other council members? Uh, and and I hope you're not using your virtual hands because I'm you want us to ask questions now. All of our um, yeah, if you have more questions that would be relevant and uh, to the public being able to make the uh, their their statements. You know, any questions, clarifications? Um, I think I'll wait till the public speaks and then I'll speak after. But hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. <laughs> OK, yeah. OK, so it sounds like we are ready to go into the public comment. Um, I do have some comments, but I'll wait also until the end. So Michelle. Yes, um, it looks like we have a number of hands raised. Mm -hmm. The first three speakers are Aaron Spindel, Linda Novi, and Linda B. So Aaron, you are unmuted, I think. Whoops, I'm very sorry, I remuted you. You're Hi guys. Uh, my name is Aaron Spindel, I live in West Fairfax. Uh, near Glen Drive area. Um, I'm with uh, Access for Bikes. Uh, I fully support this project happening. Um, I think riding through the creek when it's uh, completely wet is environmentally destructive. It could cause problems, really not a lot of fun, especially on a cold winter day. Uh, it's nice to get out of the creek. Um, I think you're going to be seeing most cycling traffic going from north to south uh, in this area. I don't think you're going to be getting a lot of people coming up Cascade Canyon and then trying to ride up uh, either Cascade Canyon Fire Road or, or elsewhere. It's just really hard and steep climb to get up. Um, so I, I don't think the concern with increased cycling use is uh, really founded. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say, just here to support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. The next speaker is Linda Novi. You are unmuted now. Thank you very much. I live on Cascade Drive, 40 year resident of Fairfax. Um, great to uh, see Marin County Parks here uh, tonight. Um, my comments are addressing are addressed to the town council, even though uh, Garrett is trying to dissuade us from that. Um, the town of Fairfax needs to exert and exercise regular oversight of the use and management of Elliott Nature Preserve by Marin County Parks. The 38 and a half acres remain in town limits. And the town needs to address the project now that an environmental study has been done. So this is a new request to the town council and I guess we'll have to petition to have it come before you as an agenda item. The intention of Mr. Elliott was that Elliott Nature Preserve be a nature preserve intended for passive study, pardon me, passive visit visitation, nature study, and not being an open space like regional park. And as you say in your opening, we want to honor the land and express gratitude. Contrary to that vision, the bridges we believe will, I believe, will increase visitation and change that. And in fact, new uses are being created through this project. Adding large bridges, six foot wide, invites 365 day a year. And a new use is making this IAP compliant, advertising it on the county's website under their IAP trails. And more visitation increases resource impacts and the risk of ignition as our colleague Ray Maritz has advised us. Both of these new changes will make the ENP more regional and park-like. 
We request that the town bring this project back to the, to the town to review. Uh, immediately request that MCP start managing the preserve to create a, a culture of compliance and safety. There's a large cohort of mountain bikes who, as Aaron said, ride downhill and they ride downhill fast, illegally and aggressively, not slowing, not slowing for slower moving visitors. We ask that the town hold a working group meeting with Fairfax citizens who had concerns in 2016 and still have those concerns now. And please provide additional, once we've done this guidance to MCP that takes into the account the concerns of Fairfax citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. The next speaker is Linda B, followed by Mina Kim, followed by Janet Fitzgerald. Linda B, you're unmuted. You may have to unmute yourself. Great, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great, thank you so much. Um, first, I'd like to thank Chance, Stephanie and Bruce for coming out and walking the preserve and taking the time to hear our issues. And I hope that you all received the letter that we put with our issues in much more detail because I don't wanna take up your time tonight with that. Um, I know a lot of them are about neighborhood problems like parking and traffic, speeding and the destruction of private property. But I'd like to bring to attention the diminishment of a beautiful, unique, organic jewel of a nature preserve in our town of Fairfax, which just happens to be nestled in a very small, quiet, dead-end neighborhood. The Elliott Nature Preserve is and was always intended to be a nature preserve, honoring the original agreement as stated in the deed with no construction and only passive recreation. The gross over design and costs of this project are inappropriate for the space, for the location, and the inhabitants and compromises the future and organic integrity of the preserve. These are extreme efforts to save one species at the risk of endangering many. The project will be pushing nature back with a large footprint of the bridges and widening of trails for extended non-passive recreational use. These are the steps that lead to a wake of destruction and desecration of spaces of refuge for legacy flora and fauna, as well as our ancestral history to create yet another playground. I would like to ask three things of the town council tonight. That the topic of the bridges in the Elliott Nature Preserve be added to the town agenda. That there is a continuance of this topic once MCP has publicly answered the plethora of questions and concerns addressed and submitted regarding the CEQA documents and join the neighbors, concerned citizens, and multiple respected environmental groups who have also expressed valid concerns and take a stand to ensure the integrity of this 38 acre nature preserve and the adjacent neighborhoods all located within the town of Fairfax by creating conditions to protect and preserve them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your consideration and all your community work. Thank you, Linda. The next speaker is Mina Kim, followed by Janet Fitzgerald, followed by Brenna Gubbins. And Mina, you're unmuted. Hi, everyone. Um, I know several of you. It's nice to see you again. Um, I'm Mina, a longtime Fairfax oh. resident, mother of two. Thank you to the town council for putting this on the agenda. I know that you didn't have to, and we really do truly appreciate your consideration for our concerns. Um, I only just found out about the project this March, even though I've lived in Cascade Canyon for 12 years. On the surface, the bridges sound like an improvement, but I disagree. There are four creek crossings in a small area, and there's only, uh, they're only addressing two of them and not considering other sources of erosion and sedimentation. The improvements in the Elliott Nature Preserve should be aimed at protecting nature, not increasing recreation. The original proposal was seriously lacking in assessing their environmental impact to the rich biodiversity. Um, the Marin County Parks uh, presentation in March said there were no steelhead in our dry creek. Many have said adding bridges will not increase visitation, but that cannot be true. 
It will provide 365 days a year access to and through the canyon. Even if we maintain the same visitors, how can the Marin County Park suggest that they won't use the bridges in the rainy season? Seems counterintuitive. The preserve's location makes a highly porous to mountain bike riders coming in from around the surrounding areas. Bikes are great for alternative transportation, but let's not confuse mountain biking and bicycle transportation. Many of the visitors experience mountain bikers as threatening when they are traveling at high speeds and are disrespectful to the land and other users. This is some, not all, but it is a daily occurrence. Um, the Marin County Parks are unable to regulate or stop illegal trail riding and rerouting bike traffic onto the Canyon Trail is going to exacerbate the situation. It is even more narrow than the fire road and I recognize that there has not always been respectful dialogue between some of the residents and some of the mountain bikers. I think some repair would help the situation greatly and I think Mayor Ackerman's idea of a letter is a good first step. We need to work together to preserve our, our wild spaces because they're diminishing all over the world. The steelhead are already gone. What's next? The Marin County Parks has a long history of disregarding our concerns. They say over and over that we've met, but they don't mention any of the concerns. Um, that environmental roundtable, uh, the Marine Conservation League, the Marine Audubon Society, the California Native Plant Society, they all sent in comments of concern. Um, Fairfax Town Council, I appeal to you to get involved because the conditions have changed as mentioned in the previous presentation by Fire Chief Weber. Please support and advocate for us with the Marin County Parks to create conditions to protect the Elliott Nature Preserve and its surrounding areas. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Janet Fitzgerald followed by Zachary Warnow. And Janet, you are unmuted. Can you hear me? We can now, yes. All right, great, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks so much for allowing all of us to speak tonight. So I'm a resident on Canyon Road and I'm also a mountain biker. And I love the trails in Deer Park. As a matter of fact, I have an electric mountain bike. I love it. Uh, it's been a great boon to my health. Um, However, the preserve that we have at the end of our road, and, and, and the presenters did speak of our area as a well-loved area. And I think one of the reasons it's well-loved is because the people who live here really respect not just the preserve, but the roads. And there's an understanding of people who have lived here that these roads are, they're uh, narrow, they're windy, they're, they're, you know, kids are out playing. And so we wanna, we, when you bring in a lot of new people, there is a concern that they may not understand uh, that these roads have some, well, there's charm to them, of course, but that's the negative side is that they're narrow. So one of my concerns, having listened to the March presentation compared to today's, especially after receiving uh, 192 comments, is I expected by now that there would be answers to the concerns that the residents in this area have had. And I didn't hear that in the presentation tonight. <clears throat> so as you know, some of the concerns are wildfire. What, so has there, and, and traffic and parking. Have there been studies done by the Marin County Parks to address these issues? How many people do they expect will come in? Do they understand the fragility of the preserve and if not, how would they address that problem? How will they educate them? Uh, we didn't really hear anything about signage and education, about how fragile it is, about the wildlife, the wildfire issues, the parking issues, the traffic issues, no education at all. And we know there's a media issue, a, me a media problem that, well, I didn't know that the county was advertising it, but um, I did see an article in the 2017 MIJ article basically saying, Come one, come all, park at the end of Cascade. So that's a few years ago. So now what would we get in the media? So um, these are real concerns. I think they are valid. And, and as a mountain biker, I'm all in favor of more trails, but I feel pretty happy that we've got Deer Park, not that far away. It's a nice regional park and wide, you know, big uh, parking lot and wide trails and an abundance. So I don't feel we're really depriving people um, and uh, cyclists 
uh, or hikers because they have another nearby park. And this one was called a preserve because it is a preserve. So let's keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. The next speaker is Zachary Warno, followed by Frank Egger, followed by Charles Merrill. Um, sorry, Merrill. And Zachary, you are unmuted now. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank all the natural resource managers who have worked on this proposal, open space and park managers, as well as the members of the council for hearing this. Um, I'm a Fairfax resident, and I'm here to express my full support for the Cascade Canyon Bridges project. And I'm doing so on three different bases. So I'll start with one. I'm a father. I'm a father of a beautiful four-year-old girl. And we use the preserve all the time. Um, crossing the creek in the winter is just not viable. Um, and if you ever tried hiking with a toddler, the, the high water trail is really just not an option either. Um, so as a father, this is a safer way to access the interior of the park. Um, number two, uh, I am a recreationist, I'm a hiker, I'm a cyclist, and uh, I truly believe that more access is something that we should be looking for. Those of us who live in Fairfax are privileged enough to have some pretty incredible access to open space. We need to be finding ways to keep that open space accessible. Um, I have an 80 year old father who comes to visit me. He loves waterfalls. Right now, I can't take him to go see the Cascade Falls because he can't do the high water trail and he can't make it through the creek. So this is a real access issue. Um, third, uh, I'm a member of a conservation nonprofit. We do a lot of ecological study. And I will just say that if you start to dig into this project and see the level of analysis that has gone into this, and you see the kind of work that has been done, you will see that these resource managers are really doing their homework and have taken into account all of the ecological issues that are present. My three points I'd like to make are access, science, um, and, and responsibility. And I believe that this is a project that has really taken every step possible um, to make a careful, deliberate, transparent, uh, and science-based proposal. And I really appreciate all the steps that have been taken. So as I hope you can see, I care deeply about making sure our open space stays open to as many people as possible for safe recreation that simultaneously offers benefits to both human and wildlife communities. For me, this project is a no-brainer on all fronts. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. The next speaker is Frank Egger, followed by Charles Merrill, followed by Pamela Nix. Frank, you're unmuted now. Thank you. Frank Egger, Meadow Way, representing Save Fairfax. The agenda tonight lists the item as the Elliott Preserve. Marin County identifies it as the Cascade Canyon Open Space Preserve. It's actually the Elliott Nature Preserve. The Fairfax Town Council has not been given any historical information on how it came about. Our mayor and town council should have been given copies of Fairfax Town Council minutes from 1972, 1974, and 1987 meetings. I was deeply involved in the purchase and all of the meetings. We purchased 38 and a half acres of the Elliott Ranch for a nature preserve. The Elliott family was moved to sell that portion of the ranch to Fairfax when we offered to name it the Elliott Nature, Pres nature Preserve after former Fairfax Mayor Floyd Elliott in perpetuity. Fire safety and emergency evacuations are huge issues. A number of years ago, there were wildland fires set in and around the Fairfax area. One was in the Elliott Nature Preserve. The Ross Valley Fire Department, along with Marin County Fire, got in it quickly and kept it to 10 acres or so. You were given incorrect information by the county this evening. No part of the Elliott Nature Preserve has ever been used as a parking lot. I've been in this canyon since we bought our home in 1962 and I've been out there ever since. Uh, Fairfax has always said no parking lot in the Nature Preserve. That's, that's, everyone knows that. During red flag days, the Elliott Nature Preserve must be closed to all use. Like the lakes above Fairfax, where marine water locks it down at night, the Elliott Nature Preserve 
needs to be closed at nighttime also. 1,800 people live in the Cascades, and we need to be able to evacuate during a wildland fire. The county mentioned the Marin County Bicycle Co Coalition as a sponsor. Any council member who is a member of the Marin Bicycle Coalition should check with the town attorney to determine if there has been a conflict of interest by past or current town council votes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you. The next speaker is Charles Merrill, followed by Pamela Miggs, followed by Jess Lerner. Charles, you're unmuted now. Hi, uh, I'm Charles Merrill, Willow Avenue, Fairfax homeowner, resident, frequent, pretty much daily trail user. I want to thank the council for hosting the presentation, as well as the presenters. I thought it was awesome. Uh, two asides. I've seen the Bullfrog Bridge many times. It's really good looking and it's only about 10 feet shorter than Bridge One, so I'm a big fan. Number two, previous comment or previous commenter. Gotta say, e-bikes are illegal in the watershed, including Deer Park and Elliott Preserve. They shouldn't be. Number uh, then, so my comments are, I think that the plan is unlikely to increase visitor counts, especially non-local visitors and or cyclists. Repack's just not a fun downhill. Way better way is to get off Pine Mountain Fire Road. I think it'll increase trail user safety and first responder access. And number three, I think it'll have long-term positive environmental and watershed impacts that can't be overlooked, including protection of native species. I support the plan as proposed and presented. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Pamela Miggs, followed by Jess Lerner, followed by Deborah Benson. Pamela, you're unmuted now. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm kind of in shock about this. I've been here since 87 and hiked those trails a lot. Um, the high trail is a sad loss if this goes through. I love, people love that trail. If you're into the environment and like to hike and a little adventure. And my mother, around 80 did hike that trail with me on the high trail. So it doesn't matter, you know, it depends on how well, how fit you are. But anyway, um, I'm very concerned about the influx of people, especially e-bikes and bicyclers. Um, I'm sort of catching up on this because during that time, um, my mother was in and out of hospice, so I was not involved. But what I wanna say is that I understand the habitat protection, but I do not think it's a good idea because you're going to increase so many more people. And if you really think bicyclers are not gonna go through the creek, they love the creek. Are you kidding me? That's what they love about it is the, the adventure. So recently I did about three miles of off trails off the Cascade Canyon fire road. It is ripped up by bicycle trails the roots of the trees are coming off the trails because they've got it so eroded up there. I have pictures. I mean, I think we need to come back and look at this again and see really what does the community want, especially in the bottom of the canyon. And I have the same con concerns about fire <laughs> and, and, and the neighbors. You know, it's a really great place for kids to hang in the street and play ball. You can have all these people in and out. I wouldn't let my kids out in the street. So I'm also on the executive committee for the Sierra Club. I will put this on our agenda to discuss in our next meeting. Thank you. The next speaker is Jess Lerner, followed by Deborah Benson, followed by Renee Voss. Jess, I've unmuted you. And um, Jess did warn me that it takes her a while to unmute herself. We still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Sorry, it takes a little while, sorry. Okay, hi, Town Council, Jess Lerner, Canyon Road. Um, thanks for having this on the agenda tonight. And I'm adding my voice to ask you for a continuance on this project rather than a postponement until we continue to get more information to make a better decision that honors the concerns brought up with all of us, including conservation groups, which also include 
the Marin Audubon Society, the Marin Conservation League, California Native Plant Association, Marin Horse Council, and Foot People. Many of us are not on board with this plan yet and feel all current stakeholders should be included, many of, and many of us weren't there for the previous process they described before 2019. So I have spoken before you on other issues before, so you may not know, but my background in my grad school work was on sense of place, identity, land use, and conservation. And I've worked with a lot of organizations who have to deal with the question of recreation versus conservation, which is tricky. And I've also worked with endangered bird species with conservation biologists and have a sense of what needs to happen to make sure habitat is protected enough for breeding to continue to have success. So the Elliott Preserve is for the land and for wildlife, for conservation rather than recreation. And that priority really should remain at the top rather than changing it to recreational space focused on bike use. I do agree with the need for accessibility for those with mobility issues and for protecting the creek so fish might return someday if possible. Sadly, the creek has been mostly dry for the past few winters, that should be considered. And I understand why there might be need to close the high water trail. But what happens when these bridges are major construction that impact the land and wildlife directly? Do we really need these bridges impacting this fragile habitat on such a large scale? They're presented as small or no big deal on a human industrial scale, but to, the, but to the wildlife who are smaller than us and for whom this is their home, it's huge. I have offered to actually shadow and volunteer with the biologists who are tracking the spotted owls so I can learn more. So thank you to Max Corton for connecting me with those folks, including about the wood rats, yellow-legged frogs, and all the other wildlife. I'm also seriously concerned, like other residents, about the fires, as was just discussed earlier, and would like to see more of the funding going towards evacuation or protection of the abutting residents who are in a tricky location before bridges are prioritized. So about the bikes, this project is supported by the Bike Coalition and mainly promoted by that group. It sounds like a great plan on the surface, but it doesn't mention the risks and problems that are part of the process of opening more trails to bikes and encouraging more bike riding. The key question was, is what happens when the bikers are permitted on the Canyon Trail when everyone else is directed to walk in the same place? The chicanes are not enough. Where will the kids and those with mobility issues go or those with slow walk or slow walkers when bikes are speeding by? I did speak with Max several times, very thoughtful and does care about the feedback from the public. And I thank him for connecting me to the bird biologists. But in hearing the MCP plans, there seems to be little thought or plan about how bikes would impact the preserve and how to work with that. It seems designed to encourage bikers without thought to the challenges of how that impacts the preserve or human or wildlife visitors and residents. And while I appreciate mountain bikers, um, and there's a way to do this without totally compromising the preserve, this plan just isn't there yet. There are many who don't follow the rules of conservation or respect them, and that's who I'm concerned about, not the respectful mountain bikers, because signage and speed limits don't work. As yes, so many have wrap up, okay. Sure, sorry. I have a lot to say about this, and I'll write to you to share more, and thank you for reading the letter that we all signed. Yeah. And again, just wanted to share my concerns, and thank you for putting this in the agenda. Thank you. The next speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by Renee Voss, followed by Lisa Blush. And Deborah, you're unmuted. Thank you, Michelle. Deborah Benson, Cascade Drive, Fairfax. Um, one of the covenants in the original deed uh, says that the preserve must continue to be referred to as the Elliott Nature Preserve. And maybe there was a reason behind that because that brings up the, you know, the idea that uh, Mr. Elliott wanted this to be a preserve. Uh, Marin County Parks is referring to it as Cascade Canyon open space. So they're denying the covenant. They're re uh, referring to it as Cascade Canyon Preserve. Um, I'm wondering why Marin County Bicycle Coalition is so interested in having these bridges built if um, these bridges are not going to increase bicycle traffic. You know, I've, I've had a mic, uh, mountain bike since 1981, and in years past, I've ridden my bike from my house up to the preserve, and it, with someone who was, who was a better mountain biker than I, practiced going through the creek when it was running. I only tried it once, <laughs> because I, I decided I needed a different challenge. I wasn't really willing to go through all those rocks. So... The, the use of the preserve in the winter to bicyclists is limited by the lack of bridges. And, and anyone who says that the, the use is not going to be increased is, um, I think, uh, uh, not looking at the facts. Um, enforcement. 
I see packs of 10 night riders coming down through one of the biggest spotted owl nesting, you know, territories on the West Coast, um, shouting at each other with these huge high beam headlights on. There's no enforcement. I see uh, packs of mountain bikers crashing down the hillside. There's not even a trail there. They're just coming from the fire road up above, up above Cascade Drive and crashing down the hillside. No enforcement. Um, so I, I think that uh, before we do invite any more recreational use, we have to recognize the, the value of the preserve as a preserve and enforce the recreational use that exists now. There is no enforcement. Um, and uh, not open it in, in its most uh, delicate season, the winter, to more channelization from bicycle tires. And I, I think I covered a whole lot and I hope I made some sense, but I think that this needs to be put on hold and the, the residents of the Cascades and the animals in the preserve need to be protected by our council because the parks are, are really not doing it. So thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Deborah. The next speaker is Renee Voss, followed by Liesl Blausch, followed by Dave J. Renee, you're unmuted. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Renee Voss. I'm actually from San Anselmo. I was invited by Linda Novi to speak and tell you about my experiences with um, the Cary Camp Trail and uh, why I think it was a mistake for the um, the 2016 proposal to uh, eliminate the, the closure of the Happersburger Trail. Um, I'm a natural resources attorney and I'm very interested in uh, protecting, especially endangered species. Um, and um, the Cary Creek, Cary Creek has um, some trout in it, probably uh, could be steelhead. There's Pacific um, uh, giant salamander as well as um, uh, likely some yellow, uh, uh, foothill yellow like frogs in that creek as well. And um, the, uh, uh, you know, first of all, changing this, um, the canyon trail to multi-use trail is a, I think a big mistake as well. Uh, I've encountered lots of um, mountain bikers. I spend a lot of time, Cary Creek Trail is one of my favorite trails because of the bot botanical riches that are in there. There's some really impressive areas, and um, uh, the um, you know the, the habitat is uh, very pristine. Um, however, the um, the illegal mountain bikers, which actually originate from um, uh, Marin Municipal Water District from the Pine Mountain Road, are causing some serious erosion issues. Um, not too far from where you know your new trail is proposed, and um, I think. Um, I remember seeing a video uh, that Linda shared with me when you guys went out there. You encountered the town council, actually Fairfax Town Council, encountered some one of the mountain bikers coming down the Cary Camp Trail. Um, that same thing happened to myself and my wife, um, and she was almost hit by a mountain biker right at the exact same location where that video was taken. Uh, I actually had to pull her out of the trail to keep her from getting run over. And I've encountered so many bikes on these trails. Um, I'm starting to uh, feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting some sort of post-traumatic stress uh, and fear of being hit by a bicycle. This is going to come up on me. So there's, a, there's public safety issues involved with these bicycles on these narrow trails. There's the Rosen resource issues involved. And I've actually, you know, since this starts at uh, Marin Municipal Water District, I've contacted Sean Horn and they refuse to close the trail access from Pine Mountain Road. They even volunteered to put a crew together to, to close it off. They won't even put up a sign up there. So you guys need to try to deal with that, both the town and Marin Car Parks folks. Thank you. The next speaker is Lisa Blush, followed by Dave J, followed by Mallory Guyhan. And Lisa, you're unmuted. Hi, 
Yeah, uh, my name is Liesl Blush. I live in downtown Fairfax. I'm also on the Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee. I've been in support of this project for a long time. I'm, I'm really interested in a lot of the comments though that people are making tonight, which are very thoughtful. I have thought it would be really beneficial to the creek and the watershed. Um, in terms of access, I just wanted to thank the Marin County Open Space and Parks for adding a translate button to their website and adding updated public transit info so people who do not have cars can get to our open space preserves. As people know, I'm an advocate for alternative transportation and habitat restoration and preservation. I really hate how much Maronites drive, but I'm also an advocate for social and racial justice. I ride my bike out there to walk the trail and would appreciate a bike rack. I don't really like to ride the trail. I don't think it's safe, but it's a really scary road to walk or draw, ride on um, on the way out there on your bike. I wanted to know that um, note that this, there's kind of an issue here in that this preserve is really only accessible to those with bikes and those who live in the surrounding community. So this makes it pretty much a private park for a largely white neighborhood. Um, so I'm kind of conflicted by the desire to protect this heavily used area from overuse. But I also noted during lockdown how lower income communities were really precluded from much of our open space by the way access to these preserves is restricted. It's great that you're making the act, it's this accessible for those who are mobility limited, but how are they gonna to get to the trailhead in the first place is one question I have. There's almost no parking and a lot of the neighbors are putting boulders and things in front of their houses so you can't park there. Um, so, I, and I understand some of that. I just want us to keep in mind that there are other issues at play when we talk about um, these open spaces and who gets to use them. So I hope we'll continue this discussion about how we can preserve this gem, um, but also create equitable access for all those whose taxes support these preserves. So, you know, separate but equal great deer park. We had deer park, but separate but equal isn't really equal. Um, so uh, let's just keep this conversation going and um, see where we can get to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. The next speaker is Dave J, followed by Mallory Geithun. Dave, you're unmuted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I want to just start off my comments by saying, you know, I, I work in my private life with a lot of public land management agencies from the federal to state level. And I would just say I have a high degree of confidence in what I've heard through the presentations from 2016 on in terms of the care of this project. Um, it is not like that all around the country. And I would just say, um, I just think it, it is impressive. And so I just want to just kind of set, set the, the stage with that. Um, I do support this project because I think it will increase access to all citizens. And the speaker before me brought up some very good points that, that should be considered. Um, and I think it's going to promote visitors also staying on the path. Um, and thus, that's going to protect the environment. Um, and I think it, it's also important to note that we already have three to four bridges that are in the Elliott Preserve. And those were decided from you know, previous town council or previous open space that somebody built bridges at, at some point. And I, I think I said it, there's either, there's either three or four. Um, and, I, and I guess right now when we talk about, when I first came into this call, um, the, um, the, the, the people from um, Fairfax, the age committee came, were on there. And I think this is just an, an opportunity for us to kind of walk you know, walk the talk a little bit here in terms of access. And I, I would encourage everybody to do this. I was really encouraged that close to 75% of the comments that the Marin County Open Space got were in favor of the project. Um, and I do have a high degree of confidence that the, the, the park, the open space will, will create these and do it in a, in a way that protects the environment. Um, and, you know, just to close, I, I think we should be careful about using mountain bikes as the, as the kind of the evil of everything here. I, I, I don't see mountain bikes as the key factor in this discussion. And I, and I know others feel differently, um, but I, I appreciate you putting it on, the, on this agenda item for us to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. The next speaker is Mallory Geithheim followed by Tom Boss of MCDC. Mallory, you're unmuted now. might have to unmute yourself. Um, sorry, I thought you said I was unmuted. Um, I just want to say that just the words that we have are, uh, is that this is a nature preserve. 
It's not a human preserve. It's not a bike rider preserve. It's a nature preserve. And I think that really has to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know what? I pay a lot of taxes that I don't use things. I don't use the schools. I don't have the kids to do the school. I don't, I pay taxes for this town. And uh, and just because, you know, somebody is not going to, um, they're paying the tax, because at the, but they're not gonna go on this quote, nature preserve, it's not a reason. The reason is to keep the town viable for the people, the wildlife that helps us and um, for, for people who want to use it. I think that the, the bike coalition has, in my view, done a lot of damage. And we have, you know, double, <laughs> we, lo we lost uh, right hand turn. So everybody backs up but past the good earth at, because the bike coalition needed to make a little right hand turn by the gas station at the, at the movie theater. We have during droughts, um, a double line of uh, another another double line of grass and trees in front of grass and trees because that was a uh, um, the the bike coalition. All right, Th this this is for me a people, an animal, a uh, a nature preserve, and it's called a nature preserve because it needs to be preserved, and that's not going to happen. And yes, there are a lot of respectful bikers, but I'll tell you what, for a lot of them, it's an oxymoron for others um, who are very disrespectful. I hack, I hack a lot here and I have been, um, you know, and my dog has been put in danger because of the people who aren't the respectful ones. And there are a lot who aren't. So for me, I, I would just like to keep the nature preserve a nature preserve for all of nature and not just for those of us who can hike or you know sometimes you just you, you just find someplace else to hike i just don't think that um what we're doing here to do this and to build things and all this other stuff is not helping the town we have enough things that are that are not helping the town i would like not to see another one thank you Thanks, Mallory. The next speaker is Tom Boss. You're unmuted now. Uh, uh, good evening, council members. Um, I'm Tom Boss, representing the Marin County Bicycle Coalition, and I uh, request five minutes to speak, though I don't plan to use them all. Um, thank you for the opportunity, and also I would like to thank the Marin County um, Parks for their presentation. Um, I just want to start with a personal note. I've, I've lived in Marin County, the traditional uh, land of the coastal Miwok for over 50 years. I grew up in Mill Valley and attended the first Earth Day in 1970. Conservation was embedded in me at an early age through hiking and camping on Mount Tam and backpacking the Sierra. I'm proud to say that Mrs. Terwilliger placed a, ter a banana slug in my hand as a youth. I've shared my love of the outdoors in many ways throughout my life. I want others to enjoy it, respect it, and work together to solve problems. Uh, Marin County Bicycle Coalition gener generally pursues projects that will expand trail access, but the bridge project in Cascade Canyon actually reduces the linear footage of bike legal trail. Our interest in this proposal is solely related to the safety benefits for people on bikes, as well as walkers and parents with strollers that struggle to ford the creek at multiple crossings in the winter months. It's also an opportunity for the Marin County Bicycle Coalition to demonstrate its environmental values as this project will most definitely reduce the impacts on the habitat and wildlife. That's why Friends of Corte Madera Creek co-authored the original proposal. Uh, some background on Elliott Nature Preserve. Floyd Elliott, a former Fairfax mayor, owned roughly 500 acres at the end of Cascade a drive and had considered selling the land to developers in the 1970s. It was Karen Urquhart who hiked the land for years that championed an effort to protect this land from development and maintain public access. 
The town of Fairfax worked side by side with the newly formed Marin County Open Space District to, pur to purchase the land in uh, roughly 1973-74. Fairfax purchased one third, open space purchased the remaining two thirds, and eventually the town deeded the portion of the Elliott holding to the open space to manage and steward. We've had multiple conversations with and meetings uh, with Cascade Canyon residents about the proposal uh, to move the existing trail out of the creek. We've heard concerns about bike speeds in the preserve and illegal trail riding, and, and we acknowledge that happens. Um, these issues are compounded by the massive spike in visitation as people turned to, turned to our parks during the pandemic. The construction of two bridges is at least a year, if not two or three away from ha actually happening if, the, uh, if this proposal moves forward. That gives us ample time to review and monitor current visitor conditions in the nature preserve, identify what the problems are, what's causing them, and come up with a plan to mitigate any impacts that are identified. This could include signage, education, enforcement, and actions by the town to discourage parking on Cascade Drive. Tonight, I'm listening and taking notes. Following this meeting, I hope to work with the town, Marin County Parks, and, neighbor, and the neighborhood to identify current issues and implement solutions. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any from the uh, council about the original proposal. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I'm um, a, a Marin County, a Marin Conservation League uh, member. I'm on the Parks and Open Space Committee, and I am not aware of our organization opposing the project. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the next speaker is Jeffrey Bolt. You are unmuted now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things real quick. First of all, I suppose I could ask for five minutes. I don't think I will, but the uh, ElliotNaturePreserve.org and ElliotNaturePreserve.com is a website that has just been launched. And so we're trying to get as much um, attention to it as possible. And it's uh, some really interesting stuff. And hopefully we'll have a lot of pictures. And if you have pictures of you've taken up in the reserve, we want you to send them along so we can post them. And it's kind of, it's going to be a very informative, educational uh, site with lots of wonderful, great pictures. Um, so the... Uh, my thinking is that the presentation that the uh, back in 2016, 2017, that was made by the Parks and Open Space is a much different proposal uh, than we are seeing uh, this year and even tonight. Um, the memorandum of uh, understanding that the uh, that was agreed to by the City Council back in 2016 was agreed to, was a um, was a memorandum of understanding for that. Uh, 2017 uh, road and trail uh, map plan for the Elliott Nature Preserve. Very different from the one today that you've uh, apparently still going forward with. Uh, quick note on the mute, uh, memorandum of understanding. It is a non-binding contract. It is a handshake. It is a wink and a nod in the back in the day, it would be called a gentleman's agreement. It has no legal standing in court. The city, uh, the town council of Fairfax can stipulate, change, take that away at any time they want. In fact, it keeps getting referred to as the uh, open space as somebody mentioned or the Marin County Parks. In the deed trust, Elliot specifically stated that it must be referred to as the Elliot Nature Preserve. If it is not, that alone is reason enough for it to be taken back into the, uh, the city control, that alone. Um, in any case, in, in 2017, the, uh, the uh, pitch was for a, a steelhead trout, a bridge to protect them. Those signs are gone now. The Corte Madera Creek says no trout have come up since 2011. Um, all of that signage is finally taken down. I want to talk about the wood rat, the destruction of, of their nest, a 60-year-old dusky-footed wood rat nest, pre prime uh, a dinner for the spotted owl that was destroyed by the open space uh, uh, people when they were putting uh, a, 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 the foot of the first bridge number one 
directly on top of the dusky footed wood rats. That's that were not even known to exist in the first proposal that the town agreed to. It's shameful, uh, but um, that happened. So it wasn't uh, discovered by the county until um, March 4th of this year, the dusky footed wood rats nest. They had no idea they existed. They denied exist their existence. I also want to just say um, uh, these are ancient, I mean, these are 70 year old nests. There's a recently been a, a new discovery uh, to my understanding of some Aboriginal, uh, a, a kitchen, I believe it's called within the 38 acres that apparently was not mentioned in any of the secret report. I think this is probably news to most of the people at the county. Um, so that's something that the city should, the town of Fairfax should take into consideration they, when they move to um, uh, remove this uh, non-binding memorandum of understanding. I think it's a really a wonderful opportunity for the city, for the town of Fairfax to, it's a gem, it's the spotted owl, the, many, many, many different types of bats and salamanders and, 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 and fish and butterflies. And it's just wonderful to, and the dusky footed wood rat. And now uh, unbeknownst to the county, the yellow legged frog. So um, I think it's such an opportunity for the town to, to rise up to this occasion and take this land and make it a true nature preserve as Elliot. Uh, wanted to. I've talked to Tom Boss, mm. read his newsletter today to his constituents to get out there and make phone calls tonight. But Tom agrees, I think, that it would be a great opportunity for the Bicycle Coalition to use this opportunity to, to change the, uh, the perception of the bicyclists that they are in favor of conversation, con conservation. Anyway, I know that uh, I, my time has expired. Yeah. I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the uh, extra time. And uh, let's continue this. And there's so much more to discover up there. And I, I can't wait to find out more about this, uh, this uh, uh, Miwok uh, kitchen that we've, that's recently been revealed. So um, you all have a good night. Thanks for letting us even be uh, on the, on the uh, meet, in meeting tonight. Okay, thanks, Sean. <clears throat> you would like to close the public comment, Mr. Mayor? There are no more speakers. Thank you. We'll bring it back. And uh, I will make a few comments myself if, uh, if council would, would permit me. Um, so thank you for the presentation and to the public for the comments. The, uh, as I've thought about this, I, I have just a few comments to, uh, and actually some of them I won't even mention because they've been mentioned by the public. Um, the one thing, however, is that I think signage, from my understanding, uh, the county is interested in in understand in working with Fairfax to to think about what signage would be good out there. And I think that makes sense as the local people, most local to the park. Um, I am by no means an expert on the psychology of signage, but, uh, and, it, and it certainly needs to be somehow coupled with enforcement. But uh, the issue of the cyclists, I have experienced myself in, in uh, uh, in one visit out there recently, there were two occasions in the one visit of about an hour and a half or so in which cyclists came screaming down the hill, two different hills, and uh, uh, just didn't look like they had any intention of stopping. And the, the group of us uh, called to the cyclists to slow down and one of those groups of cyclists cursed at us as they went by. It just Obviously, there are cyclists who are respectful. I've been a road bicyclist for many years uh, earlier, actually getting from one place to another, not recreational so much. But uh, I certainly support cycling, but there is there are some issues. So I have two things to address that. One of them is with regard to signage. I would suggest, and this is just a proposal, I don't know how we would carry forward really working out the details of it, maybe a subcommittee, but uh, I would suggest 
a single sign that is that appears at every entrance to the nature preserve. So the street entrances and the trail entrances, every way that you could come into the nature preserve, the same sign. That sign having basically saying, slow down, this is a slow zone because it's a nature preserve. And then a little bit of detail about how, uh, what an amazing place it is. It's a small place that can be mentioned because that would help people to realize that they don't have to slow down forever. This is a small preserve they're going through and it's a, a, an amazing unique place that is home to many sensitive species. And it's also used by elderly and disabled and families with kids and possibly strollers. So that type of thing on the sign to really try to impress upon people that they're entering a different zone from what they're coming down off of. And a scan code that could go to more information. So just by the, uh, the repetition of the same sign, I'm wondering whether that would maybe get it read after you see it enough times, you'd actually read it. And also it would tend to define the boundaries of the preserve by having the same sign everywhere. So that's one thing I would propose. And then the other thing is actually on uh, an agenda item this evening on our consent calendar to, uh, to compose a letter. And I have talked with MCBC people, Tom Boss, uh, about this, to try to put together a letter that would be distributed to cyclists by the establishments in town that cater heavily to cyclists. There are at least four. And uh, just to say, address to both road cyclists and trail cyclists, but just saying, welcome to Fairfax. We're glad you're here, but please be respectful of both our town and the, the trails around. So just try to somehow reach out and see if we can build a little bit of human bridges with the cyclists and, and try to address that issue. Those are primarily the two things I wanted to, to put out on this. Um, and any other council members comments? Welcome, um, Vice Mayor Hellman. Hey there, thank you so much for being here. It was a great presentation and I also appreciate you meeting me out there because um, I learned a lot and I, I felt you uh, were really good listeners. Tom was out there as well. And um, it was a, a really productive um, discussion and a visit. And so I have, uh, you probably know, I, I did comment on the, the CEQA. <laughs> and so I'm waiting for my response. I'll look forward to getting that. Um, so the first thing is, I, I feel very strongly, and I, I, would, I would really like to hear from um, Max or John about the name. Like, in my mind, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not clear on why the project is called Cascade Canyon Open Space Bridges Project. And I understand that the two are um, next to each other. Um, but so I'd like to, I, you know, my vision would be when you enter that preserve, you have awareness that you are entering a very special place. Like it is a nature preserve. Um, so, I would really appreciate some commentary there if you are open to um, really rebranding your whole effort, if that's possible. I don't know if it is with all the, the documentation um, you've already put together, but moving forward, really respecting and upholding um, both from a legal standpoint and the intention of um, Mr. Elliott there. Um, just piggybacking on um, the mayor's comments on signage. Um, I would agree, um, Mayor, but I would take it a little further that I think there needs to be, um, like right now, uh, as far as bike speed, the only place you see it is, is a, there's a big sign that's there and talks about species and so forth, but there's like a little five mile, I don't know what the speed limit is, but if you're a biker, you're just freezing right through there and you don't know what the speed limit is. And um, five miles an hour has been recommended. And I would, that's, if you just say slow, slow is very subjective. You know, a 20 year old, what's slow for a 20 year old is not the same for me, let's say. <laughs> um, so I would appreciate that. Um, and Tom did, 
I know Tom is committed to conservation as his organization, and I don't want this to be a bike bashing um, because I think we all support mountain biking um, and biking. Um, that said, I, um, I understand the closure of the he Happersburger um, Trail is, was de-scoped from this effort, but I am really concerned about use of that um, trail. And so maybe we can talk to um, the Biking Coalition separately about plans for frankly closing that to bikers because it's completely accessible right now and they're bombing down that because it's it's an awesome trail. <laughs> um, and then um, finally, with regard to, so the project states, and we talked a little bit about this, right? Um, that there's not, in, because your prior knowledge and your expertise with similar efforts, you don't anticipate increase, increased volume, traffic volume. But to me, um, if, you're, if you're increasing or broadening access, which I fully support from an equity standpoint for the reasons some of our residents shared, um, it doesn't totally um, make sense to me. And you, you talked about placing a cam, a, a tracking mechanism out there. So I think that would be um, helpful to share with the public related to that. Um, and I think, I think that covers it for me as far as the communications to um, the biking community. I, I think a letter is great, but then it's kind of one and done. You need an ongoing communication strategy that I would recommend including a digital social strategy. Um, but I, I do appreciate that idea. Thank you. Thank you. Other council members? Renee. But just for a quick clarification, you said a tracking device. Can you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I, I use the wrong word. Maybe it's a camera. <laughs> I used the wrong word, I'm sure. No, no, I'm just wondering in what was what for what purpose and how that, would be, how that would be employed. Yeah, no, that it sounds uh, creepier than it is. The you know we sometimes be in areas we'll use a, a camera just to track the number of visitors um, to an area. Um, I think that's what we did close to close to this project. The other thing we have in some of our preserves is um, this. Uh, it's like a, um, a a a device that's there's some wire under the ground and a. Um, it can it can tell it can count the number of people pedestrians uh, equestrians and hikers I mean and bikers and it can tell the difference and then it uploads that number to the cloud so that we can sort of track data in real time at a number of locations in our preserves just to get a sense of of visitor use uh, John is there anything else you want to add to that I think they're yeah. eco counters yeah that's right um so just to touch on Stephanie's um, question about the camera. So we did install a motion detection camera, a game camera um, in Cascade. I think it was 2019. So it was pre-project, but also pre-COVID. Um, so we got a sense of kind of baseline numbers out there. Um, and then we would actually go through and count, you know, hiker, biker, horse, dog walker, whatever. So we get a good sense of the baseline data. Um, then we put, we went ahead, because we saw numbers spike so much during COVID, we put a camera out during COVID. And so we kind of were able to see that spike. Um, and then, you know, if this project was approved, uh, we would put a camera out post project to see like what type of, you know, change in visitation intensity was there, um, you know, and, there's other variables involved, obviously, with COVID um, seemingly declining, kids sports coming back in session. My expectation is trail use is going to decline. Um, and so maybe go back to baseline, but maybe not because more people are working from home. And so maybe they go out for a midday hike. Um, but so we will be able to track pre-COVID, pre-project, COVID, and then post-COVID, post-project. I'd also just add, you know, and uh, maybe there's, I'm not sure, direct me if I'm, I'm wrong with responding to some of your questions and comments now, but in terms of uh, signage, I'm happy, you know, I really appreciate the partnership of your council and authoring your letter about, you know, um, respectful 
uh, and, and mindful recreation in, in the preserve and from the bike community. And, um, and in terms of signage, would welcome your partnership and in, in considering signage, you know, I think doesn't necessarily have to be part of the project process. It's something that we could do, you know, sooner than that and, and happy to, to talk about, you know, how we represent the, you know, welcome to the preserve. We, we put new signs into all of our entrances and tried to have a consistent theme across all of our 34 open space preserves. And part of it was having, if you're familiar with the signs, there's a place for specific, uh, you know, signs to be added um, specific to each of the locations. And so it's not, it's relatively easy for us to add some additional wording or signage um, specific to the, to the preserve. So I'd, I'd be happy to work with, with your council or a, a subcommittee of your council or, or with Garrett or however it works for you um, to, to talk about that. Thank you, Max. Renee. Yeah, there was just one other thing I wanted to suggest. And, um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that works better than having humans meeting other humans as they're using our trails. So, I mean, I think an important question would be, what is the plan um, for parks to be out there as humans? And one, educating people, two, citing people. Because as a biker, and as someone who knows the whole landscape of how this all works and where all the conflict and friction lies, I know that that uh, mountain bikers don't like getting tickets. So, I mean, I'm just gonna put that out there. And I think that it changes the culture of how people use and behave. I hate to be that way because it sounds rather, you know, it's punitive, but there, 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 there's a place and a time where you say, hey, enough's enough. It goes along obviously with, um, with the education. Um, and I think creative signage and also I think, and I was going to ask Garrett if he would chime in here to talk about um, some of the concerns the neighbors have to do with people parking illegally. And we know there is no parking down there. I live on Cascade Drive. I've used that preserve with my kids, with my bikes for 26 years. Um, so I know it, it really well. So I'm just wondering, um, I know there hasn't been the presence. Our cadet has not been out there. But I do, and I think Linda Novi asked this in the start of this um, of this uh, public comment period about will we have our enforcement um, team down there? So could you just talk about how that might play out um, as we move closer to this project? That's sure. that, oh, go ahead. Sorry, is that a question for Max or? Well, it's two pronged. It's it's all the enforcement opportunity and all the education opportunity and human presence at these entrances um, to educate people. And you know, it's a new it's 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 a new it's a new landscape. So, um, but for the town and what we can do, and I've talked to people this way, is that you know w w we need to be held to the fire to enforce things when parking is blocking, um, you know, our our access and egress for um, our emergency vehicles. So I'm just wondering how, how, and I know we haven't fully developed this, but my understanding is that we will have more patrol down there um, as has been requested. So I'll let Max answer and I can answer parking after. Okay, That's perfect. Great. That sounds good. Yeah, and I, you know, typically we have, uh, you know, a, a number of ways that we contact visitors and try to, you know, promote stewardship and responsible recreation in our preserves. Um, you know, we, uh, we work a lot through partnerships and, and, but, and volunteerism, we, but we also have 11 open space rangers, I think, and two deputies that are um, contracted, paid for uh, by the open space district to support our rangers in the field. Um, and additionally, we have a volunteer patrol, you know, a number of other ways to um, partner. We partner with uh, the uh, trail partners, which is MCL, MCBC, and the Horse Council, helping to spread also a message of, you know, responsible recreation. And, you know, a number of other organizations are, are really helpful partners in that effort. Um, but, you know, one of the challenges over the last year is our, all of our open space rangers were almost full-time staffing our vaccination pods for the county. Um, they're all back in the field now. They've been relieved of, of that duty, but um, during a really busy time, we did not have any open space rangers in the field. And additionally, we'd, um, we'd had to uh, really cut back the, the work of our volunteer patrol and a number of our other um, avenues for, for contacting visitors directly. We still had our, our deputies in the field and 
um, one supervising ranger. So now our, our, our open space rangers are back in the field again. Our, um, our deputies are in the field. We're restarting our volunteer patrol and other, you know, volunteer programs for contacting folks. But, um, you know, that was sort of one of the, uh, the impacts. And, you know, I think, I think it was for the best because it was extremely important to get our community vaccinated and um, it felt like the right thing to do at the time. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, we're, we're happy to have our team back. And, um, you know, I, I just mentioned that the community that visits these preserves are our partners in that messaging. You know, we know that we have our, we did a, a, um, a really great study of our visitors with San Francisco State University and um, one thing we found was our average visitor visits 78 times a year in our preserve and lives with them within a mile of that preserve. So it's, you know, when we're at a trailhead, you know, having a coffee with the ranger event or something like that, you know, even just contacting somebody once we know that person's going to be out there all the time and the information that they give us really helps us um, be better stewards of that land. I don't know if Garrett has anything else to add. Sorry, thanks, Max. Uh, yeah, just with regard to parking, yes, PD responds to any complaints. So if you have a parking complaint, you should call PD. But you should also know right now, just with PD, we are, you no, know, there's a lot of people out of out on lead for various reasons. You gotta remember we have one vacancy for officers. And so right now we have cadets filling in as reserve dispatchers. We have officers working extra shifts. So they respond when they can. But when we're, we anticipate the later part of this month that people will be back from leave and we'll be able to get out, get out there and do parking enforcement both in downtown and in, in the um, Cascade area. So again, we always ask everyone to call um, and they're out there often dealing with abandoned vehicles and so on. I'm just looking because the chief just sent me a text. But um, it's important to realize you have to call PD, it's okay. You think it's a bother, but you just call the non-emergency line, PD will respond. Um, and they are planning to do active code enforcement. It's just a matter of staffing. So when staffing of the officers and we get uh, the cadets back, then it, it's gonna, they're gonna be out there. And whether or not they give warnings or citations, that's really up to PD. But again, we're warning everyone because it's gonna apply to everyone, whether you're a resident or not. Thank you both, and uh, Max, for your extraordinary work with Marin Recovers, and for the um, for your team being out there at the Vax clinics. That was um, we've been on meetings with you on your phone out at the Vax clinics, and you're you're amazing, a Renaissance man, truly. Thank you. Thank you. So I see that uh, Chance and Barbara, you both have your virtual hands up. I caught it this time, Chance. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Max, John, uh, everyone uh, for for the Michelle for the presentation, and um, I appreciate the the comments from the public and the comments from my colleagues. It's good. I, I just like I'm glad that we had this opportunity. Um, I shared that with Garrett too, just to have these sessions, these like check ins to get us get like a temperature check on how the the local community is feeling about things too. Um, my my wonder right now is that it sounds like like some of this is a good check-in but some of it's also premature we like it sounds like they're going to be three to six months before we get those CEQA comments back and know how you plan to address or mitigate some of those things so that's that's out there and then the other bit is there's no timeline for this whole project uh and between those things between rangers coming back online uh, and and the um, the volunteer patrol and the deputies and coming out of COVID as well. It sounds like there are a lot of things up in the air that we don't fully know about yet. And so this is a good opportunity to um, sort of huddle, come together, uh, MCBC and, and the environmental community and the local community and council members and everybody, but just to um, in the county to figure out how to address the immediate issues that people are experiencing prior to any of this happening. It sounds like there are immediate issues and, and that's what's driving some of the fear or the concern. And, and so that's, that's sort of what I'm hoping 
next steps are is that there's there's clearly a lot more that's going to happen before any big decisions are made. There's no action tonight, so there's no need for a continuance to the public that's asking about a continuance. But um, yeah, I just look, I really look forward to another engagement at some point in the future, because it sounds like there, there are going to be more. And I also um, just want to thank uh, Chief Weber again for, for staying on the call in case there were any questions. And I don't know if, if, uh, if it would be valuable to have you, <laughs> if it would be valuable to have you uh, just share your perspective on the on the fire risks that that people have brought up, but I just I know you've been on here, so I I want to honor the fact that you've stayed on and, and heard the public raise those concerns as well. Yeah, but that's wonderful. all I have for now. Uh, Chief, if you would want to comment on anything briefly, that would be and thank you for staying. Yes, I'd... happy to stay with all you guys. Um, you know, I think that obviously this is, you know, an emotional uh, event, if you will, for the neighbors and others, and I want to be respectful of that. You know, I did hear mention of a fire in the preserve um, some years ago, I think it was uh, Frank that brought it up. And that was a prolific arsonist that, uh, you know, we had the FBI involved and, and ultimately, uh, um, you know, dealt with that issue. So I think that you know, from the preserve perspective, and we work with parks and open space all the time, we don't have a lot of fires uh, specifically caused by hikers or bikers. I think we all recognize those that are using these preserves, open spaces across the county are generally very respectful of the land and, uh, you know, want it to be there and, and well kept. Um, you know, I, I have been working with uh, the police chief on parking stuff. And, and I think Linda mentioned uh, the signage that went up relatively fast. Uh, and, and I hear, did hear discussion about the enforcement piece. And I, and I think all of that plays a role into keeping a safer place for everyone to use. Uh, and we'll stay engaged with both the open space district as we regularly do and, and the town um, as, as we move forward in this. And, and we were involved in the road and trail plan and the discussions and understanding that most of open space and the preserves were retired ranches and that it would be you know unfeasible for the open space district to maintain all of these uh, but we did work with them to select you know roadways that we need access both from a medical perspective because we do get medical calls and then access for fires also uh, so we are fully engaged we'll remain engaged um, and certainly appreciate the, the fire concern that's been addressed. Um, and, and we'll take note of that and then work with Max and his team as well as the town. Thank you, Chief. Barbara. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thanks to Open Space for giving this presentation and welcome, Max. Renee and I were here 2016, 2017. And some of the comments we heard tonight were very similar. I do wanna say that the project you presented in 2016, 2017, where 2017 was when we signed the MOU, um, was really the same project um, with the exception of more refinements and more pictures that we didn't have at that time. I liked what uh, Lisa Blash said about um, access and equity. And I'm pleased to see what you call your IAP access because I'm glad that Pam Mig's mother at 80 was tough enough to walk on that high water trail that I'm glad to see we're gonna decommission hopefully at some point. But my mother who was in great shape would never have been able to do that in her 80s. And so I like the idea of easier access once we can get to the preserve. And I also um, like some of the ideas about, you mentioned Max, that it's easy to add other signs. And I think um, the mayor had some ideas for signs, but I also liked Vice Mayor Hellman's uh, question or comment about and what we've heard from a number of folks is, is there anything wrong with adding an additional sign calling it the Elliott Nature Preserve? Um, you know, similar to what's been talked about 
with the road issue or Sir Francis Drake Boulevard is potentially we could have some kind of signage that would point out the historical name and maybe that would help. Um, I do want to say that the issues that we've heard tonight on bicyclists, I'm a bicyclist. I've never been a good mountain bike bicyclist. And I do know that there are problems all over with those folks who want to just crash down these trails. So it's not just the Elliott Nature Preserve. It happens. But I also know that there's a lot of good folks that are respectful. So I would like to see um, the idea of the signage, uh, the letter that the mayor proposed um, that I think should also be, I think the Marin uh, County Bicycle Coalition, Tom Boss and others have handed out things to bikers on certain trails where we've had problems in the past. But I also wanna echo, you know, what council member Katrana said as far as in what I raised earlier, We've got three to six months for you guys to go through all those comments. There can be some tweaks based on, on the responses to comments or may, maybe major changes. And at some point we will see a timeline. And at least from what I saw of the pictures, that doesn't look like major construction work. It looks like you're lifting bridges into those areas. So you're not gonna be doing, from, from my limited view, a lot of disruption of the creek. But I'm glad to see that after all your work, we have identified more species than were there or we thought were there a few years ago. So I agree with council member Katrana. There's no reason to continue this. We've got, you know, you all have time to work on all these issues. And I think uh, the mayor's idea of signage is great. And I know a few years ago, we assigned at that point Vice Mayor Lax to work with you on some signage and issues that went into the MOU. So I, I think, you know, we can refine this, but I also want to say it is an area that is largely for a white neighborhood. And so I applaud the idea of getting more folks out there, not all the time, and hopefully John's idea of maybe we go back to closer to pre-COVID use. So it isn't just uh, everybody tramping through there. But I wanna thank you guys and specifically thank you, Max, because I know you've been wearing two hats and probably still wearing that second hat. So I think you've just been totally responsive since you've been in this job every time I've ever asked for help. So thank you all and thank you to your staff. All right, thank you. And so um, this was intended to be a presentation and not an action item. And so I agree, it's, uh, it, it's not something that we continue, but um, I was hoping and I think we succeeded in, in getting public comment to you folks so you can hear of uh, and take care. Go thank you. It. Thank you very thank much. You. All right. Thank you. Okay. Council members, what is your pleasure? Um, is it time for a break at this point or do we? Yeah. All right. So let's take it is 1007. Let's take a break until 1015. Um, and then we will reconvene with the consent calendar. Thank you. We're back. So resuming the town council meeting in Fairfax, we um, are now at the consent calendar. Do we have any council comments on the consent calendar before we go to public comment? Vice Mayor Hellman. You're muted. My apologies. I have a um, an edit to the March three minutes. Okay. Do I do that now, or? Um, yeah, yeah. If it's if it's really minor, it can just be sent directly to Michelle. But if it's something of 
any content, we should just do it now, yes. Um, and I'm, I meant to take care of this earlier, but um, so on page four, um, where I think that's the, that's the last page. Yeah, so um, it's relevant for what we just talked about. Uh, Council member um, Cutrano suggested at the end of this meeting that we have the uh, presentation or he suggested as a future agenda item, the um, bridges project. Um, and so I wanted that to be noted because subsequently, because at that point it was declined or no one was interested and then subsequently I raised it. So I just want that to be on the, added to the minutes, please. I'm not sure why it was omitted. Any other comments from council? No, thank you. Okay, so we'll go to public comment. This will be on items on the consent calendar. And Michelle, if you bring that in, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to remind you about the 10 o'clock rule also. Yeah, um, okay. So I guess we should... Uh, my well, um, all right, we can stop for the 10 o'clock rule and uh, and consider whether there's anything that we, of the remaining items on the agenda, which are three after the consent, that we might want to postpone, continue. Um, Barbara, your hand seemed to dart up first. <laughs> I would um, suggest that um, I think we can probably get through all of them. But I think if for some reason we get um, sort of sidetracked or take longer on one item than another, maybe we can revisit it as we get to the 1130 room. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what council member Cutrano was going to see and was raised as well. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, council member Kohler. Yeah, I was just looking at the time and um, I don't know how long the the two items on the regular meeting agenda are going to be, but just mindful that um, I think the, the item that will follow that is the item that came from the planning commission. And if it gets that late, I just want to be mindful of staff. We have Ben and Linda here, and I don't want them up super late and us talking about that at like 12 a.m. Mm -hmm. and then they have to go to work the next day. <laughs> so. Is that time sensitive? Number 12 public hearing item. No, you can continue it. I have to say, I think these next two items are rather meaty. Um, and so I, I would, you know, to, to mm -hmm. the yeah. second what uh, Council Member Catrano said, I would hate to keep them up. I'm not sure we would get there. That's fine with me. Okay. Um, you, you concur, Ben, that that is... That would be okay with you if this got continued for a month because uh, we won't have a mid-month meeting this month. Uh, the only, my only concern is that it's part of what we're attending, attempting to do is address a trend towards uh, a sameness of colors, these dark colors. And we've already seen in the last month, one building that did get painted uh, in downtown. So it's really the council's decision uh, uh, certainly the planning commission was concerned, but you know, what are the odds of another building being painted dark color in response to this emerging trend to paint buildings dark color? It's hard to say. It's probably not that sensitive, but it's hard to speculate. Yeah. Well, it would probably be the shortest of the items remaining in the agenda, but, it, but that would just put the other two even later and there are, yeah, I'm sure I people waiting for them. I, you know, it seems as though the only place being painted right now is one, two, three Bellinas and it looks white. So I'm wondering if maybe we could go ahead. I, I would be happy to make a motion to continue item 12 if it's not, you know, uh, so time sensitive. Yeah, I'd second that. Okay, um, I'll take a roll call on that. Uh, Council Member Kohler. Aye. This is continuing item 12. Councilmember Catrano? Yes. Councilmember Goddard? Yes. 
Vice Mayor Hellman. It sounds like Garrett wants to interject. Oh, Garrett has, okay, just, sorry. Just a friendly amendment to make clear you're gonna continue the item to your next council meeting, which is June 2nd. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. It just helps question. for a public okay. noticing. All right, Vice Mayor Hellman. Yes. On this newly clarified continuation and I will vote yes as well. Okay, sorry, uh, Ben and Linda, but have a good evening. <laughs> Unless you want to, you know, hang around. Okay, back to the consent calendar, and we were at the point of public comment. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the reminder, Michelle. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, so we have two hands raised. The first is Jane Richardson Mack, and the second is Janet Fitzgerald. Um, Jane, you are unmuted now. Thank you, but I think that was left over from the last one. I'm not sure what, what are we talking about here. I don't have the agenda in front of me. I've always have some consent calendar. What are we talking? What are we talking about? The consent calendar. What are we? What part of it? Well, I'm not going to read it. Oh, all right. I mean, is this the parklet part? That's the only one I want. No, it's not. Okay, then I will lower my hand. So all right. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Are there any other hands that were intentionally up? It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it, no. Hey, Michelle, all right, we're bringing it back to council. And sounds like we could entertain a motion to adopt the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Second. All right, that's a motion by Catrano, second by Hellman. And M Michelle, would you like to take the roll call on this important Oh. Yes, yes, I would. Um, and actually, did you want to say for your motion that with the um, amendments to the town council minutes as yes, requested? Yes, with the amendment stated by Vice Mayor Hellman to the minutes, yes. Page that is acceptable to everyone. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> Council Member Kohler. Hi. Council member Petrano. Yes. Council member Goddard. Aye. Vice Mayor Hellman. Aye. Mayor Ackerman. Yes. Okay, that passes yes. the consent calendar and gets us to two more items left. And we have put them in the order of item, what was originally numbered item 15 and then item 14. So moving on now to item 15 on the regular agenda. Um, Garrett, would you introduce this, please? Sure. So item 15 is adoption of two resolutions. One resolution would extend the temporary encroachment permits from May 31st to September 7th. The other resolution would extend the time expiration date for temporary use permits from May 31st to September 7th. And then the other item on the recommendations was to allow the council an ability to continue its discussion regarding the use of outdoor public spaces and providing directions to staff as it deemed appropriate. As background, you may recall this, we created the temporary encroachment permits, TEPs, temporary use permits, TUPs, back in June 2020. And then in November 2020, we adopted an ordinance to four TUPs and extended that expiration date from then in November to the current expiration date of May 31st. We did the same thing for TEPs, which has adopted a resolution to amend, to extend expiration date from November to May 31st, obviously of this month. And obviously this was all created to allow businesses in the downtown to be able to use either their private spaces, that's a TUP, or temporary or public right-of-way spaces like parking spaces um, or parking lots, that's a, TEP, and that's what we did. And that was all in response to COVID and shelter in place. So at your April 21st meeting, the council discussed these concepts and indicated that there's a willingness to extend the deadline from May 31st to September 7th. And you direct the staff to return to this meeting with the resolutions to allow you to do that. Now, the reason we selected September 7th was about a three month extension. It runs through Labor Day, theoretically, schools will be back in session. 
um, things would start to return to normalcy. Um, you know, we're, the governor had reported June 15th, they would get rid of the tiers um, and when everything would be fully reopened. Now we're unsure if that's gonna happen or if that date slides. An example would be, we all thought Marin would move to the yellow tier this week, but because of the uptick in COVID cases over the weekend, it's actually two weeks out till we could move to the yellow tier. So the three month period gave us a little cushion to for those issues if we're not gonna fully reopen. But really the main point of the extensions is we really thought it would give us time to really evaluate the use of the outdoor spaces in terms of parking and in terms of the uses of them because if things get back to normal and you had more indoor dining, are those spaces still being heavily used? And it would give the council a little more time to engage in a more robust discussion with the community because you could obviously have workshops or meetings then to talk about the uses of those spaces. I think right now there's about 20 parking spaces that are impacted by the current uh, uses of the public parking spaces, including the mono lot. I think as part of the process, we had reported back in April, what we would do is we would do a community-wide survey to the businesses and residences. Uh, actually, it's a questionnaire to give them an eye to ask their opinion regarding the use of those outdoor public spaces, mainly the, the parking spaces in the mono lot. Normally, we would use a chamber of commerce to get the information out to the businesses. And while we'll still do that, we actually have the chamber's mailing list too. So we're going to add our business emails and actually do direct emails to the businesses to make sure they know about the questionnaire and other information we want to get out there. So what we anticipate for the questionnaire is we would get it out next week, say Monday, run it through the end of May, and then in June, one of your June meetings, probably the second meeting in June, the council can have a discussion regarding the results of the questionnaire, provide an opportunity for the businesses to chime in more in the process uh, regarding the whether or not the concept of whether or not the extension should be on be beyond September 7th or whether there should be some process to provide a longer term for the uses of these outdoor spaces. So again, what's before you tonight is just extending for three, approximately three months, the TEPs, the temporary encroachment permits for the use of the public spaces and the temporary use permits, which are the uses of the private spaces. So at this evening's meeting, we assume that the council will probably wanna continue its discussion regarding the use of spaces, i.e. the mono lot, um, what kind of policies or procedures maybe should govern the future uses of these outdoor spaces in terms of design standards, in terms of who's allowed to use it, public, private. So there's a lot of issues with that. But again, the core issue is ex temporary extension for three months for the temporary encroachment permit permits and the temporary use permits. And I think that's, let's see, I think, oh, one other thing I'm sorry that I probably have to mention is we do need some direction regarding if we extend it to September 7th, does that mean that if another business came in and they wanted to do something similar to what's out there, would they allowed, be allowed to do that? And we have modified our online application to ensure that they do talk to some of the adjacent businesses about what they're planning. But again, I'm just, again, the core issue is extension and then you have your subset of just continuing the longer range discussion of what to do with these spaces beyond September 7th, should you adopt the resolution. So that concludes the staff report. Okay. Thank you, Garrett. So very, uh, very simply tonight, just an extension of the existing, the existing permits, but much more to come in terms of creatively thinking about the downtown. Any uh, questions or clarifications from council before we go to public comment and then we can discuss it further? Chance. Yeah, just one clarification. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Garrett, I was wondering, the, the mono lot, the actual um, functioning, the permitting, the, there's no permitting process for the mono lot, correct? And that is like sort of at the, at the will of the council. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. I just wanted to confirm that. Thanks. I uh, quick clarification. I noted, um, Garrett, you... <clears throat> 
referred to it as a questionnaire versus a survey. What is the distinction in your mind? I just want to point out that the survey is not scientific. It's not intended to be a scientific survey where you could say, oh, it's representative of this group. Got it's it. Kind of a questionnaire that gives you input to guide the discussion. Okay. And it's for the, is it just for the small business community or the whole community? It'd be for the whole community, but we would have the categories. You could select, do you own a business? What type of business? And so we'll have a lot of breakdowns in okay. the survey but it's for everyone. Thank you. And Barbara. Um, just one question, because there is no TEP or TUP for the mono lot, um, we could potentially discuss the mono lots tonight separately from just this extension because it is on the agenda, correct? Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Okay, anything else? We go to public comment. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Michelle, if you would. Yes, I'd be happy. Activity. Okay. <laughs> so um, the first speaker is Jane Richardson Mack, followed by Patrice, followed by Devin Fordyce Wilson. So, Jane, you are unmuted. Hello, Jane. Thank you. Here thank we are. This is it. Yes, it is. It's prime time. Um, I'm not in favor of extending them too much or making it too easy because I'm afraid it's kind of opening up the idea of them becoming permanent someday. I am adamantly against closing Bolinas. It's primarily for fire safety reasons. That's just a, a bad uh, road to get out of town on. And those things, you can't go through them. Cars parked could, could be moved. Um, is there any way it could be like month to month since this COVID thing keeps jumping around all the time? Um, if I'm not, I don't have a big problem with that. My, I just have a problem with that it's getting a little too comfortable. Um, I think the mono, part if, of any of them, that one seems more egalitarian. Like some restaurants have like a private outdoor dining. Some restaurants don't have any. Some of the shops don't have any parking in front of their shops anymore. So it, it seems like it's, you know, not on purpose bias, but it's giving advantages to some businesses and, and a real disadvantage to other businesses. And I don't see any way to make that even except the mono parking lot, everybody could use that. If that were to be, the only thing I would like to recommend is possibly making it better looking. It's pretty barren and sad looking. It's not probably very comfortable when it's hot either. Um, maybe if I'm trying to find out if the tree committee actually connect, collects any fines, if that could be used as a beautification thing, perhaps some planter boxes along the side that had trees in them that could stay, even if it returned to parking, just as a something that would be better looking. That's it. Thank you very much for your time and attention and staying awake. Thank you, Jane, for sticking with us. The next speaker is Patrice, followed by Devin Fordyce Wilson, followed by Britt W. And Patrice, you're unmuted now. Hi, Patrice. Hi, Council. Um, first, speaking of the mono parking lot, we're in a pandemic. Uh, it's crazy to me that every time I walk by there to, to watch my little kids play Little League, no one's wearing masks. So I think if we're going to keep that open, we should... Uh, recognize the rules of the state and have people wear masks because to me right now it's just a petri dish and second of all I just want to say I've been watching this meeting since seven and the topic I started watching for still hasn't been hit so it would be really helpful for the residents of Fairfax if you guys could prioritize a little bit more and maybe put the things that people care about early and the things that less people care about later. I really wanted to hear um, about 
the police chief. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. The next speaker is Devin Fordyce Wilson, followed by Britt W, followed by Pamela Mix. Uh, Devin, you are unmuted now. Hi, good evening. Thank you again, everybody, for all your work for the council, the, pre the president, I mean, the mayor and the vice, vice mayor and everybody for all that you're doing. I know you get a lot of grief probably, but you're doing a great job. Anyways, I just want to talk to you about the parking issue. I have a couple concerns about these parkettes. The main priority that I have is when you have moved the, um, the actual ADH, the issue for handicapped, when you put them in the main street, you guys, we're putting our most vulnerable people to exit into the streets. They need to have their ADH for a wheelchair or someone that needs handicap. They really should be off the main street. I think that's kind of my, one of my main things is, is my safety concern for our handicapped uh, citizens. The other part is that understanding that the, um, the narrowing of the parking, I, I agree with the other person saying that when you have these little parkettes all along the Bolinas, road, we are narrowing our exit already furthermore. And I, I really would hope that we don't continue to keep those for, for a long-term or for permanent states, because we do have unlimited parking issues, but it narrows that. Furthermore, when you drive from Broadway onto uh, the, the third thing is when you drive, when you take a left turn there from Broadway to Bolinas at that corner, when you drive around that corner, it's very, it's narrowed now and people are getting very distracted. So they're looking at the parkette people, they're looking at the people around the area and I've almost been hit. So I think it's a little bit of a distraction. Furthermore, I consider it dangerous when you take that turn that they might drive into one of those parkettes. So I think it's more of a safety issue having them on that corner along the actual Bolinas. If there's a safer place to put them, that'd be great, but just not on that exit strategy the, uh, the thoroughfare for traffic for exiting. So I appreciate your time. And I know you guys have been listening to a lot of people tonight, but I just think that those, the number one issue is safety. And I think that for handicaps, as well as our, our safety for our citizens for evacuation, as well as just parking and driving around, it'd be nice if we don't make those permanent and that we do remove them from the, the actually Bolinas road. So I thank you very much for your time. And I hope that that's, do you have any questions? From me i i think that was pretty clear thank you Dave. okay all yeah. right thank you very much next speaker is brit w followed by pamela miggs followed by lisa lush and uh, brit you are unmuted hi my name is brit williams and i've been a fairfax resident for four years and i am calling in to one, just thank you for moving this agenda item up a little bit earlier in the meeting um, and to offer my support for the temporary extension of the parklets. I am a huge fan of the parklets um, and would like to speak to a few points of why we should keep them. The first is that they enhance our community. So they bring an aliveness, a sense of community, more interaction, especially after COVID downtown. And this is highly valuable both to the businesses and just a sense of community in downtown Fairfax. Speaking of COVID, the second point is that they also offer a safe outdoor space for people to gather. As regulations lift, there may still be people who don't feel comfortable eating inside, and these offer a fantastic alternative. Third is that they're good for business and for our health. The restaurants are able to serve two to three times their indoor capacities, meaning they're more likely to stay in business. And after losing places like the Sleeping Lady, 123 Bolinas, or Grillies, we know how sad it is to lose our Fairfax institutions. Plus, according to a Huffington Post article, spending time outside lowers depression and anxiety and increases happiness. Who doesn't want that? Of course, I want to address the parklet dissidents, most notably the shop owners uh, with parklets in front of them. And while I understand that they may have agreed to the parklets under the assumption that it would be temporary, after all, none of us knew this would go on for over a year, I wonder if there are ways that the shops and the restaurants could work together. So specifically, let's talk about Live Water and Amelie. Given that the Amelie Parklet extends into the front of Live Water, I'm curious if there are ways we could bring some benefits to Live Water in exchange. For example, what if on Mondays or Tuesdays when Amelie is closed, they used the parklet to 
display their clothing or surfboards? Or what if Amelie offered a 10% discount to customers who brought in a receipt from Livewater to incentivize sales? Or what if Livewater stayed open late one evening and took advantage of the long line of people waiting for a table at Amelie? These are just a few ideas, but I'm hopeful that we could find a way to keep everyone happy and maintain the parklets, at least temporarily, but hopefully indefinitely. Thank you, I cede the rest of my time. Thank you, Britt. The next speaker is Pamela Miggs, followed by Liesl Blush, followed by Deborah Benson. Pam, you're unmuted now. Okay. Um, so today, Stephen and I, we went down there and hung out and we walked a lot around the whole area and got a whole image. I've been on the fence about what to do about Bolinas, but I got very clear and started thinking about what is best for the town. And being living in the Cascade, there's, you know, what a few thousand people on this side, we have to get out in a fire. I am at the point now, unless you have parklets that could be flattened or moved, like on Fred Elysio's, they did an awesome job. They don't have tops on them. They just have a platform. You can move that stuff out and then your fire trucks and whatever could get out of there. So I'm at this point of saying, I don't think you should have partlet, uh, parklets on Bolinas. Secondly, we walked around Amelie, it was mobbed. The, the seating was not all six feet apart. That was, it was full inside and people were outside. It, it's really congested. Nobody had masks. I don't know what to do about that. I want the businesses to survive, but it, it, it just didn't, it wasn't working. Now, I also wanna talk about parking spaces and also handicapped parking spaces. Um, and it's true, there's about 20 parking spaces. These are the critical parking spaces right out in front of the businesses. I don't know how that's working, but I, I would gather it's not working that well. There's only one handicapped place downtown and that's right near Mono. The other handicapped driving spot is up in the parkade. To me, that is just too far away for handicapped folks to get down near the businesses. Um, let me see, I wrote some notes. I, I suggested at some of the other meetings to maybe move the bicycle rack where the parklet is in front of the roasters to switch those. And I don't know if there was disagreement, whatever, but that would give access to possibly, if there was an emergency, you could clear that out. And then, um, let's see, what else? I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes so I don't forget anything. The mono, the mono parklet is mostly for beer drinking. I just wouldn't go there. I mean, I, I just, I'm too old to go there, I guess. And then, um, I really like what Patrice said about moving things up that have more people to talk to because it's like 1045 and I'm, I'm really exhausted. Um, and then I don't, I, I think that's pretty much where I'm at at the parklet on Bellinas. I, I want to promote businesses, but I cannot have that blocked with if they had to push them out of there to get out of there and let, you know, how many lanes of traffic to get out, you have to open that up. So thank you all. Thanks, Pam. The next speaker is Liesl Blush, followed by Deborah Benson, followed by Christine Kelly. Liesl, you're unmuted now. Hi. Um, so this is Liesl Blush, and again, downtown. So this is literally my backyard. And this last year has just made me so aware how much we really need to see each other and be able to gather safely. And I love walking by those parklets, even though I don't even actually use them that much. Um, I just walk downtown to see them because I like to see people gathered. Um, it really makes the town seem alive again. And we have such amazing weather. It's always seems strange to me that we don't have more outdoor dining and meeting spaces. I particularly love Mono Lot, which is a truly public space. You can go there with a cup of coffee and meet your friend who wants to have a beer and it all works out. Um, I really like that space midweek because it's mellow and quiet and it's a great place to just kind of hang out at a lunch break and then go back to work now that some of us are still working from home. Um, so I think we really need those public gathering spaces. So I'm fully in support of keeping Mono Lot and I really like the parklets too, although I attended the meeting last night with John Bella and I did I agree with some of his concerns about design standards and accessibility of the parklets. 
Um, I would like to see them open to the public and maybe a little bit less like in closed boxes. Um, I agree with Pam that Amelie is way too crowded. They're actually putting tables kind of like out on the sidewalk. I don't even walk through there anymore. I just walk the other way around the block. Um, I'm glad they're trying to do what they're trying to do, but it's it's like, I can see it like blocking people wanting to go into the shops up there even sometimes. Um, it's really popular. I mean, people love it. Um, the other thing is that the roofs do kind of block the sight line in a strange way. So I think this space is more integrated aesthetically um, than some of the others and it feels more open. Um, some of the others really do feel like these weird little sheds. Um, I'm really worried, I have to say, I'd love to know how fire safe those little pillars and heat lamps are right up under the roof of some of those spaces. Like I see those little flame pillars and I wonder like, is that is that even like, are they safe being under there in that enclosed structure? So I, I'd love to know more about that. Um, I would wanna mention that some of the retail spaces have actually for a very long time now used the sidewalk for their wares, particularly clothing stores. So there is a little bit of that going on even pre-COVID and that's continuing. So that, that's interesting thing to explore. It's not like no retail spaces have ever been able to use the sidewalk for displaying stuff. Although I understand that it may be hard if you can't see outside to have stuff outside that people could steal. Um, I also wonder, like I really want these parklets to stay but I am wondering what happened big fire. Like would they clear all the cars off of the street and then be trying to take those parklets off of Bolinas? Or you know, would they just be anticipating that we'd all get out you know, on those two lanes. Um, I'm curious if some of the parklets sort of more collapsible, like collapsible, I've seen collapsible bleachers before. Um, I do also wonder about the roastery swapping the space with the bike rack and, and whether that's even a possibility or not. Um, but like I said, I really like the roastery space the best besides mono lot. And um, so I'm up for these guys being there indefinitely. I think they're a good compromise for those who always wanted a pedestrian plaza and those who don't want Bolinas closed. But you know, we can work out some of the, the bumps, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. The next speaker is Christine Kelly, followed by Veronica Garrett. Um, there, you're unmuted now, Christine. You might need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Christine. Hmm. Oh, unmute. There we uh, go. Unmute. Hi, are you there? Do you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I didn't realize I had to unmute myself. Sorry. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much to the city council for your devotion. This is um, a serious long haul <laughs> meeting. <laughs> you guys are pretty amazing for staying in with us. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to say, I love the suggestions from one of the prior speakers. I think it was Brittany. I love how she suggested working with in conjunction with businesses. The, the part that, that was such an excellent idea about the 10% discount, sharing the space. Um, because I would hate to see any business not, you know, suffer from this. So I, I love that idea of collaboration. I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't see the safety issue um, just because, you know, for the fire, just because there aren't tons of them and there's nothing to say that there won't be any cars parked there anyway in case of an emergency, you know, God help us if we have that. Really, the only reason I wanted to talk today was because um, I just wanted to share how much I really loved the the parklets. I just feel like they're very community building. I I've really enjoyed meeting people out in the parklets. I feel like it creates a bit of a forum for people to meet, and I've personally just you know run into people and been able to socialize safely with people that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to run into or meet and encounter and just have made some great friends. I just feel like it really, I don't know, um, brings dimension to our culture. I mean, already Fairfax has been an amazing city without the parklets, but I just feel like it's an even, I don't know, how should I say it? it brings it more depth, more dimension, more culture, just, I don't know, I love them. Anyway, that's all. Thank you so much for um, 
hearing me speak and for staying awake so late and for all the work you guys do. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. The next speaker is Veronica Garretts, followed by Mallory Geithein, followed by Joe McGarry. So, Veronica, I've unmuted you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, Council. I really also appreciate how late you're up yet again. And I know, as Renee referred to, the meatiness of, of this topic as well as the next agenda item. And I know that some of you have lots of stresses in your life that you're still showing up through throughout. So thank you for being here and hearing us and continuing to be such amazing community servants. Um, Christina, it was really nice to hear you talk. I think that might be the first time I've gotten to hear you speak at a town council meeting. And I hope you call in more because you've got such a wonderful perspective and really it seems like you get Fairfax. Um, and why those parklets are just such an opportunity to definitely foster community. I feel so excited to drive through town right now or bike through town or walk. Um, it's, it, it is alive in a safe way outdoors. We don't know when we're gonna have to be outside again without being able to go into restaurants. And I think it's just, it's the way of the future to keep outdoor dining and supporting our restaurants available. And I also really appreciate um, Britt's comments earlier about collaborating between the businesses. I'm, sh I'm sure there's some creative opportunities that uh, the, the ones that were identified seem like if, if the, the businesses are open to it or alternatives that they might have that we haven't heard yet. Um, and I also appreciate the opportunity to see the artistic architecture of some of the parklets. It feels like an opportunity to see that part of Fairfax's culture, the artists. Um, come back out more, you know, the coffee roasters parklet is so precious. Um, yeah, so I am definitely in favor of indefinite extension of the parklets and I, I hear the concerns of some of the businesses and hope that there's an opportunity to get everybody's needs met. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. The next speaker is Mallory, followed by Joe McGarry, followed by Ryan Poindexter. Mallory, I've unmuted you. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I absolutely disagree with the other people who just spoke. Um, I think it's dangerous. I watch the news every night. A lot of these um, uh, on the news, there are parklets being hit by cars and SUVs. And um, I just think it's dangerous for that reason. I also think it's dangerous because bulliness is the way out of town for most people. And it's going to be hard enough just the way it is, um, we, you know, we, even without these parklets. And it's going to make it worse. I think the, the roastery, I mean, it's so, so big. And um, I'm not a, at all in favor of the parklets. They, they close down the streets. They just make the whole thing um, not feel airy, not feel light. If you're going to do it, which you probably might, because I hardly ever get agreed with here, but um, then make them much smaller, make them the size of a small little table and let people do it without uh, something above their heads, because it just closes in the town, I think, way more than it needs to. Um, I don't think it's fair for the other shops. I don't think the idea of Putting, unless somebody really wants to, like the Tibet, Tibetan store wants to put a rack of things that aren't that expensive out, they, that's fine. But I don't think somebody should be negotiating to have people do that so that their store can be looked at by other people who, after losing a bunch of parking spaces anyway, which we should, we don't need to lose any more parking spaces. Um, the tops on these things are closing in things. The, the, uh, the parts of themselves are closing in things. It's gonna make it more congested. Um, I like the idea of mono, as long as you can figure out a better way to do the parking there, because I don't know how people get in backwards or whatever um, down the street at mono. But um, if you wanna, you know, keep, keep it a community thing, then put benches and, and little plants outside the stores, but you don't 
I don't think need to make parklets. It's, I think it's really, really unnecessary. I also want to say that the person who says um, that she was talking about prioritizing um, agendas, I've been saying that for, I don't know, a bunch of years. I would like to see something like this happen in the beginning instead of at 1045 at night. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. The next speaker is Joe McGarry, followed by Brian Poindexter, followed by, by a telephone caller, the only one at the moment. Joe, I've unmuted you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, good evening, Council. Yes, and um, yeah, thank you so much for being here and, and for your service. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think I enjoy the parklets. Um, and um, I just want to bring up a, a, a different perspective in terms of um, seeking um, feedback from community and business owners. And I think it's important to tap into getting the experience of the folks who are actually working um, in, in the restaurants and coming to the tables and serving them. I, I personally felt uncomfortable at times because it, it was almost like a, um, a, a non-consensual mask lifting and you know having staff from the restaurants coming to the table masked and and as an eater you don't have a mask so um i'm not sure where folks sit right now with that but i i think that's an important piece and and once again i'll just you know remind that that group may be hard to reach so it might be a, some more effort required rather than some of the normal mechanisms to to get their feedback. Um, and yeah, and just in terms of, you know, a lot of talk about safety and, and just the, the the safety of that workplace and um, restaurant work is hard work. Um, and when you're extending, bringing plates out across sidewalks to more distant tables, um, I would just be I'd like to hear um, or have those folks um, who are working the restaurants be given the opportunity um, to, to, to share their experience of the parklets. Um, yeah, and, and just a thought about the, um, the, those in town who are merchants and provide services and, and maybe haven't been given the same, um, I don't know, aid, I guess, in, in terms of what, what the parklets have provided to the restaurants. Um, and, I, and I go back to the March 17th meeting, um, the, the mid-year um, budget um, presentation. And I think there was a, a forecast of maybe as much of a, as a half a million dollars being added to the uh, general um, reserve, general fund reserve. Um, and that was fueled by about, I think, $350,000 in unforeseen sales tax. And I think a lot of that probably was driven by um, online sales, probably Amazon. And maybe some of that came at the expense of some of those merchants. So maybe rather than putting it right back in the general reserve fund, maybe some of that money could be used to help out the merchants um, for some of their hardships that they've experienced um, and, and be given uh, um, some assistance in that way. Thanks. The next speaker is Brian Poindexter, followed by the phone caller, followed by Kelsey Fernandez. And Brian, you're unmuted. Good evening, Council. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, just heartened again by a, a, a good discussion, I think, um, for our town to hear um, different sides well represented without, I think, some of the, the bitterness that's marked other discussions. And so I'm I'm feeling a lot of confidence from that and our ability to have a solid public discourse. Um, I, I wanna underscore and, and fully co-sign on what Joe just brought to the table. I think the, the voices of staff at restaurants are really important in this time. And it's a safety concern that I don't think should uh, go unaddressed. I think my primary point around safety um, in general is, is maybe more separating um, enforcement from the policy that we're considering now. I think we can maintain parklets in this town until September 
and choose different mechanisms for enforcement that are in line with what the broader county is doing. Dr. Willits at Marin County level is giving, I think, superb guidance based on science about what capacity levels should be at these parklets. Um, and I think there are additional ways of enforcing um, that may, may keep staff safe. For instance, requiring people to wear masks uh, when um, servers are visiting tables. Um, but the parklets can still remain and be enforced in a different way to create that sense of safety. Um, so I, I think I just wanna close with the idea that if that's true, what, what do the parklets mean for me, for Fairfax symbolically? It's, it's been a beacon of hope really for me of a vision of our town that actually feels in some ways stronger uh, as a result of how we've responded to pandemic. That's brought us outside more, that's brought us together more in some ways. Hopefully those are safe ways. Um, and the parklets represent for me a, a way of being stronger after and a projection of ourselves into the future. So if there's a way of keeping folks safe while the parklets continue to exist, I'd be strongly in favor of it. Uh, it makes me believe in, in a brighter tomorrow. Thanks, I see the rest of my time. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, the next speaker is the telephone caller. Uh, followed by Kelsey Fernandez, followed by Brenna Gubbins. So uh, the telephone caller, I've unmuted you. You might need to unmute yourself. Which you do by pressing... Star six. Star six, there we go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. All right. Hello, Council. Uh, my name is Will Hubert, and I'm just calling in this evening uh, to say thank you for being here and um, and also just to echo my support for the parklets. Um, really, for me, I, I think so much about how our society has been like framed around um, uh, driving places, and it's so nice to have incentives uh, to walk and to be out in community. And I just wanted to say um, until September, as it starts to heat up, while parking is an issue, um, less parking in that zone means less congestion during hot summer days and um, maybe a cooler downtown Fairfax. So I just want to say thank you um, for hearing me out and I see you the rest of my time. Hey, uh, the next speaker is Kelsey Fernandez, followed by Brenna Gubbins, followed by Deborah Benson. Kelsey, I've unmuted you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Kelsey. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, so I attended the Chamber event last night and it was really nice to hear actually about some of the creative ways to enhance the use of the public space. However, I do hope that it's not a foregone conclusion to allow the outdoor bar in mono lot over the summer. Uh, there's gonna be a lot more kids that are out of school and hanging out and the skate park is really close to that location. Um, public health officials know that community norms and the environment impacts underage drinking. And I know that you're all aware based on the rates that we have in our community here, that our, we as adults are already failing our kids in this area. This council has been really receptive in the past to considering policy that supports environmental prevention efforts related to underage substance use. And I hope you will earnestly consider what is best for the young residents in our community over the next three months when it comes to this as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Hey, the next speaker is Brenna Gubbins followed by Deborah Benson. Brenna, I've unmuted you. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for hanging in there. Um, okay, I just wanted to reiterate what I wrote in my emails to you guys. Um, after the last meeting, I spoke with 22 businesses who at the time had not spoken with anyone from town regarding the parklets or how they were doing during COVID. Um, and I feel it's really important to hear from the businesses before you make a decision to extend the permits. Um, once you get an, 
the info back from the questionnaire, then, then you can make an informed decision. Um, I just think it's really important to hear from everyone. Uh, let's see. And uh, thanks, Britt and Lisa. I think it was Liesl for the ideas. Um, once COVID is over, I think we'll all be in a better place to, to um, do things to promote one another. And we pretty much do that now. We're all very friendly, like, hey, go, you should check this place out and this place. You know, we're all promoting one another, definitely. Um, but doing discounts at this time, you know, especially during COVID is a little bit hard. So I think we all just need to get back on our feet and it's been a little tough. And um, one last thing, we need to have a resolution for the parking before we extend or before you extend the permits. Um, Bank of America is gonna be open soon as is the movie theater. So a lot of um, people park there and use that, um, but that won't be available. So. It's just something to think of and I know a lot of I know the parking is bleeding out into the neighborhoods which is upsetting the residents so hopefully we can figure something out all right thanks guys thanks for listening okay. have a good night thank you very much the next speaker is Deborah Benson followed by Richard Applebaum Deborah, you're, I'm, I've unmuted you. You're unmuted, yes. Thank you, Michelle. You know, I was in line after Liesl about seven speakers ago, so I've been kind of like raising my hand, lowering it, trying to be heard. So I'm appreciative to finally being heard. Um, I've lived here for a really long time. In the past few years, uh, Fairfax has really become a destination resort for tourists. You know, it used to be when you went downtown, there were people who lived here. Now there are people who live here and there are a lot of people who don't live here. I was running for council in 2017 and, and I stood in the parkade handing out my little homemade leaflets. And, and when people came across, I said, hey, do you live in Fairfax? And about 90% of them said no, or I wish I did. So we have a lot of people uh, who we are serving from out of town. There are a limited number of public parking spaces. Um, I hear that we're only taking 20 with these parklets, but there are also the parking spaces that are being taken by uh, the private lots, um, turning them into their, into their uh, restaurant lots. Um, I, I, I'm really against extending these parklets. You know, that it's been said by some of the business owners that the parklets and the parked cars along Bolinas Road are the same deal in case of fire. I don't think that's true. I think that if there's a fire that's noted, everybody who has a car park downtown is gonna get into it and leave as fast as they can. And that street's gonna be empty for the people who are evacuating from the Cascades. The parklets are another story. This is a temporary measure. It benefits the restaurants. Uh, when they do not have indoor dining, they will soon have indoor dining. And um, I think that this uh, public, uh, private use of public space should not be continued. Um, I've heard people speak tonight who live in San Geronimo Valley who are in favor of the parklet, someone who lives downtown, not along the escape route. I do live in a place where I have to escape along that route. Um, I think that this served the people well, uh, considering it until September is fine. Stop it right there. Mono lot is a parking lot. Uh, we don't need it as a public gathering space. Um, and uh, retail can't double staff for putting, putting uh, uh, spaces on the street. They need somebody to watch the product. And uh, retail is really being hurt by the parking spaces being taken up. People don't come and park three blocks away and walk into their stores. They want to have a place that's nearby. Uh, and, and so with the restaurants, my time is up. Thank you for hearing me. Thanks, Deborah. <clears throat> and uh, the last speaker is Richard Applebaum, 
You are unmuted now. Thank you. Um, I really wish seating your time was a thing because I would happily take everyone's seated time because I have lots to say. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's been a very interesting following public uh, discussion on um, social media and a lot of the comments tonight. And I've really been thinking about this a lot. And um, there's no secret for those who have followed my comments for the last number of years and going back long before we were talking about Bolinas Road narrowings um, due to anything around parklets and, and COVID related. And I wanna just say for the entire community because the word safety has come up a lot. And I just wanna kind of articulate that we're not, the folks that have been talking about half the town lives on the other side of the 7-Eleven past Park Road. And, and so when we talk about safety, we're talking about what happens if big fire vehicles or special equipment or ambulances or police or uh, need to get through and we're also you know in a hurry and they're rounding those those corners and we're also talking about you know intense evacuation um, uh, and so that's that's we're not we're not talking about like how close people are together sitting on a park lead or who has masks on or off outside and, and all of that but I've been listening a lot because there is something that I've been hearing and I, I do feel resonance with it about sort of, and I know that um, Council Member Goddard and, and, and others have had a sort of notion of other visions for how space could be and gathering. And there's, there's a lot behind that as well. And I'm, I'm very, very sympathetic. I'm feeling a lot of those things as well. I don't know if parklets exactly is the solution or the ones we have now or the way they're implemented now is but I'm, I'm a big fan of benches and ways that people can sort of congregate. There's a reason that Good Earth uh, has so much gathering as it does. Um, you know, it's not just, oh, go get your groceries and leave. And it's because they have those seating areas in the front and in the back, and it creates a thing. And I, I'm, I really enjoy that as well. I also love Amelie, by the way. But um, so, um, one thing we've never heard in any of these meetings, and it would influence me a lot because I'm concerned about the safety as all the other folks have been. I'm one, one of these people on this side of things, but I've never heard um, a fire chief or police chief or uh, ambulance dispatches talk about whether they feel um, it's safe or not. And I'd be a little more open to toying around with uh, Bellinas, if I, if I could hear um, from those experts and what their concerns, if they have them are about evacuation and emergency vehicles on the parking thing. Um, you know, we could, we could add some handicapped parking in places that they aren't now and with some of the remaining uh, street parking. And I believe there's some very, very solvable creative solutions that could happen to use other parking, particularly from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, Fairfax Market, Fairfax Lumber, other places, but it needs really, really clear signage. So I think there's some solvable things. I'm definitely pro uh, things that promote gathering and openness and liveliness. And I think there's been an activation that people have felt and I resonate with that. I know everyone doesn't, I do. Um, and it's balancing that out um, between safety. And the last thing I want to get in, I know I'm a little over my time, is just I, I'm also very sympathetic to all the businesses. And so as long as we could remain sensitive and make sure that businesses aren't being penalized or hurt while others are being um, uh, supported. Um, so I would just take a page out of Councilmember Goddard's playbook of saying that we can be creative and we can talk to each other as we have been. And I've been very happy that there's been less acrimony on this topic, even though everyone's not in agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Chance? Yeah, if uh, you're closing the public comment, Mayor. Um, oh. Well, there, there are, I believe, two more anyway. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they, they, there's, there's always a few more after we say that's the last of them. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Mark Bell, followed by Jerry Kelly. Uh, Mark, you're unmuted. Thanks, Michelle. I think the, having the park lit until we can consider COVID over with is fine. However, beyond that, especially on Bolinas, I believe they need to go. Uh, one of the reasons is it's extra square footage for the business. So that's town space. So are we gonna be paid rent after COVID 
for any parklets that are still available, still operating uh, at that time. Secondly, as far as even now them being safe, it's really absurd. There's the distance between tables, uh, maybe from the center of a table to the center of another table is six feet, but you really you're just deluding yourself if you think that you're safe. I'd like to thank the police department for uh, following through from the last council meeting and making it be known that amplified music in the lower mono lot is not allowed. That's been great. Uh, we've heard we've heard kids uh, having fun up at the skateboard park, which is fine because they're not amplified, and we don't hear any amplified music from the mono parking lot, which is really helpful. Uh, aside from that, I think really what you're looking at is it's COVID time. We have to make uh, uh, you know do what we can for our business community, but after it's over. A lot of these parklets, if not all of them, need to go, or they need to be smaller, or they need to be rethought. But uh, to have it continue as is right now, uh, I think is absurd. And if you're going to keep them there, uh, again, uh, as I think Richard brought up about contacting the fire department and seeing what their comment is, uh, you know, I mean, like the police department wasn't even contacted on the cascade restriping. You'd think that you would contact the fire department to see what they think about evacuation because otherwise this whole wildfire prevention program is absurd it doesn't mean anything so like so like maybe your house uh will will survive or it might burn less quickly but then if you're jammed in downtown and you get fried down there what's the difference you're still broiled meat so that's it Thank you, Mark. The next speaker is Jerry Kelly. And you are unmuted, Jerry. Okay, great. Good evening, ladies and gents. Jerry Kelly here. Thanks for having us. Um, I, I am pro uh, parklets. I think they're absolutely amazing. I work downtown. I have a business downtown, a retail store. I'm next to the coffee roastery. I am out on the street five days, six days a week. And I see the vibrancy, the community. I see what the parklets have brought downtown and people stopping, people meeting down there, people who haven't seen each other in months and years and school friends who've like come across each other down in the parklets. It's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and also, you know, there's people down there who down there every day. So there's guys I know, because I'm out in the parklets regularly, who are older folks and are part of the AA community. And over COVID, they couldn't even go to their meetings. And these guys are not the type of people who are gonna do Zoom meetings. And they'd meet down that way and kind of kept themselves sane. It's been a godsend for them. And yeah, I just, there's nothing but, uh, you know, uh, positivity, I think, for the parklets. It brings such a, a vibrancy to the town. I have friends who come over from the city, from out of town. It's it's amazing. So uh, that's that's basically all I can say. And, and I know some people say it's safety and so on. There is cars parked down there. And even if people are having to get through town, I can't see all the cars getting out of the way. And yeah, I, I think they should stay there forever. It's like, it's like it brings like a European vibe to our beautiful, amazing town. And that's, that's me. That's it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I do not see any more speakers, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Okay, so we will now close public comment. Chance? Thank Sorry. you, Mayor. I, I had, okay, so I've been taking serious notes. But before I give my comment, which I would like to give, I just wanted to ask Garrett, um, because I brought this up in a meeting with him this week, about the opinion of FIRE with regard to EVAC and parklets. And he gave me a response in my private meeting with him, but I was hoping that he could relay that response in this meeting, given that <clears throat> interest. Oops. Sure. And, and the response is also in the staff, the written staff report. But fire and PD consider the parklets the same as vehicles parking in the spaces. So the impact is the same. Great. 
Thanks. I uh, appreciate that. Okay, so um, I have a couple comments that I want to make. And prior to the comments, I want to lay out. Cuchano, could I ask one follow up question of the town manager on that issue? Sure. And I'm not sure if Garrett knows the answer, but it's been my understanding from the fire guys that if there's cars in the way, they will push them out with an out of the way with an engine as long as there's no people there. Um, that's what they've told me that cars in the way they just push it out of the way with the engine. If it's now I don't think they would do that with a parklet because there will be people sitting there and they will kill people. So did you have any discussions about that issue or is this kind of a new thing? And I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, uh, Councilmember Catrano, it just seemed like that's sort of a related issue. Uh, I would have to ask him. I mean, typically that's more like if you're on the hillside and there's a car right there and you're trying to get to something, you would push it away. Similar to if there's a car parked in front of a fire hydrant, you would break the windows and pull the holes through the winch through the windows. So I, I think that's a little more isolated. I don't think if you had 10 cars parked on Bolinas, the fire engine would be able to push all the cars. If you had that much time, we would just get the backhoe and move them. But if you had that much time, then you would zoom you could tow it or just contact the owners. But that being said, I could talk to the chief. Okay, thank you. And I, I would presume that um, if, if it were a dire emergency to the extent that an engine would be pushing cars that people probably wouldn't stay seated in their spots enjoying their coffee uh, at a parklet. So that's just a, an assumption I'm making, but I, I would love to hear more about that too, Garrett. Um, so a couple things I wanted to lay out. Um, one, as Garrett mentioned, we missed the yellow tier. So we're continuing to, to move you know, the, the timelines around a little bit. So there's still some uncertainty, but um, a couple things have happened in the recent weeks and months that are worth noting. One, um, looking at the regional effects of what we're talking about, uh, I did reach out to a number of neighboring communities in Marin to get a sense of what their thoughts are about timeline uh, as it relates to COVID recovery, as it relates to the fact that the public really enjoys community and being out. Um, and so it, in addition to San Rafael, which is already extending theirs until November of 2022, we also saw Mill Valley take a similar approach just in the last week um, that they're going to be extending until November 2022 as well. Uh, San Anselmo and Corte Madera are, are also um, definitely considering uh, longer extensions, even though Corte Madera has until the end of the year. Um, but that, that conversation will come up again. And um, I attended the, the countywide meeting about that John Bella also spoke at with a number of, the, of other municipalities that was hosted by MCCMC. I wasn't sure if other council members were there, but um, that, that was really helpful as well to get a sense of things. And the final thing I wanted to say is like the groundwork for thinking about this um, is the fact that uh, the chamber, council member Goddard and myself took uh, several hours of our Friday to um, honor Brenna's request and to literally canvas the entire town. Um, David, David covered one side and we covered another side. David uh, went to 18 places, Renee nine, myself 15, and together Renee and I also went to five places uh, for a total of 47. Did skip a couple places that were closed. I uh, just wanted to note that. Um, did not, I didn't end up stopping at the roastery, but we did get um, some information from the roastery folks last night at the chamber meeting. Uh, and I also didn't stop at the scoop, given how popular it was at the time, nor did I stop at Gear and Gelly's. It was closed along with Hummingbird at the time when I was walking through. Um, but uh, did flyer uh, numerous places and also speak with both retail and restaurant owners, uh, as well as members of the public that were just out and about. Uh, and that is all informing me as I'm thinking about this tonight. Also cruising through tonight and seeing people, if there was parking during the farmer's market and things like that, just because we were getting some feedback about that. And I wanted to see, and um, when I cruised through the farmer's market area, there were five 
uh, at least five parking spots in the parkade. There were about 10 people at the Coffee Roastery Parklet, just members of the public. And then also at Mono Lot, eight people, including a, a young family with strollers and stuff like that. So it, was, it wasn't just a, a party, at least uh, this evening. But I know people do like to enjoy the Mono Lot, no doubt. Um, so with all of that, I also wanted to say I reached out to ABC. I talked to Santa Rosa, uh, Santa Rosa um, Alcoholic Bev Beverage Control uh, twice today to get their timeline for things that could affect the mono lot. Uh, because as you all may know, ABC uh, 218 permit for COVID-19 is what allows the Gestalt House to use that adjacent public space in order to uh, have patrons that consume alcohol uh, in, in the Fairfax Plaza, what is called the Fairfax Plaza temporarily. So that's some of the work that went in. Um, in I'm sorry. Real Chance, could you repeat that? I am starting to fade here because of the, the hour. What did ABC say? I, well, I'll get to the mono lot thing in a minute, but I, I'm just letting you know I reached out to mono or reached out to ABC today to get their sense of their timeline for that those types of permits that allow Gestalt House to do that. The long short is that those permits are going to uh, presumably end when the tier system ends. So it's something I was gonna bring back around as far as like the timeline for the mono lot and its current iteration, there's, once that ends, that, that, that ends. Stall House couldn't use the lot like that anymore uh, mm -hmm. to address, I think a question that uh, Kelsey brought up. Um, That's so, June 15th right now? Uh, they're thinking That's June. what the governor's saying. It could change, right? Correct, but they said there's generally speaking they're looking at June for the end of uh, of that or phasing out of that, and they said there will be circumstances where businesses, where appropriate, could reapply. But that was I just wanted to get a sense of ABC's timeline, knowing that the permit out there was contingent, and we actually don't have a permit, mm -hmm. or you know we just have this sort of agreement with the chamber. Um, so that's the monolot thing. I, we could hash that out again later, but I feel like that becomes more of a moot point if ABC is really controlling the timeline for what's allowed there. Um, but anyway, the thing I really wanted to get to is the where we are as it relates to the TEPs and the TUPs, considering the things that I spoke of a moment ago. So one, I think there's uh, a lot of support from people and businesses about these, these TUPs, TEPs, um, despite the, the issues that have come up, and there are issues that have come up, but um, even some of the businesses that have emailed hope to find workable solutions that allow for people and community to come together and for businesses to benefit and for the spillover effect to, to help some of the retail shops. And I did receive that feedback from multiple retail shops when I was canvassing that the spillover effect was, was noticeable. And they felt for the, for the other shops that, that didn't have that same bump, but I think maybe there's something workable there. Anyway, so the next thing is the problems. Totally, there are problems, especially for me, design issues related to Village Saki and Amelie. Amelie totally blocks live water. Village Sake has uh, not only this opacity issue, as John Bella refers to it, where you literally cannot see through that building and there's like a public safety issue there, but there's also the question of the step up to actually access their, their parklet. Um, and so there are some concerns for me about, and the encroachment to the neighboring business as well. Uh, and that was their, that's their bad. They, they did that all super quick. And, um, and so there are a couple design issues there. However, uh, also talking to some of the other businesses from an equity perspective, there are some places in town in doing that canvassing that are saying, if there was some certainty, you know, this summer about the ability to make an investment, maybe we would want to help foster that community spirit. And that's, I come from volunteer board onto the council. So it's all about good fostering goodwill and community spirit in the town of Fairfax. And these businesses were totally, um, there were, there were several that said they wanted to do that. If there was some certainty around the ability to do that for this summer into the fall or whatever. So with the challenges that we're facing from the current places that aren't 
looking as good as they could or aren't supporting their neighbors as well as they might want to. And the fact that there are some other businesses that might want to imagine what they could do if they had the timeline. I'm thinking that the three month extension, those cup Amelie and, and village sake aren't going to just start reinvesting and making changes. If those, to those quick fixes, which would be a shame because there are some real issues there and the businesses will continue to suffer. Uh, so I'd rather see those fixes made. Um, the other thing I would like to see what those other, the other businesses that want to take advantage of these types of permits, what, what they're capable of and to help support them as well. And I think both of those require a return on investment, like a, some sort of certainty. And so I don't think the three month extension is appropriate. I think it misses the mark. I think the real mark is to maybe not to follow the lead of San Rafael and Mill Valley and, and go out to the end of 2022. That seems ridiculous, like too far, too uncertain, but to match up the way that council, that vice mayor Hellman um, and skate for Fairfax community position things by saying, yes, it's part one part COVID recovery two part this concept of the public good and getting people outdoors and supporting health and, and having that go until hopefully, you know, we could always revisit it, but having that go until May and all of these things that we're doing to support folks go until May of next year, that seems more appropriate. If we're going to really say, Amelie, you got to, you got to change that. You got, we have to either shrink it or move it a little bit because live water needs support and they, they didn't sign up for this. Uh, although they want to su obviously support their neighbors. And the same is true for Village Saki and the fact that they need to make changes, but I doubt they'll make those changes if it's just a three month extension. Um, so there's that. The other thing, survey. I think that the survey wouldn't really give us the data we want if it's coming out in the next week and it lasts for the month of May. It doesn't really tell us much about the differences um, like as businesses, like businesses will still be in the yellow tier, presumably, or even the orange tier, hopefully not, but it won't tell us what we want to know about changes in uses, the changes in business, the changes in parking, that, that's all hap we're literally in May right now. Um, so I don't think that that survey is, I think that misses the mark the same way that the three month extension misses the mark. And I think what I would really want to know from a survey is not only like additional challenges that businesses and residents want to talk about, but also the, the post COVID recovery bit. And I think the, all of these things together speak to a longer term extension. Uh, and that's, that's where I wanted to start the discussion. The other thing, again, I'll just reiterate, I think it's a little moot point about the mono lot as far as like extending it because it's controlled by ABC. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, that's the gist, but I'm super excited about um, community. I'm excited about the fact that people have come on here and shared that they want to see more aliveness downtown. And I wanted to end with this quote from an Adrian Marie Brown book, which says, how would we organize and move our communities if we shifted to focus on what we long for and love rather than what we're neg negatively reacting to? And it goes on to say that, um, you know, a no is, is often justified, but it doesn't get us anywhere. But yes has a future. And I think with the enjoyment and the community that comes from these parklets, I really think that there's a yes there and we can get to it. And we have to just give it a little more time and, and come together and work on it instead of just saying no. And uh, that's where I'll leave it for now. Thank you, Chance. Stephanie? Um, wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Council Member Kuchana. That was, that was great. Um, I have some responses and questions for you um, that I'll weave into um, my thoughts. I, I just want to echo a lot of the comments and I think sentiment. Um, I think all of us remember that really grim, dark, period when you could walk down Bolinas, you know, and there's just no cars and it was just so, it was a ghost town for um, a short while. And it was, it was frightening to me and really sad. And 
what these, um, they're not actually parklets. <laughs> so I've learned from, I can tell from Renee's so like they're not parklets. Um, thank you, John Bella, for all of your education on that. Um, but these build outs, whatever you, you want to call them, um, how they've offered, um, you know, life support to the restaurants. Restaurants have such thin margins. We have, um, a restaurant owner in my family. So I'm, I'm really sensitive to that. And just like everyone has said, not everyone, but many people have said the vibrancy and the life and how um, it really supports community building. Um, and I, my, me and my family have enjoyed um, them quite a bit. So I see so much value in them. That said, I've been doing a lot of due diligence of my own, and there are there's considerable suffering, like businesses hanging on by 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 a thread, and I strongly believe that we need a parking solution that we need to discuss this evening, and I have a lot of concerns about making a decision and voting on this in the absence of a robust questionnaire. So the feedback that you know all of us have been getting um, is not complete, and it's I don't think it's enough. You know, a lot of a lot of business owners I know are have not spoken openly because I think they're concerned about. Um, they want anonymity when they provide their feedback. So I so appreciate you all walking around, but um, I happen to know that business owners are not always going to speak candidly to local government about this, you know, and um, I'm of the opinion we need that survey. And I, you know, I, I also want to talk about um, parking because if June 15th opens up, I mean, I had a restaurant owner tell us that he's had customers say, I circle around three times and I can't find the spot and I leave. Um, so if June 15th we open up, that just exacerbates the parking problem. And I think there's some creative you know, solutions out there. And I really like your quote, Chance. Um, uh, so I, I would love a discussion on that. I think there's, um, for in the, in the evening hours, after the business hours, you know, could we look at, um, I don't know if it's the Bike Museum or Fairfax Lumber, but there's plenty, you know, B of A, like, how can we use, there, there are spaces, but, um, so I, I would really appreciate um, a discussion on that. And I'm not really clear on what we're saying. If we do vote tonight, I'm not clear at all on what we're saying, that the two or three that are in violation and need to make a change, what are we saying? Are we saying, are we giving them a time limit to make changes? Like what, I'd like some discussion on that too. Um, and then there's the delivery truck. So I understand Cisco has threatened not to come to Fairfax anymore. And so, I mean, that's, that's problematic. So um, that's, Sorry to be a negative Nelly, but there's, these are real issues that um, it's not, it's, we've given a lot of support and I love, I love these build outs and um, I want to support them because I think they've done a great, a great service to our community, um, but not everybody is thriving and not everybody is happy and we need, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We need the survey and we need to address those issues that, um, I've raised. Barbara. <clears throat> thank you both. And thank you, Chance and Renee and David Smadback for serving the businesses. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, 
last year when we started this before council member Catrano was on the council, um, we thought we were looking at three months and everyone who went ahead and built those streeteries, parklets, whatever we're gonna call them, um, went into it with the idea that maybe ex with the exception of one business who has a campaign to keep it permanent, um, that this was temporary. And I also know, and I'm a little confused, you mentioned Corte Madera. Corte Madera doesn't have a town center and I'm there a lot. And the only thing I've ever seen in Corte Madera is uh, kind of a use that's already been there for Cafe Verde. You might be, maybe you're referring to Larkspur, but um, I don't remember Corte Madera having a town center, so I'm not sure where these streeteries are or parklets because basically they have the shopping malls. But regardless of that, um, Larkspur, which I'm there a lot, basically has three. Um, and San Rafael, which is a much bigger town than ours, does not have that many. I have not been to Mill Valley to actually check theirs out, but I do know, at least reading the paper, that there was a lot of discussion from retailers with concerns about some of the closures and such. So um, I want to echo what Vice Mayor Hellman has said. You know, when this started, I raised the issue of the other retailers. I was very concerned that glad that we were doing something for the restaurants, but concerned about the retailers. And for a while, the retailers were completely shut down. So there was nothing happening. But um, I feel that last time, um, okay, so I feel that we've heard from various people. I also think that there are businesses that do not want to step out here because, and raise their concerns in public because there is a lot of feeling that you know this is a european vibe and it's really enlivened our town we have more than any other town that i've been to um, and we have a pretty small town so i was supportive of moving forward through september and through september 7th and i'm not supportive of moving forward through next may I think we need to do the survey. I think we need to do a better job of really hearing from folks. Now, will people actually respond to us? We don't know. And I think we can revisit it. But the other piece I want to bring up is that there are folks who have spoken up who've had concerns about the streeteries, parklets, all this activity in Bolinas Road. And I do know that uh, something that's screwed together is pretty difficult to move, whereas a car is easier to move. I also know that even though we'd all love to be on our bikes, like Renee, who's our hero, who's everywhere on her bike, um, there's still gonna be a lot of cars and they may be more e-cars, but there still will be cars. So Alexander Binnick, uh, who lives on Meadow Way, um, and I guess was not able to join us, brought up the issue of the farmer's market and the parking issues. And my concern about the mono lot, and I think it's great that you reached out to ABC and it may be a moot point, is I think that lot is really difficult to get into now because you have to go into it the opposite way it is really centrally located. It could help some of the retailers. A lot of people don't want to walk from the parquet. I like a little free exercise myself, but um, you know, people want to be closer. And I think there are issues somebody raised tonight about the handicapped spaces that there's only one on Bellinas Road and that it might be sort of dangerous for people who have a walker or wheelchair to be sort of getting out there. So we, we lost 
the handicapped space in Mono Lot. Um, and I appreciate what Gestalt has, has said. I'm supportive of an extension through September 7th, no longer. I think we can always revisit this. But as I said at the last meeting, this is a change to our town. And I think we really need to have community conversations if we're going to be talking about extending these things much longer. Um, I don't think it's fair to the greater number of people in our town who haven't been engaged. And a lot of people have said, I'm fine with this during COVID. I may not be fine with it after. So I'd like us to be respectful of those folks and um, also really consider um, not having the mono lot for its current purpose, um, turning it back into a lot. And I did hear folks that really like it because it's more eager egalitarian, but I think we kind of need that lot, especially now that we have the skate park taking a few spaces. And I think we do need to think about folks who maybe can't walk that far. So those are my thoughts. And thank you guys again for all your hard work. I know you gave up a whole day to do that and you've given up more days. Thank you. May I ask a, a Quick question, uh, Chance. Thank you so much for all that research, and and Renee. Um, the the question I wanted to ask was for the I, I know that that uh, uh, Amelie is aware of the fact that their that their build out covers part of Live Water, and they've discussed that. Um, I'm not even sure whether, uh, what I'm asking is whether you discussed or whether anybody you know of has discussed with, uh, with um, Village Sake, the, the odd build of, of theirs, you know, that the fact that it looks like a box and it's kind of covered over, it looks like a little building basically, rather than an open air seating thing, it looks like a little building that was built out there. Um, are they aware of that and have they, do, do you have any indication that if there were a longer extension and therefore a longer return on invest, investment for them that they would change it or, or is that just a, a presumption or something we'd have to ask them about? Um, I, I mean, I can respond to that really yeah, briefly. They are aware of it. They've been told and they've heard the buzz in the community and they, um, I, I, you know, the reality is that this would not be sneaking up on them and saying, you know, you've done something wrong and they wouldn't be, you know, they're not gonna be shocked. Um, the, the reality about all of these things is that we have control <laughs> as the town, we did permit them. The, the guidelines were very clear in the permitting process that they needed to stay within their footprint that covers and, and fr affronts their, their window. So, um, you know, I, I, there, there are some, I guess I could start my comments here, is that there's nothing about this that's um, comfortable. Just like absolutely every single thing that we've been dealing with since last March 17th, there has not been one moment of comfort. Um, and um, I have thought about this way too much to the point where I have absolutely no idea if I'm going to get my thoughts out right now. But um, you know, this community is, um, is beyond passionate and has a, 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 a extraordinary number of stakeholders who care as one as much as the next. Um, I've, I've been hearing from retail, from restaurant, from service providers, from youth advocates, from the bars, from the residents, from all different ages, spanning all of Fairfax and West Marin and down the corridor through the Ross Valley about this town and each has a really, really positive, I mean, sorry, a passionate feeling about, um, about their piece of this and what they think is the best use for our streets and when it is the best use. Um, I, you know, I, I, have a, I have a lot of things to say, but I, I really wanted to just start with some of the things that I've seen 
um, since the shelter in place um, order has started to ease incrementally. Um, we all know that people are desperate to gather safely. Uh, they're looking for space to recharge and reconnect. Um, I've heard, I heard some of these things because I've attended about four, five hours of these workshops in the last two days. Um, one of the workshops I attended, the countywide one that Chance referred to, um, was a restaurateur who taught us that restaurant actually comes from the word restore. And I think that this outdoor dining experience has added what others have said, um, a vitality and restored the downtown and it's contributed to what I like to call the gross local happiness. Like in Bhutan, they have the, grace, the gross national happiness. And I think um, that happiness stimulates commerce. That's what we've seen. That's what we've seen through Streets for People. That's what we've seen through the art walk. When people come out and their creative juices are flowing and they check out a store and they go, wow, I never saw that before. This is the same thing that using our public spaces and creating ways that we might use our public spaces can stimulate economy. We know what happens when there's one car parked in one spot. And we know that 95% of the time that a car exists, it's parked. Nothing. 5% of the time that a car lives is spent in movement. Right now we have a mess, but you know what? We've had a mess um, since 10 years ago when actually council member Kohler, I found staff reports from 2012 um, from the uh, discussion that you had with Jim Moore and you were on a planning commission and you and Morgan Hall were the ad hoc subcommittee to explore this whole concept of a parklet pilot. Um, and right. the council was Larry Bragman and anyway, long story, but it sounds like it was an incredibly positive thing and there was full council consensus that this should be done and it, and it, and it, and it died in the staff report. <laughs> Cause then, you know, I, I just say it was a pilot and it was to be one that would be rotated around the town. Yeah. The other person was the owner of one, two, three Bolinas. Uh -huh. uh, and Morgan was going to design it, but it was to be a pilot and only one, and it would go move around. Right, totally. And and I'm only bringing it up because um, because that's what a parklet is. That was the vision for the use of the public right of way for the good of the whole community. It didn't belong to a restaurant. No one served drinks in the parklet it's the it, it's like what we were learning about from john bella so in san francisco and all over the world it's a private public partnership that ends up benefiting the entire community um, we're not quite there people were asking and john was talking about last night on the chamber meeting um, this idea of that that pilot would be a really awesome thing to do right now. And two of the businesses he asked, hey, would you, would you all be interested in doing this? It would be a shared kind of private public space at this point because businesses put a lot of investment in restaurants in their, in their outdoor dining eatery. Um, but but that, that's, a, that, that's something that I think is, you know, we can explore moving forward and it is a equitable use of the public right of way. My point was that we've been in a mess with parking forever and it only gets worse. Um, we, we haven't had a chance really to explore parking because there's been an extraordinary amount of pushback every time the word managed parking comes up. It's been on our council goals ever since I've been on, I think we took it off a few years ago because it just, we weren't gonna do it. Um, so um, council member, uh, vice mayor Hellman, absolutely doing something void of looking at how we're going to park for the people who need to park or the visitors that come in and really support our economy is vital to this conversation. But I don't at this point see it as a reason to interrupt a program um, that I think with some real work and a little more, maybe a lot more discomfort can land us somewhere that's going to work um, and be a win-win for everybody. Um, I will finish the things that I saw. I saw that we have unsheltered residents. Some of the folks that are unsheltered at this time are using the mono lot to drink coffee in the morning. 
I see people talking. They're not drinking beer in the morning. There's gatherings of people that I have never seen before. Some of the Victory Village residents are down in the mono lot enjoying their morning coffee. That's something I haven't seen. There's been, there is a marginalized group of folks that live in our town that basically hide out. That has been a silver lining for me. Um, I get that we have the late afternoon beer drinking and it becomes too visible and too prevalent downtown. It seems to take over, but I think there are ways that we can temper that. Some of that is by having a really good community conversation with various stakeholders. How about we, how about we, you know, first of all, I would hate to say, hey, it might be a moot point having that mono lot because ABC is not going to be allowing the Gestalt House to use the, 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 the alcohol license because that space could be used for something, you know, totally wholesome. You know, we've got yoga going on in the park that Veronica is teaching. We've got the skateboard up top, the skateboard park up top. Space, this creating and keeping space open for people will stimulate new and hopefully more and more wholesome activity for town, for our town, and for families who live in this town who want to use the downtown. Um, Relocalize things a little bit. Um, we have precious little public space and everybody loves it and wants its uses to be exactly what they believe are the best uses. So here's my suggestion. Um, I'm gonna suggest, and obviously Chance and I have spoken about this and worked on it. I have talked with businesses as Chance noted, uh, none of them were shy to tell me how they felt. Uh, I get it that they may not wanna speak on a Zoom call. I see where the concerns are. All we're concerned about uh, two of our retailers who are being, you know, whose view from the street is being blocked. But their own personal views were, wait, you're thinking about not keeping them? They were like, well, here's the problem here. Here's a problem here. But basically all supportive of going, hey, we're just not gonna shut down this thing. Let's see what's possible. So my, my recommendation is that we extend it for a year um, we find creative solutions for parking like we did when the parkade was closed. All of a sudden we figured it out. We scrambled and uh, we figured it out. And if you went back and asked people, I'd say people would, would say we're far better off for having done the work. Um, we need to deal with the non-compliant businesses. Vice Mayor Hellman, excellent point. How will we do that? I think we just have to do it because it's not okay that they're causing damage and harm to the other businesses adjacent. Um, we need to fix the loading zone. There is a loading zone place. It just hasn't been marked properly. Garrett and I spoke about it today um, so that Cisco can be directed better if the signage can actually be done the way it was supposed to have been done. And we can clearly mark that loading zone up on bank, not in the middle of Bank Street. That was not recommended by the traffic engineer. There is a place. We need to work on another ADA van accessible spot. We know that. There's possibility of another one in the parkade that would fulfill that requirement. I understand it's not perfect, but we need to be compliant. Um, and we have to come up with the design standards and guidelines, no doubt. Um, I don't think it's equitable to tell new businesses who want to join the party, like Mike Altman down at Iron Springs, that I'm sorry, it's closed and we're frozen for the next three months. Um, I think we need to keep it fair. One, two, three, Bolinas will probably come in and apply. We talk about connecting the east-west along the east-west corridor. Um, we need to create opportunities for newer businesses to apply for something, because doing nothing and taking disjointed baby steps makes for a patchwork physical environment. And, and we know that. It doesn't look so good on Bolinas right now, I have to say. It's serving a wonderful purpose for community, but it doesn't look great. Um, we can't connect east-west in three-month increments as businesses such as Iron Springs do not have the security that what they build or create will be allowed in the fall. Without creating consistent policy for the use of the downtown corridors, we still end up with inadequate parking um, in a car-centric, cultural, um, busy, busy street. So for walkability, bikeability, I, I, uh, I plead with you to allow for at least a little more time. The work that I, just stated, that I just mentioned can be done simultaneously with allowing these places to continue to exist and develop. Um, any new ones need all kinds of new rules, no roofs, um, no opacity, and they have to be done and started, we need to start the public-private conversation. But freezing it for me is, um, is, is a regression. 
And so that that's that's how I feel about it. Um, so that's me. Thanks. Can I ask clarifying questions of Renee? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for her impassioned speech. I love your passion. Um, so we have so much demand on staff, planning department in particular. So I guess I would like to urge us to put some timing parameters and not just say we'll get to it. Like I, I really want to hold us accountable and the businesses that are in violation, including the roastery, like we need to put timeframes on this um, for, for, for me to be comfortable and for to support the, the broader community that we've heard from um, that there's a safety issue with the roastery one. And we, we didn't talk about that one. But um, so I, I would really feel more comfortable if we said in the next 60 days, you need to do this or I mean, whatever we feel as a council is reasonable. Um, and then what else did you say that I wanted to, and, and the parking thing as well, I would like a commitment to have some creative solutions beyond the parking management. Cause we already have that in concept that we can, I guess, I, I don't know how detailed, um, staff has a plan for that, but I know it's been on the back burner for some time, but I, I would personally like some more creative thinking on that and a commitment to bring that back to the table too. Yeah, if I can just clarify in terms of the parking management, that, that, that's not in motion. There is no plan um, and that, that's a long discussion and a real parking um, survey is a, is a very expensive enterprise. So we have an informal parking count survey um, that actually Alec Schuldiner, who was um, assisting us in looking, you, you remember, um, Stephanie, um, you know, but that's his count. So um, th th that the parking is going to take some real creative conversation. And, uh, and, and yet, I think we have opportunities that we haven't explored. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't promise a timeline on that, but I would, um, in terms of talking about holding businesses accountable who've encroached. Uh, Garrett, I, I hope you can chime in here. Are you asleep? No, my computer wouldn't turn on. Maybe uh -huh. that means I was asleep. Um, so, so to chime in, I, I think one thing I, I didn't talk about is I did talk to Village Sake. Village Sake has talked to the urban, urban gardener urban garden um, and what they agreed on because he had some different ideas and he he had tried to reach out to her before but what she indicated back to him was that she had she hasn't noticed an impact yet so what they agreed that was that they would monitor it and that they would talk so if she found that there were some type of impacts then they might implement some additional changes that uh, the owner of Village Saki had proposed for her because he had done some different things graphically to show her what to be what could be done. So I think on that one, and granted, I'll follow up with her to make sure that's what she said. That's what I read, but just to make sure that's what she meant. Um, so that that I think that addresses that relationship. But what does it do with John Bellow mentioned last night, Village Sake's um, opaqueness is not, um, it's in violation of what these things are supposed to be. And also the step up, which is completely not appropriate for accessibility. Um, those things have to be fixed right away. And well, all they need to do is take those shades off but they need to build something to remove that step up that is going to be an accessibility issue. Right. Well, that that's on them. The ADA ADA compliance. Well, wait a minute. It's not on them. No, because I mean we could ask them. That that is they're responsible for that, not us, because that's a private structure and he needs so, to make it. ADA. But so have I we told them that they need to remove those shades 
and that they need to fix that step up. Yeah, for the blinds, we said you need to you need to pull the blinds up. I, I get it; it's hot there, but again, it's the 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 visibility issue. But I understand. I think if the council's direction and and to set aside whatever staff needs to do, what we need is just the the base direction on what you want to do. I get it. You want us to talk to Village Sake. That's not a problem to address those issues. I understand that. What the core issue is, are you telling, is the direction, if you do that, we'll do this? Or is it, hey, in these next three months, we'll, I guess what I'm looking for is just the direction, the key direction regarding the extension. I guess if you could put different caveats, that's fine. But as staff, I get it. You correct situations, but more importantly, it, it's what is the decision? I mean, what do you want to- My decision would be to stay with September 7th, but I just want to go back on something. The ADA issue with the village sake, streetery, or whatever we call it, is a real issue. So I just don't want to say, add it to the list. And then, yes, it's on them, but it's also on us because we know about it. So if I may say, when they were building it, I pointed it out immediately, and they said it was going to be flush. I think it was a mistake. So it's not that they didn't notice it. Um, so uh, Garrett, I, I agree with, with Barbara. I agree. It was we need to make point. sure they deal with that. <laughs> yeah, that I, like I said, it, that's, that's fine. If, if you're saying, I'll take this back. If the majority of the council say, yes, that's my main issue, then yeah, we, we're gonna address that. But if you were to say, no, we're not extending it, then obviously he's not going to address it because everybody would have to take everything out by May 31st. But I get it. He needs to address that. That's not an issue. But I think that's the, that's the whole point of the, the, this discussion is that there, we're hung up on a, the fact that there are a couple issues with a couple particular structures. And while the ADA might be their particular issue, it's like that's our public space that they're using for the restaurant. So it better be flush. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> we should just and fix I, all, the, not, all the things that are wrong. Yeah. I would propose that we not blanket extend these. And for the ones that have problems, we give a shorter extension to hold them accountable to do the work. Well, I, I think we could just, if we extend it for a longer period of time, then we can just say, well, this is a requirement and you haven't got it right, but you need to fix it. And yeah, I like Vice you know, Mayor Hellman, I like what you were saying about if it's if yeah. if 60 days is the reasonable thing, it's you, you know, we're gonna extend these things. You have 60 days notice to to change the things that there are issues with that yeah. allowed for such an extension. And if you don't do that, we'll just revoke it. We'll revoke the exactly. permit. Yeah. Yeah. Just so you have to do it. Yeah. 60 days should be plenty of time. It's just wood. Okay. Well, okay, I would just say, I think that's fine, but I would do it shorter than that. These things got built really fast. I think they can fix something really fast. Okay, my thoughts are this, which I know is not going to be in agreement with others. I'm saying stay with the September 7th extension. We can always revisit it. I think we should start this survey as soon as possible. I also am an advocate for not keeping the mono lot, at least closing that at the end of June so that we can have, um, yes, we do have parking issues in this town, but we have immediate parking issues with people who don't wanna walk three blocks or four blocks to get to where they wanna be. So that's my thoughts. And I'm sure others won't agree with it, but I want to get those out there. And I would like to clearly identify which restaurants have the problematic fixes that need to be done. Those need to be identified. Well, I think we've talked about Emilie and Village Sake have the issues. Are there others? Well, I understood from last night that the coffee roastery has the wrong setback. Is that right? It's one foot off. So what does that mean? Like, you mean well, it intrudes out of this. But I think John said, right? Mm -hmm. Renee, isn't that what John said? It needs to be a foot shorter. 
Right. So they they built it one foot too close to the parking lane. So that's the question for us is do we want to it's a safety issue for cars turning on to Bolinas and it, it's creating a narrower uh, roadway, right? Okay. Well, yeah, it's interesting because it actually goes flush with the parking lane. So I, it isn't necessarily narrowing the lane, but it, it, it doesn't have the buffer. That's what it's missing. Right, a, a car normally parked in the parking lane doesn't go all the way to the very edge of the lane, but this goes all the way to the very edge of the lane at full height, yeah. That might be kind of complicated to fix because they built the whole thing. I mean, they would have to take it all apart and shorten the box, essentially. I don't know. Well, I think we're talking about Amelia doing that and... So so Amelie lifted the roof, and then my understanding is that they committed to not um, seating tables in that extension part of their eatery that's in front of Live Water. So I I understood that was you know the handshake. Um, is that is that right? They've already lifted the roof off. Oh, no. mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that, be, that, <clears throat> that is part of a very important discussion is that if we're talking about restaurants like Village Saki that is only open at night, they're adjacent retailers and they could, they could use that kind of space during the day. I mean, there are ways to share, to share space, but those are things that have to be worked out between individual um, businesses. I don't think we can mandate those things until we get to really talking about public space. Well, anyway, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But I just wanted to address the, you know, Council Member Kohler, you mentioned three things in particular um, The that I felt like the, the three months don't address it doesn't it doesn't address if if we're asking to for folks to like remodel bit little bits even if it's little bits or if it's shrinking little bits but like for a three-month extension to ask for the remodeling within 60 days is kind of a weird thing the other thing is if there are multiple businesses that also want to create these community spaces especially in the summertime especially as covid still uncertain to give them that time to recoup, the three months doesn't ad address that. And then the third and final thing is like the a survey that comes out next week for a couple weeks doesn't it really doesn't give us the, inf the all the information we possibly need. I mean, it'd be great to do one now and another one at a, a later point in time, but like the the survey is not going to give us a it's a it's a point in time and it's not going to give us the transition data we need to to get a sense of how businesses are recovering is my sense. I feel, I feel like it's, we're, yeah. we're pushing, we're, we're pushing this three months thing and it doesn't okay, feel- Well, I would just say this is that if we follow the governor, he's talking about the state opening June 15th. There may be, no, uh, the governor. The governor is talking about June 15th, the state opening, no more tears. So, you know, we can agree to disagree. Um, Folks built these things very quickly. Village Saki built theirs really recently. Um, I, I'm not saying a two week survey. Um, and I think for people who built these things very quickly without enough thought put into them potentially, um, I think they can easily fix them. Uh, because, and I don't think it's, the largest deal, but people went into this with the idea that it was going to be a few months. And now you're saying COVID is going to continue. Um, most people even think all the kids will be back in school in September. A lot of the kids are back now. And so I feel that 
to automatically think we're going to be in COVID, why not just extend it through September 7th? We can always revisit it about that time if, if you know, everything's backslid. But, you know, I think we agree to disagree and I don't, you know, it's getting late and I think we have one more item that we have to take right. up. Right. So I think we should move through this and make some decisions. If we don't agree, that's okay. Well, I, 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 if maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear anybody say that COVID was going to continue for a long time. I thought the idea was that the, we're now having a community discussion, thanks in large part to John Bela, that is, and just the fact that we've experienced these things, and a lot of people are saying, wow, that's really neat, you know, that's as some people have said, a silver lining of COVID. And so that's where we are. It's not that COVID will necessarily continue. It's that we're now considering as a community that maybe this is a little bit like what we'd like the town to look like in the long term. Not exactly like this, not with these things made out of wood that are temporary structures, but that this has started to trigger a creative process. It's not that COVID is continuing. It's, it's that beyond COVID, this may be what we want to do. And However, I brought up last time, and Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you know, this is the kind of thing that we need to have a much broader community conversation and not at 1215. Right, right. And, and it just started as temporary. And so I don't think it's fair to the broader community to now say, okay, let's continue these um, without having a real broad community conversation. Okay, I'll stop talking. I, I would propose maybe just a compromise extend it six months rather than three months. That, that, that gives us, I, I, I do think that going all, only to September 7th is really putting kind of a tight time frame on us trying to think about this creatively as a community. And we know how hard this can be. And I'm excited that it is happening now. And I don't know, I obviously don't know how to encourage a creative discussion in, in a town with as many opinions as we have, but I would love to see it happen. And it, it looks like it's happening. And I just like to do whatever we can to give it some space. But on the other hand, I'm a little concerned that in the morning, people are gonna wake up and realize, what, you extended it how long? And you know, there'll be some people who are very happy about that and some people who are not. So I don't know, um, it is getting late. It's, Stephanie, do you have an idea? <laughs> I, well, I'm warming, I'm warming to an extension possibly beyond September, but I, I'm really clinging on, like, I, I don't agree that parking is not a problem. You can't wish it away because you want it to be, you know, a greener um, community. It, it, I, I strongly believe it's an issue today and it's going to get worse as we open up. And so I'm of, of an, a longer extension, but I want a commitment that will provide a creative solution to parking. We'll look at it and we'll, we'll come up with something. What does that commitment look like to you? Like, uh, does that like look like a ad hoc committee that we're, where we're working on it? Like, yeah. soon? cause I'm committed to that. I would love to do that with any of you, but like, yeah, I'm happy to commit to that as like something that helps us figure out cause that's a huge issue. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think we can come up with something. So thank you. And the loading zone too, but it sounds like you're committed to that, Garrett. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the loading zone was problematic and we would do a temporary one on the side because there just wasn't enough room to put it in the middle. Um, obviously, if things become permanent, then we'd have to relook at that temporary loading zone concept. What do you mean on the side? Are you talking about a monolot? No, on Bank Street. So when you come around to Bank Street, we're um, 
Bronco dances that area. Roco. Right, Roco. Yeah, right on the side there, we would have a temporary loading zone. We would just in yellow lettering say loading zone. And that's the trucks would pull off to the side. And that's where they would unload as opposed to in the middle of Bank Street. The problem obviously on the side is if you're parked there, you can't move your car out till the truck moves. But theoretically, the truck's not gonna be there that long. But if you're in a hurry, obviously that creates a problem. But that was the solution that the traffic engineer came up just because it was temporary. Is that, so that side solution, it, that's private parking though, right? That's, they would be- uh, The right of way extends out. So it's kind of in the okay. right of way section. Okay. So, I, you know, I think that uh, parking is a beast and yes, it needs to be explored and it needs to be explored creatively. Um, and I'm not sure that we have the, I know we don't have the staff and we don't have the, 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 the willpower at this point to do a full, a full deep dive into parking, but it is a fascinating subject. I'd be very happy to work with, um, with Chance on looking for a creative way to deal with the parking. And I'd also be willing, and I don't know how you feel um, chance about this, but to look at an extension through the end of the year, because I think it marks the season. I think it's I, optimally, I think the other cities have made a good decision to extend it longer. I think they'll come out with a better outcome. Um, but, you know, I would go with that because I, 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 you know, I know a year, I agree, people are gonna wake up and go, huh? Um, but that would be a compromise in my mind, as long as we do take seriously. In the meantime, we've got to come up with some, you know, we, we've got to do the, our due diligence about, um, some of these, uh, design guidelines and fix some of the problems that, that exist right now. Chance, I definitely see you puzzling. I, I would just like to ask what the what the advantage of an extension much longer than a, than the end of the year would be versus the end I just, of the year. I honestly don't know. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mayor. I, I honestly just don't know um, the, the businesses that have suggested, maybe again, to your point, Vice Mayor Hellman, they're not suggesting it openly and like, you know, I don't know, but the ones that have suggested that they want to do more and they want to take advantage of this opportunity, I just don't know what their their appetite is for for six months, and I feel like mm -hmm. you're, you're saying the restaurants that don't have them today. In fairness, they're not going to make an investment if we haven't offered some certainty of a of a longer. At least, some, yeah, something to see it through that transition from a, a COVID 2021 until the sort of, that's why I brought up the skate park. It was the same sort of vision of, of temporary in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're only going to get so much if it's temporary. And then you may never actually realize what the potential is because there just was never the investment to really do it right. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm still feel um, fairly strongly about about doing it right, um, and mm -hmm. that feels that feels like a, a, a to, to May. I, I would second that if you made a motion of that sort. I was just trying to be um, to be thoughtful of what Bruce had thrown out there. Well, it, it's getting late, and there are other people here for another item, and so I, I can make that motion and and see where that goes. Um, but I, I don't know what the, the actual first Wednesday of May is Garrett. So you might, you might know of 2022, but I, I would move to adopt two resolutions to extend the terms of temporary outdoor encroachment and temporary use permits from May 31st, 2021 to May, the first Wednesday in May of 2022. Um, I, I think that's it. I don't have to say the other part, right? And, and included in that would be to direct the fixing of the problem of the step on Village Saki. And I'm not sure whether we're 
whether we decided to direct the uh, the roastery to fix the problem of their sticking out too far. That's a bit of a larger fix, but those are things we had discussed. Certainly, I, th I would think the village sake thing that with that ADA thing has to be fixed. I mean, it depends how much do we need to put in this motion, Garrett, of the pieces that you may not need that. We well, may need more. Right. right. So <clears throat> Michelle is just pointing out there's two resolutions. So you'd have to do a motion, adopt one resolution and a motion, adopt another resolution. But yes. OK, as I understand it, um, under the under what's currently the concept is it'd be extended till a year. And then within that year period, what I don't know if you're saying within that you'd like us to also consider developing design standards in a process or future ones, because I don't recall if you really got into that. But more importantly, for the existing ones, I think I would need some clarity. I get the village sake, the ADA, but I think if a business owner that has an outdoor structure has worked it out with their adjacent property owner that they're comfortable um, with the solution that they came up with, in other words, village sake, it's okay, open my blinds, I could do some other things, but you want to monitor it. And so we would monitor it. Then is that satisfactory? Set aside, you got to handle the ADA issue. And then with Amelie, if their solution with live water is satisfactory for now, is that okay? And I think for coffee roastery, obviously when they put it in, we said a foot, John Bell is saying two feet. It just makes the lane more narrow, I think turning, you know, I don't know if that's an issue. I, I don't know if that's needed to be modified to rebuild that whole thing at one foot, one foot, you know, one foot in and further away from, from the, from the intersection. So that's what's a little confusing is for staff, it's not clear what you want us to do other than to work with the business to solve the existing issues. I'm not sure we need to do something with coffee roastery but more importantly, if you extend this for a year, what am I telling everybody else who's applying? Wait, so I can get some design standards in the process? Or that's one question. And the other, the other question, which I completely forget, is... Um, oh, Garrett, there, Garrett, are there model specifications that, I mean, you won't have to recreate the wheel? Like yes, cell. there are. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's any in Marin, really. No, because Marin has a, everyone's doing this, you know, as we speak. So, but there are, and I, uh, I let Garrett know that I could bring those uh, for us to consider. Right, and, and there's a process for that because assume, assuming with that you'd want feedback from the community, feedback from the businesses, feedback from the planning commission, and so that in itself is a process, which is okay. But the other question I was going to ask is it it's a good point with the questionnaire the questionnaire assumed we'd be back to at least yellow tier by now and so for the questionnaire i think it would be better to wait until we get to the yellow tier or until things open up because then you could ask more of those questions about how is it now versus you know less restrictions no restrictions other than wearing masks or whatever the governor's thinking and then you would have that feedback which then means the survey would start later it would start when things look like they're gonna open up and then we'd run it for a month or so and you'd have that that feedback, which then lends itself to having a longer period, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps. Maybe I made it more confusing, but. Yes, yeah. I yeah. ask one question that's a, it, not to diverge from the motion, but um, I think the first resolution on attachment A may be missing some sections. And be, before we finalize this, so if you look at the second resolution, um, the things that I think are missing is you don't have the section on the CEQA exemption, the severability, the conflicts, and the effective period. And there may be a specific reason for that, but um, the second resolution has the CEQA exemption, severability, conflicts, and effective period. And I'm just wondering if that's a typo that those got left out. And if no, we need to just 
say those are added in? You know, it's because one's an ordinance and the ordinance that you adopt by resolution extension. So the ordinance has all the SQL language. The resolution well, for they're two- both resolutions. What I know, you but, but in the ordinance, it allows you to extend TUP, set the deadlines for resolution. So your resolution doesn't have to have that. It just has to have the extension the expiration date itself because the ordinance already has all the SQL language in it. Your resolution has it because that's another separate action. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sorry for not bringing that up earlier. Okay. Good point. Though. Want to make your motion? Yeah, I guess I just uh, did. We did we reach some sort of clarity about what we're about this design process thing in terms of new applications and yeah. how to work retroactively. I mean, you've already modified the current application, right, Garrett, to include that you have to consult with adjacent businesses. So there's already some modifications that have been done. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the only other things I could think of are the opacity issue and... Well, I mean, I was also thinking that, that at this point to not approve any more roofs mm. because we're not gonna be in that, in that season. And so, you know, that, that really significantly limits visibility both in the roadway street signs, crosswalks, without that, you're in much better shape. Mm -hmm. well, why don't we just revisit this in three months? Everything, we'll have the data, we'll have the specs, the new specs. We just reconvene on this. We, you know, go with what the, the staff report recommendations are and reconvene and then we miss a whole year of these businesses that want to partake in it. I mean, if if there are multiple businesses that want to get this go, want to have something this summer as we're easing out, if we wait, then they're just not going to do it. Um, I, I mean, we can talk about two specific well, examples. Saying, if we give sorry, when I just once again, if we if we have some indication that we do have a long term commitment. I, I mean, so here's two examples is we really have been, and I think it's really important for us to hear um, Iron Springs input that they brought to the retreat and that again, um, they've spoken very clearly. Um, they haven't developed anything because of the lack of clarity and they weren't in a position a year ago to submit an application. They had just right. gone through a lot. Good Earth is saying the same thing. They're talking about how could we make use of the wide sidewalk down there and set up tables right there, you know, adjacent to that wall by their outdoor eating space. So those would be two situations where we'd be saying, well, you can submit something and you, you've got three months of security. A and if I were them, I wouldn't do anything very nice. Uh, without any, you know, and we heard that on the uh, countywide um, call from the MCCMC small business recovery group symposium thing that even the most sort of conservative of restaurateurs were saying there's no way anyone would do anything um, without the security. Um, so I, I think that's- I can't overlook all the emails we've gotten that are, that businesses are suffering. And I, it's just, I, I'm really uncomfortable with. I've only heard of two. I mean, one of them is, is Eddie at Nave's complaining about mono lot because he wants people to be able to drive to his bar. And that's not like what I'm trying to incentivize. I don't like, and I heard of live water and it sounds like from Garrett that there's some clarity around the relationship between village sake and their neighbors. So I, it does, I haven't been hearing the same you thing. I haven't gotten the emails about parking. I have heard concerns about parking for sure, but I thought that was part of this discussion is a commitment to really dig in and, and figure out how to address. Well, that's what I'm saying, like come back in 90 days with everything, with the new specs, with the parking plan, and just like really have a strategic, like robust plan for the small business community. Because right. Yeah, no, I hear, I hear it. It's a very good point. It's. Um, it, the, the problem is that we're, we're every single day counts for these businesses and I'd rather keep things in, in motion instead of freezing things out because like I said, it doesn't look so great out there. It looks pretty 
mix match. People are, some are setting up more because they have more resources to do it. Some have nothing. I think Garangelli and, and Paul Fratellizio are kind of waiting on that flat deck over there on that corner. Their pickup drop-off zone is in the wrong place. Um, there's a lot that needs to be moved around. And so with three months, I just think everything will stay in this static position. And this is the most important critical time. And we are still very much in COVID. It's not going away anytime soon. We've got a huge number and growing number of people not wanting to be vaccinated and we're still sitting in orange. So I, I'm a little bit, I'm feeling like we need to be a little more proactive than, than just say, let's do another three months. And I, with a commitment to take on and tackle the concerns, parking is, is huge. I get it. And I also would like to clarify that um, this does not include the mono lot space, because as Chance pointed out, this, that, is no, that is not a TEP or a TUP. So we can revisit mono lot as we go. And I would, I would um, suggest that we wait and see what happens on June 15th and the governor and what happens with the ABC. So we don't lose that space, convert it back to cars, and then all of a sudden go, wow, that was our only open space, public open space. I, Creek Park, you know, not to be competitive, but that's where I'd be hanging out. So what if, here's, here's something that I'll just throw out. So what if um, the same motion is brought as I was planning to bring it, but to clarify for staff, Garrett, that the, you know, we would modify applications to not only the modification that you've already done to um, require businesses to consult with adjacent businesses regarding use of outdoor space, but we do the, the, the no roof thing that council member Goddard brought and we just, and that, that handles the opacity issue too while, while we're at it. So it's. Can I, can I ask a question, another question that, might extend the discussion even farther. Uh, John Bela has made a clear distinction last night between uh, a situation where a business only allows their customers to use it versus something that's explicitly open to everybody. And so is this something that, because when these were first conceived of, these, these this, these resolutions don't say anything about that. And I think when they were written, the assumption was they were for that business only. Some of the businesses have said last night that, well, yeah, they are sharing their space, but do we want to say anything? If we're gonna do a one-year extension, do we wanna say anything about that? That, yeah, really the vision is open them up to everybody. I mean, that, that works place where there's no service outside, there's potential there, but you can't really look at Amelie where they have waiters, waiters, you know, wait staff serving people and then have one table that's kind of cordoned off for someone who just wants to come in and mm -hmm. eat a candy bar. It so, has to be off hours or something, right? Yeah, like you would have to be public. sharing. It would be that public private. That's why I brought that up about off hours making make we could make much better use of the spaces but i don't think we're going to get there tonight all right <clears throat> so you do have a motion on the floor it, you may it sounds like you have no, to not quite yet. We, we should start well, what's what's the final the final is there any other clarification you need garrett uh no i think if you you made the motion, then you're really adopting the resolution, extending expiration date to blank, whatever that date is. For say item number one, you substitute that with amendments to the resolution to note that that date is a substitute for the September 7th date. And I think the other things you indicated to staff, you don't need to necessarily put that in the motion. We know we have authority well, maybe you would to direction to staff of no roof covers. If, so that's clear and that you're fine with us right now of how we've worked out the issues with the adjacent businesses, between the owners and the businesses. 
and we'll, you know, if issues come up, then we'll report back to the council. Kind of gives you a little flexibility. Okay. Um, I, I would like to second the motion with, with, so I just glanced over at the uh, attendee list and I, I want to make sure that um, we have got clearance and clear clearance and guidance from the fire department because a year is, is a long time. And so I, everything I've understood, every conversation I've had with them, everything that you've got spoken with them about sounds like this isn't an issue, mm -hmm. but we have to, we have to make sure. And so you want me to ask the fire chief again? Yes, and it needs to be reported probably best by the chief, if that's possible to come or by our battalion chief. Okay. So captain. Even, even though I have them right, even though I had them a agree whatever we wrote in the staff report does that work you would like him to make a public statement at a meeting what about the, and what about the interim police chief i don't think police were consulted uh no i can well i consulted the previous chief on the parklets but sure i could ask the interim chief too that would be good because i remember when we brought this up last time we only talked about last year we only talked about chief weber so, so if we could make this motion and second contingent on a clear statement from police and fire, um, I think that would make me and potentially some of the public feel, is that okay? Can you do that on a motion, uh, on a resolution? Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean um, on how that would work. J Janet, I, yeah. I, I, I should have brought this up earlier. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I, I just better late than never. Well, you know, um, you can request that, but you don't. You don't want to make your motion contingent upon it because it, you, the resolution needs certainty. And so, it, you know, it seems a little too uncertain by a clear statement by the chief. What does that mean? And and, and when? And it's you know, it, you're leaving it up to um, um, an opinion whether or not you know he made a clear enough statement or. Um, I wouldn't. I would not do that. I want to give certainty to your resolutions. So you want to have a clear date in your resolutions. And I think right now what you're doing is just changing the date. Right? That was that was what the resolution the yeah. uh, seemed to be. And Probably. you but I think you've also added in the thing about no roofs also, right? Feels like some of that's the direction to staff, right? Uh, or Okay. All right. Staff, yeah. You can do that. And then you're also your direction to staff um, is that you want to have the fire chief make a public statement at the next meeting at, in the June meeting. But this, but what you're doing to these resolutions is not contingent upon that. You're just requesting that staff provide to tell the, the fire chief that um, and like the police make, chief and, and the police chief, fire and police that they come and make a statement at the next meeting. Uh, you know, I think it would be important for the public to hear, although I feel very confident that everything that we've heard from them and that Garrett has reported and staff report is, is, is true. Um, sure. I think it would be, it would be a, a good thing to do. So we've all heard it together, the public and the council. Okay. Hmm. Boy, this is a strange, <laughs> a strange approach, but I think I understand why it's happening. You're, you're, we're, you're, you're asking, you're, sorry, your motion is for a year. It's from uh, to the beginning of May, May 8th. 2022. Correct. <laughs> okay, so I, I've seconded the motion. Okay, so we'll take it to a vote. Um, Michelle, would you? Yes, I will. <laughs> um, and are we doing two 
motions. Um, this is yeah, on the first uh, resolution. Okay. That's right. We need two of them. So, Chance, should you you want to start with the temporary encroachment permits and make your motion for that because that's the one we've been talking about. The temporary use permits are that's not even what we've been discussing, but we need two motions. So go ahead and if, if you, the TEP one is the recommendation number two. So if you just say that with the revised date that- Yeah, that adopt a resolution extending the terms of certain right-of-way agreements for temporary outdoor uses to May 8th, 2022. Second. Okay, Michelle. Uh, Council Member Kohler. No. Council, uh, Council Member Goddard. Yes. Council Member Cutrano. Yes. Vice Mayor Hellman. Respectfully, no. Mayor Ackerman. Mm. I guess I'd say yes. But this the, is very strange. The motion is three eyes and two no's, so it carries. It passes. And the second motion, okay. Garrett, is reading number recommendation one. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. So adopt a resolution extending expiration date to May 8th of 2022 of the temporary outdoor use permits to allow restaurants and other businesses to provide outdoor dining, other retail, commercial uses, and curbside pickup. Second. Would you like me to take a roll call? Yes, please. Um, Council Member Kohler. Respectfully, no. Council Member Goddard. Respectfully, yes. Council Member Cutrano. Yes. Vice Mayor Hellman. Respectfully, no. Mayor Ackerman. Um, confusedly, yes. So, okay, what it seems like we've done is to say that we're committed to really following through with this conversation on, on many different levels, and we're giving ourselves time to do it, and we're giving the businesses time to, to um, have some certainty and make their decisions as we, meanwhile, make the restrictions and make, make the guidelines more clear. So, um, um, it, could I ask about the parking? Um, someone had an idea for an ad hoc subcommittee to to look at the uh, parking potentials. How how would you all like to? I'll make that motion to appoint Councilmember Goddard and Councilmember Cachano to that subcommittee. <clears throat> if you want it, you seem both seem to want it. Are you willing? An hour and a half ago. Yeah. I feel I feel uh, uh, obligated, and I and I will do a good job. <clears throat> I'll, I'll second the motion. I mean, if I can. Okay. Um, and come, take... and come back when? <laughs> After we've got it all solved. After you solve the problem. What's the Otherwise. what's what's your comfort level in committing well, to something? Well, I will say. You know, you know what has to happen is that outreach has to happen the same way that it happened when the parkade was closed, and we have to actually take 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 action. We don't have staff doesn't have the capacity to do this right now, so I, I'm happy to take um, to take take this on um, and figure out how we can uh, mitigate some of the spaces lost. Um, what's, your, what's your comfort on timing, Councilmember Goddard? Like to come back at least with a report status update. Um, it went June, July. Come back in July. I mean, realistically. I was, thinking, I was thinking sixty days in my mind. Sixty days. Okay. Can I ask another question now that we have that commitment? Uh, we have to waive the 1130 rule, which passed quite a while ago. But um, the question I have is, um, I know we have 19 attendees still on, and I believe the interim chief is 
is one of those folks. Um, and I understand that we probably need to discuss this, but is it time critical? Well, I'm not, we, I'm we, not understanding. Really quick, can we take a vote on this subcommittee appointment? Because I Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we already did that. Well, I'll do it really quick. Council Member Kohler, this is about appointing the subcommittee. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Council Member Catrano? Yes. Council Member Goddard? Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Hellman? Yes. And myself. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that. Okay, continue, Barbara. Um, I guess the question was for Garrett. Garrett, is this? So the reason this was on the agenda was just to give an opportunity for the community to comment and for the council to kind of generally discuss what we received back from this questionnaire. Mm -hmm. It's only time, it's not really time sensitive, um, but we just thought it'd be helpful if the community can, can comment before we actually conducted you know the interviews for the interim chief that that really was the... so could we maybe ask, maybe we could ask this there are 19 attendees if people could raise their hand if they wanted to comment on it i think that's why a lot of people were staying but i also know that we have some errors in what was provided and it looks like people are raising their hands it is close to one o'clock and I think people have stayed, so we kind of owe them that, but it is. Yeah, so the, really the, this is a discussion item, but not any particular action. This is really just a, a chance to hear community input. But yeah. do we need a motion to waive the 1130 rule? I, think I can take that motion if we're gonna go ahead. And I'll second. Okay, I'll take a roll call vote. Um, Council Member Catrano? Yes. Council Member Kohler? Yes. Council Member Goddard? Yes. Vice Mayor Hellman? Yes. And myself? Yes. Okay, so let's um, staff report please then on item, the item that used to be <laughs> 14. <clears throat> so, you know, you recall back in March 17th, Council decided to do an internal recruitment process for police chief. And you also requested staff to do a community questionnaire. That questionnaire asked for comments regarding qualities in a police chief, submittals of questions for an interim chief, if you could ask questions, and allows for comments regarding rethinking, reimagining PD services for the PPSA, which is the police subcommittee of the ResJ, which is the Ratio Equity and Social Justice Committee. So, conducted this questionnaire, closed in April 26, and then we ran a bunch of reports that we could within the software platform. And then in here, we also provided a summary of kind of the different, different questions. And so what I did, if you want, is because we broke the questionnaires like this, I call it overall, business owners, or you work in town, and then non-white declined to state, although it didn't include other. And so I kind of broke those categories out and actually compared the percentages regarding to some of the different questions, just so you can take a look of how it compared for those groups comparing to top priorities. It's kind of late. I don't know if you still want me to do that or mm -hmm. just go ahead and take a public, public comment or just you just want me to give you a yeah. brief summary. Would, what I would suggest is I don't, I don't think people really have the patience to wait through that, but I think there are some errors in what we were provided. For example, uh, attachment H is same as G. And so we don't have an attachment H. And I looked at some of the numbers and they don't look quite right, but perhaps I was not thinking clearly, but I think we need to double check the numbers. So maybe you could just explain um, where we ended up with a glitch. Oh, okay. So G and H, obviously they were supposed to be different uh, attachments. The versions online have been corrected. Um, I think 
the clerk may have sent you a email for the corrected version. I okay. didn't get one. Okay. So I'm sorry. No, I did not. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's funny. I think, huh? In my packet, I have to correct attachment H, but I don't. So I don't actually know what happened. But um, attachment H, for those who are wondering, that what we did was we broke that out to um, non white, non Caucasian, including declined to state. And that was a total of 17 people, not including the other category. So overall, this is what. You know, we found they found that you know 56 of the total respondents indicated they were satisfied with police services. 16% uh, said they were dissatisfied, and 28% said they were neutral. And that was out of eight. That, that was out of 89 people that responded to that question. So 93 people filled out the questionnaire, but only 89 of the 93 actually answered that question. So it's a little interesting. I had some tables that said, well, if you took the neutral out of the mix, then uh, the people more than the percentage of who's satisfied goes up. And I actually broke it out by the different different groups. Um, what was for the non-white, what was the satisfaction rate? Um, it was, I actually have to. I thought you just said it. Oh, well, what I here you you have white Caucasian and then you have declined to state but you don't have the minorities or non-white people that took the survey what their stuff was well the reason well actually no that that's exhibit h which you didn't you're saying you didn't receive exhibit h was a combination of attachment h was a, was a report that was a total of 17 people and that included non-white non-Caucasian and declined to state. So actually eight respondents total out of 93 actually selected ethnicity, right? Either African-American, Hispanic, um, or Asian. Nine selected declined to state and three selected other. But this report only ran, didn't include the other. I guess we could have, I'm not sure why we didn't know that and we probably missed it. In the other, two out of the three other could be defined as your white one other didn't state. So that's what the 17 respondents for non-white Caucasian, what those responses were, and that was in attachment H. So actually, I think what's easier is, let me, I think this would be helpful. Let me just share the screen real quick. And I think that would help assuming I can find the files. Uh, this is called too many screens right now. And this is the town clerk again. I just um, did send the attachment to the town council and it's been posted online since about six o'clock today. Thank you. You want me to share my screen, Garrett, because I have it? Oh, um, do you, let's see, I just found it. Sorry, I guess it's late and I'm in trouble finding stuff. Okay, here we go, try this. So this was question overall satisfaction for for PD. And so how I broke it all out was overall, which is 93 people surveyed, you have 89 responses. Then the question is, you a business, are you a business owner? Or do you work in town? That was 33 surveyed, 33 actually answered this question. And then we did non-white slash decline to state. And that was 17, that doesn't include the other. And what you see is an overall satisfied with police services, 56%. For people who own a business or work in town, it's a lot higher at almost 73%. Non-white declined to state was 59%. But the reason why we didn't separate out non-white from declined to state is because otherwise you get eight. And if you did eight, it just skews it even more. If it was eight, four would be satisfied. So that'd be 50%. Two were neutral and two were dissatisfied. So it'd be 50, 25, 25. It's just such a small sample size. We just declined, we just included declined state. But you can see a lot of people weren't sure overall. Uh, business, the non-white declined state, dissatisfied. Um, businesses and overall relatively the same. Non-white declined state obviously had a higher had a higher percentage of 23. And then what I did just to take a look at the numbers is if you took out unsure neutral, 
just took them out of the mix because they're not sure what to say one way or the other, then overall your percentage of people being satisfied would actually represent 78% business you work in town, 82%, 71%. But the caveat here is that is all subject to interpretation. This is just to give you an idea of what um, people were, were mm -hmm. thinking. And I, and I did the same, oops, and actually I did the same thing for, um, if you were, um, what am I thinking of? Oh, the top qualities for the chief and, and the question. So maybe I'll just do this one real quick, which is. Can I just mention something while you're finding it? I, I understand that you're talking about a small um, sample size for people that were non-white. But I think that would have been relevant to show that because I don't see a relationship between somebody who declined to state and and somebody who's non-white. Yeah, and, and we, you know, we could run that apples, before for you. Apples and oranges combination. And it could be, but like I said, the numbers were four were satisfied, two were not, and two were neutral. But we could run the reports anyway, like we have that report actually, and we can post it on the website, send it out, send it to you. Um, questions eight through 11, this just says Fairfax residents, right? 81% were Fairfax residents. Business owners, you know, 36% uh, or 33 said their business ethnicity, you can see it's predominantly white. And gender, interesting, you can see it's predominantly female. And then you have some this decline to state categories. Uh, what was interesting was the top, um, top um, qualities for the chief. Oops, sorry. Got to, where is it? Right there. Okay, sorry. Um, top priorities. And what we did is we broke it out by overall business, business owner, work in town, non white decline to state. Um, and what we did is we picked all the ones were, which were above 50%. So you can see overall we listed those. The personal integrity being the top. Um, important that, you know, like the chief to be supportive of mental health training awareness of racial equity, equity and social justice issues, good listener, communicator, willing to discuss alternatives to service, alternative services and pra police practices and develop positive relationships with the community, which are residents, businesses, um, and so on. And I had emergency management. The only reason emergency management is there is because business owners and people work in town had that at 50%. So you could see just how it compares. It looks like all three categories are in agreement really and probably what the top five are and you do the average on the side that doesn't weight it it just divides it by three um, you could see where that comes out so kind of interesting in terms of comparison pretty much you can interpret it any way any way you like and, and again it's it's you know it, it, again, the whole purpose was to just get some feedback. We'll give this all to the ResJ PPSA. We did add a ask a question for their behalf to make clear that wasn't, this isn't their survey. This was a survey prepared by staff. The quality section we used from another community. Uh, then we had a lot of comments to get the questions. What we'll do with the questions is we'll look for general themes and then probably prepare questions based on those general themes for the community panel to ask the interim chief. So that's pretty much the staff report. And we'll, we'll make all the stuff available online and we can run the other report that's just the people with selected ethnicities. But again, that was eight people. Okay. Well, we could talk for a long time about different ways to cut the numbers, but I'm thinking we should go to the public comment because that's really kind of the main point of this is just to, okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, Michelle, would you please open the public comment for us? Oh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, let me see. We do have some hands raised. So the first speaker is Veronica Garrett, followed by Naomi Alessandra followed by Brian Poindexter. So, Veronica, you're unmuted. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> need to listen to 
the council meeting on a big speaker at 1.06 in the morning to stay awake. Yeah, uh, I was just continually impressed with your capacity to have this conversation at this point in the evening and thank you for hearing us. You're just I'm so thing. grateful for this survey to get us started, to be asking the questions that we're really eager to expand on in the PIPSA subcommittee survey that we're just beginning to really talk about. Grateful that there were the questions um, centering what might be opportunities for SJ and PIPSA to work with the police chief in the future and really eager to take this information, particularly that second piece um, outside of personal integrity, that mental health really was a vital concern for respondents of the survey was what I felt most um, interested in. And not only was that one of the um, characteristics that survey respondents indicated was important for the police chief to hold, to be willing to engage in talking about mental health response and alternatives to how it's currently handled. But that then in the qualitative questions in that, I think it was question six, where we could fill out our vision for what um, re-envisioning how public safety operates. Of the, I think there were 67 people who responded to that question and of the 67, I think there are 36 mentions of mental health. And we know that the majority, or I don't want to say that because I, I don't, I'm realizing that I don't want to speak inaccurately, but that many of the calls that the police department here in Fairfax responds to are mental health issues. And um, I feel eager to consider ways in which we can have people who are trained to respond to that need respond when possible, when nonviolent. Um, and just really look forward to hearing what you all uh, feel most inspired about working with, maybe direct recommendations for PIPSA and re um, as we look at this information ourselves as a subcommittee and what you might like to see us do with it. Um, and excited about the idea, a dream that came as I was looking through the responses of that survey were what if Fairfax had a 24 hour mental health dispatch where you know that you could call and talk with a social worker or someone who knows how to deal with folks who are having a, um, a drug induced mental health crisis or a mental health crisis separate out of, outside of that. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'm really excited to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Sorry, I'm muted. Right, um, got nine minutes and 46 seconds on the clock. There's been an issue this evening with the clock kind of running okay. away. Just, just wrap around in some strange way tonight. Okay, Stop. Naomi Alessandra, you're unmuted. Thank you, Michelle. Hello, Council. Thank you so much for your time and generosity in being there so long and so late serving our town. Thank you also for administering this survey about the police chief hiring process and the state of public safety in our town. Based on the results of the survey, it's clear that the town's respondents have a lot of interest in centering public safety alternatives in conjunction with this discussion about the police chief. I'd argue that the more substantive questions give us a lot more information about people's desires than does the oversimplified, satisfied, dissatisfied question. Among the top five qualities that people sought in their police chief were awareness and willingness to discuss racial equity and social justice issues, support for mental health training, and willingness to discuss alternative police practices and or public safety alternative service models. Other key qualities that I feel our public safety leaders must have are an ability to reflect upon problems with a larger institution of policing and its problematic racist and classist roots, along with an ability to withstand a healthy measure of critique about local policing practices and policies, a willingness to maintain complete community transparency regarding all demographic policing data, a willingness to welcome community and citizen oversight and to make changes in policy and structure as determined by the community, 
an ability to acknowledge that many town safety issues currently handled by police may be served better by professionals with different expertise and skill sets and a willingness to work with such. And, and an ability to embrace the importance and appropriateness of activism for healthy communities. A majority of respondents to question six were in favor of rethinking and or reimagining public police ser services in various ways to address racial equity issues within the institution of policing, to better serve the mental health and crisis needs of the community, and to move substantively toward a future of nonviolent solutions to public safety issues. In short, we need to reduce police budgets and reallocate funds to community wellness, safety, and mental health. It's time to join the towns and cities across the country that have taken steps to reduce police budgets, placing police under a larger umbrella of a 24-hour anti-racist public safety department. The vast majority of calls in Fairfax do not require armed personnel and should not default to police. Most should be routed to unarmed specialists in mental health, addiction, trauma, de-escalation, conflict resolution, traffic management, etc. Rather than propping up an outdated punitive model with nationwide institutional problems simply because it is the status quo, let's instead focus on increasing community wellness for all citizens, visitors, and workers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. <clears throat> okay. Um, the next speaker is Brian Poindexter, followed by Deborah Benson. And you're unmuted. Well, my brain sort of feels like oatmeal, uh, and I'm, I guess I'm dreaming of the oatmeal that's coming for breakfast. So I'll do my best here, um, starting with comic relief. Um, this, is a, this is a serious matter, and, and I don't mean to be glib about it. Um, I'm really glad to see these results in. And I, I just want to echo a lot of what Naomi uh, and Veronica have provided. Um, I, I suppose and add maybe just a, a like a slightly different interpretation that I have from looking at these results. Um, I've been focused uh, as I see them on you know some of these top five you know top priority issues uh, from question one, and you know obviously personal integrity, good listener, communicator being incredibly important for a police chief, um, and then as others have pointed out, um, awareness and willingness to discuss racial equity. Etc. cetera, um, mental health and uh, willingness to discuss alternative police practices. Um, those really stand out to me. And I think I wanna step back for a second outside of the survey and just bring back some points that I've heard in previous town council meetings of, of folks really just wanting this issue in particular to, to feel less divisive. And when I look at at those survey results, it seems to me that there is um, there's there's a, a main line of folks who want to see change in these areas. Um, I'm encouraged that it doesn't have to be as divisive looking at these survey results, even if we're not in one of those you know categories that are in the, the top five. Even if we don't see ourselves in it, it at least gives evidence that that is a position that's held by a, a fair amount of the community. And so it's it's really time if we want to be non-divisive to at least start talking seriously about and addressing what it looks like to innovate in our police department. That doesn't mean that we're dissatisfied. Obviously, we've seen that half the folks are, are satisfied. I would argue that I'd love to see armed representatives of the state have a little bit higher than 50% satisfaction. I think that's a, a fair vision for all of us to agree to. So if we want to get satisfaction higher, the thing that we have to address is the priorities that people are, are looking to. So I, I think this is, I just want to frame it, I guess, in, in the spirit of innovation. We can always improve the services we provide. Uh, we can pr improve in mental health. We can improve on racial justice. And that's what we're really looking at. So the, the last thought I'd like to end with is just as we think about who the next police chief is, obviously there's a lot of momentum for interim chief Tabaranza. I'd really just like to start asking ourselves, who are the stakeholders we need to bring to the table to be innovative? It's the police chief. It's also the police union. It's also staff of the town. I think the mandate here is very clear. Like we wanna see a, a police department that's really finding creative solutions to, to these challenges and that will lead us to higher satisfaction in the services they provide. Thank you. 
Thank you, Brian. Okay, the next speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by Devin Fordyce Wilson, followed by Joe McGarry. I've unmuted you, Deborah. Michelle, thank you. Please forgive me if I can barely talk. It's really late for me. Um, huh. Our, our uh, current outgoing police chief, I mean, we're talking about diversity here. He's like a gay guy with a black partner for 20 years for crying out loud, okay? So, and then our ingoing police chief is a person of color. And we have like, I think 68% um, diversity in our police force. We have, the, we have the role model for the whole country here in Fairfax. So I'm not sure why we're fighting so hard to diversify when we have probably the best model that you could come up to. Um, huh, I can't remember uh, what else I was about to talk to. Uh, maybe that's enough. Um, I'm tired, maybe that's enough. I think we have a really gr a great force. We have a great community uh, police department. We have a really friendly police department. I have not seen uh, the Racial Equity Social Justice Committee really point to any, um, any uh, inequities per se on point. And um, I think we need to support our people. And I think that's all I have to say, even though I had more and I can't remember. Thank you, it's really late. Thank you very much for serving. Good night. The next speaker is Devin Fordyce Wilson, followed by Joe McGarry, followed by Matt Cleary. So, Devin, I've unmuted you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry, this is my third time speaking, but I'm kind of new to this um, committee. And I have a quick question for you guys. In the past, when you've done these surveys, what was your end value? Because actually, I do research, and an end value of 93 is not a validity number. It doesn't have it's you have to have a larger number. So you're making these amazing assessments on a data of an N value, which is your pay, your population of 93 people. I would love to know what you used for the other um, surveys in the past and what was your N value to give validity uh, to those reports? Does they, can anybody answer that? Well, I, I could attempt to answer that because I've also worked with statistical work and Yes, you're you're correct. This is a very small number, and there has never been any anything discussed um, in the town when surveys like this have been done before. There's always been an acknowledgement that these are fairly small numbers, but there's never been any quantification of what the right number would be. But yeah, it's a, it's the the issue is that how who takes the survey could be, you know, if some people really want to get, get, uh, want to promote the survey, then they could get people to take it. And if that's the only people who promote it, then that's the only people who will take it. So it's very small numbers. There's no question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cause I just feel that I've said taking this going off, launching off into these making these decisions based on that, those survey questions. But I do give respect to the people that just spoke. I thought they said wonderful things, but I would love to see more of the of a police, like in the survey questions, to be honest, um, those are the most important part of the surveys, the questions and how you write them. So to me, it'd be like, how do we, to the, there's de-escalation, like in the hospital, we teach nonviolence, de-escalation. It's all based on how do you take assess the scene? How to, to de-escalate it and recognize that they are there's mental crises and how do you keep how do you set limits? That's the other thing. Is this proper? There's a crisis in prevention institutions. All this information that we use, but I didn't see that as I don't know if that's part of the surveys. So I, I'm going to stop there. It's been a long night. Hope you all get to go to sleep soon. But thank you. 
Thank you, Devin. Come, come back for future meetings. <laughs> the next speaker is Joe, Mc, Joe McGarry, followed by Matt Query. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Thanks. Thanks for being here so late. Um, and and yeah, and thank you um, again for um, taking the step with this survey to to really broaden it and and make the uh, the the discussion within the survey more about just traditional qualities of 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 a police officer. And and I think that. Taking that approach bared a lot of fruit, particularly in in, in a lot of the thoughtful comments, um, and yeah, you know when the the, the top priority pieces, um, you know, mental health response, and um, you know the the question was framed as as training, but I think when you 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 looked through the comments, I think people were attached to the mental health piece in that question, and I think. We're really talking about mental health professionals rather than um, any kind of reform step of training officers um, in mental health um, and the racial equity and social justice, um, those qualities being willing to discuss that for Chief, very encouraging and, and public safety alternatives as well. And yeah, and, and uh, as folks have said, I think that the, the real common ground um, is this piece of mental health response. Um, and, and I would imagine, you know, as you, you, you study the, what is coming out from police chiefs across the country, that that is, and there's being steps taken, that is and something that police departments are, are totally willing to let go of and, and let mental health professionals step in um, so in terms of like a first step at an alternative, I think this mental health response piece, um, you know, is, is a great, great avenue for us to pursue. And there were, there were a hundred, hundred people murdered by police in the United States last year in, during a response to a mental health crisis. Um, and yeah, and it's, you know, this, this survey was going on during a moment um, in the country. So I just wanna kind of speak to the national influence, you know, of, of what happens here in Fairfax, you know, the Derek Chauvin trial going on um, while the survey was out. And during that time, police killed people at a rate of three people a day during the trial, um, 60 people died. Um, at the hands of police during the trial. Um, and I think that a lot of that um, showed up in a lot of the comments and much like it did last summer. Um, so things haven't changed. Um, and, and so I'm super encouraged that we'll be pursuing this conversation about public safety alternatives um, as we move forward. Um, yeah, it's late. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Jim. Next speaker is Matt Query, followed by Jesse Lum. Matt, I've unmuted you. Hey, everybody. Um, I think I'll send a longer email. I, and I'm, I'm amazed by your dedication. Um, I'm just voicing a support for a mental health response team to the people who live here and also wander in. And um, I think that would be incredible if we had a team in this town of trained people to approach and engage with people who were in need. And I will email more thoughts. Thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. The next speaker is Jesse Lung. You're unmuted. Hey, town council. Thanks for being here. Um, I just like to echo the ideas of supporting our 
our police department with public safety alternatives. Uh, mental health professionals. It's the unfortunate example of Mario Gonzalez in Alameda last week is an obvious reminder of how our current system fails us. Um, the idea of a, a 24 hour mental health dispatch for me is incredibly inspiring and hopeful. Uh, I just want to thank you all for your consideration on this uh, and the important survey in front of us. Um, I yield my time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any more hands raised. Okay, well. Uh, oh, actually, there's one more. Oh, two more. <laughs> okay. So first is Mark Bell, followed by Frank Egger. Mark, you're unmuted by me. Hey, thanks, Michelle. Um, I took the survey and uh, I just found it really skewed. I thought the questions were quite odd. And uh, if you're gonna use that as a scientific basis to make any determination, uh, I think you better revisit your thoughts. Uh, when in, you were talking about mental health, I thought you were talking about the mental health of officers who just to make sure that they're dealing with the, the stresses of their daily life so that when they are on the street, they're balanced. Uh, the other thing that you don't seem to be considering and that other people don't be seem to consider is that if we're going to have police local 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, then you need X amount of officers. And uh, I forget what measure we're on now, A, C, H, that helps pay for that, specifically states for police if... Uh, unless uh, the wording can be shifted. So I don't know where the funds are gonna to be to, to fund all these extra people. Uh, also, if you don't have a police force, I don't know how you're gonna coordinate with uh, other police forces in the area, just as far as communication, computer database access, et cetera. Um, yes, there are points that were brought up yeah, how, how can police in other parts of the country continue to kill people for outdated tags on their cars, evergreen trees, air fresheners hanging from their mirrors? How can somebody be killed for falling asleep in a, in a drive through for food? Yeah, it's absurd, but it doesn't happen in Fairfax. And when I looked at the survey, it seemed quite skewed and you could get any result that you wanted out of it as you wished, just because the determinations were so skewed. So I didn't really see the value in that survey. So um, I hope you're not gonna use that for a basis. That's all I have to say. The next speaker is Frank Egger. You are unmuted. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. A um, couple more hours will be time for breakfast. 7,500 people live in Fairfax and 93 participated in the survey. I've read all of the attachments. The Fairfax Police Department is not the Minneapolis Police Department. The Fairfax Police Department was 64% people of color. Fairfax Police are not racist. We recently voted to raise taxes to keep Ross Valley Fire Department and the independent Fairfax Police Department open 24-7 with full-time 911 dispatch. I've read the comments of those who took the survey, defund the police department, 
disarm the police department, consolidate with Central Marin Police, replace firearms with tasers. And by the way, Fairfax does not have tasers. Have civilians do traffic enforcement. Have civilians run 911 dispatch. Former California Attorney General Becerra set a high bar for police reform in California. He had an eight point program for reforming police practices. Fairfax Police under Chief Morin met or exceeded all of the eight point programs that uh, Attorney General Becerra laid out as a requirement for a reformed police department. Fairfax has an average of two officers on duty 24 seven. You can't run a police officer with one on duty. Technically it takes six officers to cover one off one spot 24 7. if you want two on duty around the clock it's going to take 12 officers if in fact the changes are made that are being that are being suggested fairfax will have to give up the special tax and this portion of the special retirement tax charged on our tax bill for police services. The proposition that we all voted was very specific. And, and uh, let's, let's, not, let's, not, uh, let's not start disbanding our Fairfax Police Department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Uh, the next speaker mm -hmm. is Britt W. I have unmuted you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, this is Britt Williams, and um, I just want to respond to those last two comments. Yes, it's true that Fairfax is not Minneapolis, and for that, I'm sure we are all very grateful. But the police system is rooted in a system of systemic racism, and that we cannot deny. And so while we are lucky that we don't have to make these changes, because it's true, people are not being killed for air fresheners in their car in Fairfax, it does mean that we have the freedom to set an example of what it could look like to uh, have civil <laughs> obedience without having a police system. And so I think we should just continue to be innovative and imaginative with what could be possible for our town, given the luxury we have of, um, of not being Minneapolis and just to think about, um, to think creatively going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Yeah. I do not see any more speakers, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we will close the public comment on this, our last agenda item. And if we have any further comments from council. Um, yes, Renee. Yeah, I just, my comment is I wanted to thank the public for responding um, for the, for the, you know, real thoughtful, um, the, the time taken to, to uh, share with us um, and each other this um, really important information. I mean, um, this is a way for us to hear uh, beyond checking the boxes um, and see um, what the community is thinking. It's uh, not meant to be um, science, it's meant to be an opportunity to collect input. And uh, it, it was extraordinary actually the depth to which people put their thoughts in. And um, I wanted to thank you. And I also wanted to thank staff for putting together what I thought was a survey that was so comprehensive. Um, I remember asking at the council meeting, could we please, could we please give a place for people to respond to what it is they would like to see and what it is that they would like us to, um, to explore um, through this process. And they, and uh, they captured the, they captured that in the questions that they put into the survey. So thank you staff for doing a, a really phenomenal job. Um, that's all I wanted to say. 
Um, Chance, I think you had your hand up and then Stephanie. Yeah, I, I just, I wanted to echo those sentiments. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I think the, um, the thing that was, that that's stood out to me in the comments too, that question about Devin, about that end value and thinking about this statistically, I think, um, you know, the general numbers are fine, but really the real richness that that comes from this are all of those qualitative comments. Mm -hmm. I think the, the future of public safety is embedded in a lot of these comments. And I was really grateful that so many people poured so much uh, valuable information into this. Um, and I, I also was hopeful that at, at the end of these comments, if Garrett or staff could just give a sense of what the, what the public should expect now that this is complete, what other pieces of the timeline for the hiring process are uh, are we to expect? Uh, I just want the public to know that as well. Thanks. Stephanie? Yeah, um, a couple thoughts with regard to surveys. Um, I agree with both council member um, Goddard and Cutrano. Um, I was really, taken aback by um, how well this survey was put together and then the responses we got. Um, what we I used to manage a lot of surveys in my past and we call those qualitative comments verbatims. And it's, it, there's just, it's remarkable. And I think um, it's not statistically valid, but it's very, it, it provides a lot of direction, I think, for us. And um, I'm really delighted and, and thanks staff for working so hard on that. Um, and just to respond to Devin, this is, this is a more robust survey than we typically do, but it is the type of survey we do. And it's very hard to get a statistical read on a population of just over 7,000. Um, that said, I feel very strongly that um, the police practice public safety alternative subcommittee should not conduct a survey like this. I think they, and I've expressed this on the subcommittee, I think um, we should spend money and partner with a market research firm that, you know, a letter accompanies um, every member of the household gets a letter with the survey and say, we're a research firm, we're partnering with the town of Fairfax um, and do our best to get a statistical read. Um, so I think if you don't have that, you're gonna open yourself up for criticism um, that it's not statistical. And for that type of, um, work if you I think the the least controversial and least divisive um, opportunity from a public safety alternative perspective is the mental health I think I haven't spoken to anyone that thinks that that doing a pilot is not um, something we should consider it as a top priority for one of the first you know proposals if you will um, so uh, but you're gonna need, strong data to substantiate anything else and um, including you know the race the, the racial um, information of our of our community um, and on the subject of a mental health um, pilot if you will I also think that uh, res J money or uh, should be allocated toward a pilot. And I think there's opportunity with an, an existing program at the county level. And I would recommend the, the police subcommittee, you know, reach out across the other towns and cities in Marin and see if, if everybody can chip in to expand that to a 24 seven. I, I don't know what the hours are today, but it's, it's nowhere near 24 seven. Yeah. and um you know pay for their proportion of mental health um calls if you will that feels like low hanging fruit to me i haven't explored it but if they already if something already exists 
you could pilot it and see how it does. And then if we wanted to put, to put together our own program um, locally, you could you know, substantiate it with success of the, of the pilot. Um, so those two um, items from an expenditure standpoint, because I have budget planning on my mind, as I'm sure we all do at the end of this month, um, are two things um, that I hope the police subcommittee will um, strongly consider. And I think that's it. Um, very tired, sorry. <laughs> Understandable. Barbara? I'm not sure, but I thought Council Member Cachano had his hand up first. No, okay. I'll just make it brief. Um, so the I brought this up before. The, the county has the mobile crisis unit, and they did expand the unit. It used to just be one person and a half of a person. They did expand that unit, and I don't... I think the county is looking for um, potentially all cities in town that access that unit to provide some support. And they did expand some of the funding that they have for that group. Um, maybe it's early to say this, but I don't think with a very small police department with 10 sworn, are you going to be able to create a local program, nor do I think is that the most efficient use of resources, because you want to have the experts. That's where the county has them. They have mental health professionals, they have social workers. That is the right place. And so many of us in these towns, we're, we're dealing with small police departments. And so you can't have somebody working 24 seven in one person. You have to have several people and that's where the resources are. I will also say one thing, I worked at the Air District and we did surveys all the time and we created incentives for people to take surveys. And I know you have experience with this Vice Mayor Hellman, but our experience showed that there is no statistical ability with even a better survey you get trends, that's what you get. So it doesn't, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a better uh, reach out because I think even uh, Frank Egger mentioned, you have 7,500 people in this town. And usually by a survey, if you get a 10% response, that's good, that's really good. So we're not gonna have statistical analysis and I have statistics in my background as, uh, the mayor does. I was quite a statistician at one point, but I think you want to get um, more feedback from more people. But I will close because it's 144, and I think this is one of our latest meetings. <laughs> Not quite the latest in recent memory, but it's getting up there. So yeah, I'll just very quickly say that uh, I do appreciate, as has been said, staff's uh, hard work on this survey and um, the and to to uh, the comments that Stephanie made the uh, PPPSA subcommittee of, of ResJ is considering exactly that we're the, that committee is still in the process of, of uh, discussing the, how a survey would be done, but that's where the discussion has been going so far is that it should be possibly done through a market research firm or some sort of research firm and possibly mailed to people as opposed to just an online survey. So some money would have to be spent on that. And that's part of the budget discussion that, that uh, Res Day needs to have. And I will leave it with that because it is very late. Okay, um, if we're finished with this item, then what we have left on the agenda is council reports and comments. If anybody has anything they'd like to add at this point, I'm thinking maybe not. And uh, town manager's report, I'm thinking maybe not. Okay, future agenda items. 
Okay. And uh, then that would bring us to adjournment in memory of Rudy Contrati's father, Rudolf Contrati. And with that, good night. And thank you. Thank you.